twelve. Driving up Delaware Avenue, Wolf concentrated on the moves he had made in the past few days. He'd never bothered the bastards in ten years, but they had found him and sent three badly chosen messengers to kill him. He was still convinced he had done the only sensible thing. As fast as he could, he had followed the trouble to its origin, Tony Talarese. Then he had taken the most direct route out of their way, trying to fly out of the country through Los Angeles. But they had managed to have a shooter in the airport waiting for him. They should have known he would go for the only man who could have sent a specialist, Peter Mantino. But he still had to get out of the country, which required that he go see the old man for a fresh passport. Then soldiers who could only belong to Angelo Fratelli had killed the old man. Of course, he would go after Fratelli now. Why didn't they know that? Or had the ten years made each of them so fat and powerful and overconfident that they all thought he would just lie down and die? Angelo sat across the table from McCarran, nodding and smiling. The table was the one that had been occupied by the young couple he had met at the telephone. While he was talking to Salvatore on the phone, the hostess had come up to McCarran and told him that a table had unexpectedly become available. Angela was preoccupied, and his practiced jovial demeanor returned unannounced, like a facial tick. Now he knew the cause of his problem, and it was giving him a tight stomach. Some forger had thought he could pick up some extra money by mentioning to Angelo's stringers. That he had a passport request that sounded a whole lot like somebody who wanted to get out of the country instead of into it, but Angelo's men had not risen to the occasion. They could have had the forger tell the old black man that the customer needed to come in person to get his picture taken. When he got there, if he was who they thought he was, they could blow his head off. Instead, they had killed the fucking middleman. Angelo wasn't known as an eminent strategist, but at least he knew that when a hornet flies into your house, you don't slam the door shut and consider the problem solved. Sure, we can still do the deal," said Angelo. "If you want to spend the money, I can handle things for you." McCarran said, "Thanks. You don't know how much better that makes me feel." Angelo saw the door of the restaurant swing open, and Salvatore walk in. Behind him, standing out on the sidewalk, Angelo could see two other men looking the other way at the passing cars. The sheer bulk of Salvatore in his dark gray overcoat reassured Angelo because part of the bulk was the little Uzi submachine gun, in a sling inside the coat. Angelo stood up. Our ride is here. I hope you weren't hungry. No," said McCarran. He stood up too. And like the young man before him, set some money on the plate before he followed. Wolf was getting tired. He knew that what he was doing wasn't certain to work, but Fratelli had picked the man up here in Delaware Park, and there was a small chance that he might come back and drop him off on his way into hiding. Wolf had already decided there was no way he could hope to get into the mansion Fratelli had built in the hills overlooking the Niagara Escarpment in Lewiston. Fifteen or twenty years ago, there had been stories about people who had tried, and now Fratelli knew he was in danger. The only hope was to catch him in a place like this, where dark and emptiness would help. It was taking a long time. He had no choice except to wait, but now he began to study the area for signs that someone else was waiting too. He watched the cars going by on the distant road around the park. They looked the way cars look from an airplane. Not unreal like toys, but separated from him so completely by the unfamiliar distance and lack of sound, that they were part of an alternative world. As long as none of them stopped, he was safe. Then he saw the gray Toyota. As it pulled up in front of a big brick house, a door opened. He watched the car, but he couldn't see how many people were in it. Nobody got out, but then it slowly pulled away. Something had happened that made no sense. The big dog was standing on the front lawn. Then it stopped looking after the car and trotted happily around to the back of the house. Wolf decided it was time to move. He wasn't sure why they had stopped to let the dog out, but he knew he had to ignore it. He had to keep his eye on the car. He moved out of the woods quickly, glancing to his right from time to time to be sure he was keeping the trunks of the tall trees behind him. 
He could see the little gray Toyota move along the road toward the zoo, past the basketball courts, and then past Wolf's car. He stopped and watched it go. He could discern a couple of heads in the car, but it was too dark to see the faces. When the Toyota stopped by the curb, he broke into a run for a spot from which he hoped he could get a clear view. But at this distance, the trees seemed to leap up into his field of vision, so he went on, finally slipping from the grove of trees to a big oil drum full of trash. As he dropped behind it, he heard a door open and ventured to peer around the can at the car. Two big men got out of the car and moved around to the trunk. One of them was Fratelli, but he couldn't be sure the other was the man he had seen with him earlier. This man was wearing a bulky gray overcoat that Wolf hadn't seen before. Now Fratelli bent over and opened the trunk. Both men leaned in and seemed to be dragging at something inside. Then they both bent their knees and hauled something out. Wolf moved closer. They were carrying the man who had been with Fratelli in the Toyota. His head lolled to the side at nearly a right angle to his shoulders and swung a little as the two men staggered into the park, carrying him. Wolf had seen too many corpses to have much doubt that this was another. What the hell was going on? He kept moving from tree to tree, closer and closer, as the two men carried the body into the park. He had never seen the man in the overcoat before, but there was no doubt about the other. He was Fratelli. Angelo wheezed at each step as he backed into the park, his leather soles slipping a little on the wet leaves. McCarran's legs were heavy, but Angelo was feeling better now. All evening he had been waiting for a chance to get this asshole into a dark place. Every second with the man, his rage had grown and sharpened. Finally, when he had gotten him out of the restaurant, he had made Salvatore take them to the building on Allen Street. Angelo owned the whole block of old brick buildings, and they were all fenced and boarded. He was remodeling them to accommodate restaurants and shops, but for now they were empty. He had told McCarran that this was the ultimate hiding place. But as soon as the man was in the door, he swung his right forearm around McCarran's neck and gripped his own wrist with his left hand. It had taken only a couple of seconds, so it didn't last quite as long as he had hoped. But he had felt the neck crack and the muscles tighten spasmodically, then go limp, so he supposed he had gotten as much out of it as possible. He had also been able to tell him a little bit about being a self-important crazy asshole who didn't do what he was told, hissing it into McCarran's ear as he broke his neck. Probably he hadn't heard all of it, but enough— Angelo had caught a glimpse of Salvatore's face while he was doing it, and it was a mask of dumb surprise and horror. It was kind of funny to remember it, and now he couldn't stifle a little laugh, but as his breath huffed out of him, he never got to draw it back in, because at that moment there was the blast of a shotgun. Salvatore had never seen anything like it. Mr. Fratelli's head just seemed to fly apart as though a bomb had gone off in his brain. When Salvatore started to run, his mind hadn't yet settled on exactly what he was running from. It didn't matter, because he managed only one step before the next blast found him. Wolf trotted toward the woods, wiping off the shotgun with his handkerchief. He was systematic about it, moving from the barrel to the stock and back again, then taking another pass and ending up holding the shotgun with the handkerchief near the muzzle. He dropped the shotgun into some bushes, then turned to run through the woods toward his car. He had owed the old man a debt he couldn't pay off with money, but now it was over. They could never be even, but he had done all that had been left to do, and now he had to get out. He was still feeling dazed from the loud roar of the shotgun and the tremendous kick it had delivered. He hadn't fired anything like it in years. The shots he had taken outside the old man's house had somehow been muted by anger and outrage, so he had not been prepared for the way the shotgun had torn up the cool, quiet air of the park. As he moved through the woods, he thought he heard something. It was a faint, steady rustling like the sound of a wind blowing through the wet leaves on the ground. But he could feel no breeze on his face. He stopped, stood beside a tree trunk, and waited for the sound to resolve itself into something he could identify. He stared through the trees in the direction of the sound. Beyond them he could see the silvery gleam of the tiny lake, the white front of the museum on the other side, 
and then a car's headlights on the distant road. It was moving along at about thirty, and as it made a turn, its headlights swept across the little woods. Then he saw the men. There were three of them, about twenty feet apart, shuffling along slowly through the trees. The car turned again, and the light disappeared just as the one in the middle fired. The bullet thumped into the tree above his head and stung his cheek with a spatter of bark and dirt. He knew that ducking or diving to the ground wouldn't save him. He had to run and hope that the trees and the darkness, distance, and difficulty they would have in planting their feet for a steady shot would give him a chance. Of course, a man like Angelo Fratelli wouldn't be out here in the dark with one man and a corpse. It was ridiculous. He considered going back to look in the bushes for the shotgun, but he knew he would never make it. The gun was hidden badly enough so that the police would have no difficulty finding it in the morning, but they wouldn't have people shooting at them, and this wasn't morning. He concentrated on his immediate problem, which was that in a moment he was going to run out of trees. He would have to dash across what looked like a picnic area under a few stately old maples, and when he did it he was going to be a hard target to miss. He kept running. He could tell from the sounds that he was putting some ground between himself and two of his pursuers, but the one directly behind him was having an easier time of it because he could run exactly where his quarry did without stepping into a hole or crashing into a tree trunk. Wolf broke into a sprint to give the man a chance to get ahead of the others. At the edge of the grove he saw something that gave him hope. To his right was the old brick wall of the zoo, covered with ivy and skirted by uncut brush. The top of the wall was protected by old-fashioned foot-long steel claws that curved inward, looking as though they had been put there to keep a lion from jumping out, but probably designed to keep morons from climbing in. Wolf stopped, made a quick pivot to the right, and reached into his pocket. The only heavy objects he had were the extra shotgun shells. He listened for the approach of the pursuer, then threw four of the shells as high into the air as he could. Their trajectory carried them up and over the wall before they began to fall. They came down to the right of the first man and on the other side of the wall. Wolf waited behind a tree for the sound of the shells hitting. When it came, he was pleased. The first one hit with a heavy thump on a surface that sounded like concrete. Then the others came down in a group, and there was a dull grating noise as they rolled down some kind of incline. It was as though he had set off a weird perpetual motion machine. When the first man appeared, Wolf could see he had heard the sounds. He was small and wiry, and from his silhouette and speed, Wolf judged that he was young. The man stuck his pistol into his coat pocket, jumped up, and grabbed the curving bars at the top of the wall. But just as he pulled himself up to peer over the wall, something big on the other side made a decision. The something big was a male polar bear named Caesar. He had been born in the zoo, so he had no idea that the reason he was half crazy was that polar bears hadn't evolved to occupy small concrete pens with tepid swimming pools painted aquamarine. First there had been the two loud blasts, then a smaller one. When the pieces of metal and plastic had fallen from the sky into his enclosure, he had stopped cowering in the dank concrete pillbox he used for a den and come out looking for something to maul. When he reached the edge of his pool, he saw that the intruder was only a bunch of cylindrical, shiny objects rolling off his patio into the deep moat that kept him at home. When Caesar saw the ridiculous sight of a man hoisting himself up on the bars above the wall, it made him angry. He stood up on his hind legs, spread his forelegs, and, with a tottering, staggering gait, trotted quickly toward him, baring his fangs and uttering a loud, deep, groaning noise from somewhere inside him. The sound was part joy at finding something close enough to take a swipe at with his powerful forepaws, part anger because he knew that usually when he did this they raised a little black one-eyed box and flashed something bright in his eyes, and part frustration because even if he killed it, he would probably never get to eat it. Caesar was just going through the motions. Still, as his huge form waddled forward out of the darkness, it was nearly nine feet tall, glowing white in the moonlight, and appeared to be composed mainly of claws and teeth. The man on the wall bared his teeth, too, but it was only because he needed to open his mouth wide to let out a scream. Instead of simply letting go of the curved steel rods, his arms gave a reflexive push to get him as far away as possible from the charging apparition, 
and his legs pushed off the wall too. He took the weight of the fall on his shoulder blades and lay there for a second with the wind knocked out of him, unable to move. He had forgotten about Wolf for the moment, but when he remembered and drew the conclusion that lying on his back across the protruding roots of a maple tree was a good way to commit suicide, Wolf was already looming at the edge of his vision. The kick in the head didn't kill him, but it brought the same sudden explosion of pain and an approximation of the same darkness to shut down his brain. Wolf reached into the man's coat pocket and extracted the pistol, then stepped back behind the tree to scan the woods for the next pursuer, as the bear let out an anguished cry of disappointment behind his protective wall. Wolf had no idea what kind of animal made that kind of noise, but it had to be huge and it wasn't happy. The sound brought the other two men closer. He could see them slipping from tree to tree, waving and nodding at each other in turn, to provide cover for each movement. Wolf waited for a clear view to present itself. He ran his hand over the fallen man's revolver to identify it, but could tell only that it was probably a thirty-eight. He tried to remember how many shots its owner had taken at him, but he wasn't sure. Then the man on the ground began to come to life. First there was a gasp, then a moan, just his body making a sound to celebrate having some air it could take in and let out again. Then the man's brain began to struggle to reassert itself. He said loudly, Oh, then, oh boy. Wolf glanced at the man. There still was no movement, but he wouldn't shut up because he still hadn't regained enough of his consciousness to remember where he was. Oh, damn, the man muttered. Lurking in disappointment behind his brick wall, Caesar the bear heard the voice. When the sound of his fallen enemy groaning helplessly reached his keen ears, he began to salivate and stagger toward the wall again. He couldn't get over the inward curving steel rods, so he placed his paws on top of the wall and bounced up and down on his hind legs trying to see. When this didn't work, he let out a cry of rage. This noise set off a reaction deep in the half-conscious man's brain. A tiny pulse of electrochemical energy crackled across a recently altered synapse and indicated to the brain that it was now or never. Wolf saw the man's head jerk up off the ground and keep rising. As though the motion of his head had begun an involuntary reflex, the rest of his body moved after it. When the impulse reached the man's legs, he stood up so fast that his feet actually left the ground, and when they came down again he was already running. He sprinted back the way he had come, into the trees where his partners were hiding. Wolf listened, hoping for a pistol shot. But instead he heard the sound of a struggle. One of the runner's companions had the presence of mind to grab him, but the frightened man wasn't ready to be grabbed. It's me, said someone in an urgent, hushed voice. Hey, it's only me. Wolf judged that his moment had come. He pushed off the tree with his foot as though it were a starting block, and then he was out in the open park, running hard. But immediately he heard other footsteps and realized that the two remaining pursuers had not been as distracted by their partner's plight as he had hoped. He knew that he probably wasn't going to make it across the open grass picnic area in time. He was going to die. It made him angry. He felt a wave of contempt building in his chest. Who the hell were these three anyway? The greater Buffalo Pistol Team? They were three losers who spent their lives walking stiff-legged into little bars and scaring the shit out of people with their bent noses and scars. Probably none of them had ever fired a gun at anybody before, and if he did, he pushed it down the guy's throat and pulled the trigger. Only two of them even had guns now. But if they could hit anything, it would be the back of a running man. Wolf didn't stop running. He just let his feet outrun his torso and went into a kind of baseball slide. When his slide hit the ground, he rolled over onto his belly and aimed the pistol at the path out of the grove he had just left. The first man out of the grove didn't see Wolf at once. He took three steps onto the grass, then stopped, lifted his weapon and stared at Wolf's prone form as though he were trying to decide whether it was a man or not. Wolf fired twice, and he could tell within a second that both shots had caught the man in the chest. The man went to his knees, then toppled over and gave a loud grunt and then Wolf was up again and running. Over the sound of his own breathing, he heard the second man say idiotically, Are you all right? Wolf kept running. He probably had one round left in the cylinder of the revolver, but he knew that his best chance lay in what the one remaining man was thinking. 
By now he would have noticed that for all practical purposes he was alone. He would also be aware that he had an acceptable excuse for not continuing to chase an armed man into a series of dark places. He had a colleague who was seriously wounded and was lying there bleeding to death. There was only one thing left that the man needed to do before he officially gave up the pursuit. Wolf made it to the first tree on the other side of the open space and ducked down, while the survivor fulfilled that need, firing his weapon six or seven times into the darkness in Wolf's general direction. Now he could show the underboss who was in charge of punishing the weak that he had been in the battle with the rest of the soldiers. Gripping the telephone receiver, Richardson tried to calculate how much of his life was spent pressing one of these damned things against his ear. What the hell is Jack Hamp doing? he asked. Jack is still in Santa Fe, said Elizabeth. He's trying to find out how our friend is getting around. Santa Fe is a small place, so he has a hope of getting a credit card number, a rental car license, or the butcher's boy's latest alias. He's also at least eight hours from Buffalo because he'll have to change planes at least once. What are you going to do with the kids? Please don't make this harder. I'm paying Maria a sum I can't afford to stay all night, and probably let them watch old horror movies in Spanish and teach them to love potato chips. But I can't pull Jack away from the only place this man has been where he might not have been hidden in the crowd because there is no crowd. I've got to go myself, and my plane is getting ready to leave. Richardson shrugged and stared at the telephone. She hadn't changed much in ten years. This was how it had started the last time. Lieutenant Delamo of the Buffalo Police Department stood beside his plane wrap Dodge and watched the long line of uniforms make their sweep of the park. He could see their flashlights moving back and forth on the grass in little circles. This was the sort of case that had lots of cracks and potholes to fall into. There were three bodies in a row in the middle of the park, and they hadn't even died in the same way. One of them looked like he had been hanged, and the other two were shot with something, most likely double-aught buckshot at close range, judging from the mess it had made of them. One of them had about two-thirds of a head left, and that was the one that occupied Delamo's thoughts now. It had been a disgusting sight, and he could close his eyes and still see it. That was the test for him. It meant that at some point, maybe not tonight, but soon, it would come back to him in his dreams. It wouldn't be accompanied by the sympathy and sadness that he usually felt when he had to look at human bodies that had run into something made of metal. This time he felt something different. And he would probably pay the price for it in guilt. The partial head that remained was perfectly recognizable as the property of Angelo Fratelli. There had been several times in his career when Delano had caught himself wishing that somebody would blow Angelo Fratelli's head off, but he had always pushed the thought aside into a compartment of his mind that he never visited. Now somebody had done it and Alamo had learned enough to realize that it wasn't time to celebrate. It had already occurred to him that this midnight outing in Delaware Park might be only the first of many trips to look at bodies in the more deserted parts of Erie County. There had been no warning of any kind from any of the agencies that kept an eye on these people, which didn't surprise him. It simply showed that things hadn't changed as much as a lot of people had thought. Delamo didn't pride himself on his knowledge or expertise. The only claim he made for himself was that he was not a fool. In keeping with this modesty, he had not ignored the old-timers who had been around the last time this had happened, in the fifties. If he listened carefully, the frustration and anger were still evident in their voices. In those days, police intelligence on organized crime had been so sparse and unreliable that they'd had no idea of who was at war with whom, or for what stakes. All they had known at first was that kids started to find mutilated bodies lying in empty lots. It had gone on for years, and the cops had been able to do little beyond carting away the corpses and writing down their names. Eventually it had turned out to have no local cause at all, having been started by a bungled murder attempt at a restaurant in New York City, and it had ended at a small meeting a year or so after the famous interrupted conference about two hundred miles from here, in Appalachian. 
but nobody had even known that much until the late sixties, ten years afterward. Lieutenant, said a voice behind him. Delamo turned and saw a young patrolman named McElroy coming toward him with a woman. He had sent McElroy around the neighborhood to knock on doors and ask the neighbors the usual, was it two shots or ten shots questions, but he had done so principally to give the kid a chance to pick up his second wind. McElroy had been held over for this mess after working a twelve-hour shift, which had, according to his sergeant, included a twenty-minute wrestling match with a particularly nasty pair of drunks, followed by a gruesome car accident on the Father Baker Bridge, in which a family of four had been roasted in their station wagon, and he was beginning to get that peculiar look where he was forgetting to blink his eyes regularly. Lieutenant, there's someone here, said McElroy. This is Miss Elizabeth Waring of the Justice Department. Thank you, McElroy, Delamo said. He looked at the woman. She was very young, he decided, then changed his mind and revised his estimate to the middle thirties. We haven't met, have we? The question took Elizabeth by surprise. Then she realized he must be assuming she had come from the Buffalo office. No, she said. I don't think so. I just flew in from Washington. Now Delamo was surprised. How did you get here? How did you know? I was expecting something like this, so I was waiting for the right sort of report to come over the wire. She couldn't wait any longer. She tried to keep the eagerness out of her voice, but she had to know. Have you confirmed that it's Angelo Fratelli? I don't have to confirm it. I've seen him before. She could hear the annoyance in his voice, but she couldn't allow herself to think about him yet. Then it's the third. The third? Delamo asked. His face was flattening into an exaggerated expression of incredulity, so there could be no question that she would interpret it correctly. Of course, she thought. How could he know? A week ago, a man named Antonio Talarese was killed in New York. He was an underboss watching things there for Carlo Balacantano, while he's in jail in California. Two nights later, Peter Mantino was killed in Santa Fe. He was the family's western regional boss. I haven't had time to find out what he was doing in Santa Fe. And now for Telly. Miss, uh, Waring. I'm a simple, honest-to-God policeman. I've got to confess that I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I assume you do. I know who Carl Bala was, or is, but that's about it. If you people knew there was a war on, why the hell didn't you say something? It was starting to feel to Elizabeth like one of those moments when cops made suspects admit things they hadn't known they were accused of. I still don't know anything about a war. I think this is somebody we heard about from an informant ten years ago, and I think he's alone. He's a killer for hire that people call the butcher's boy. No real name, no record. Not even a description. One of the witnesses says that's who killed Tony Talarese in New York. We know he was somewhere in the West when Mantino was killed. So who hired him? I don't know if anybody hired him, and I don't know what it's about. The others were from the Balacantano family, and Fratelli wasn't. So what am I supposed to expect? A couple of hundred new faces from Chicago or New York moving in and carving up Fratelli's estate? I don't know. I don't think that's what it's about. Delamo took a deep breath, let it out slowly, and then said it anyway. You people don't have a whole lot of useful information, do you? Elizabeth wondered if he would have said that to Jack Hamp. It wasn't that another man would have punched him, but there was something about her being a woman that made it easier for them to behave like this. If she answered the same way, she would be a bitch. She explained patiently, There are too many things happening at once. Some of them are contradictory, others are meaningless, and some are probably fake. In any case, these people don't always make long-term plans and stick to them. When they feel threatened, they lash out at somebody and when they see an opportunity, they take it. Delamo sighed. Come on, 
We might as well see what we've got. He walked her over to the grove of trees and stopped where the yellow police tape was stretched from tree to tree. He pointed to the three body bags. This one is for Telly. Shotgun blast to the head, took off the top of the skull. Ditto this one. He was a bodyguard named Salvatore Gamucchio. Age 38, 20 years of rap sheets for strong-arm robbery, extortion, assault, etc. He was carrying a submachine gun in his coat and a pistol in an ankle holster. Neither one fired. This one over here is a puzzle. He seems to have a broken neck. The coroner will have to tell us how that happened. No identification. One of the guys said he looks familiar, but so far we can't place him. All this happened here? In the park? Yeah. Lots of calls from people living around here. Loud gunshots, yelling, the whole bit. Units in the area responded, but this is a big park. And by the time they could sweep it with lights, nobody was standing up anymore. So the patrolman didn't find them until they walked the area on foot. Have you figured out how? I think some people over there in the trees shot them with shotguns, with the exception of this one. How he died, I can't imagine. Another voice came out of the darkness behind them. Lieutenant? He turned toward it in a leisurely way. Yeah? We found a shotgun over there in the bushes. Anything interesting about it? No, sir. Twelve-gauge Remington pump. Not sawed off or anything. I know I don't need to say this, but be careful with it. I'd sure like to get a print off it. As the patrolman walked away, Delamo turned to Elizabeth. I guess that eliminates looking for a man with a shotgun. Lieutenant? As Delamo turned in the other direction, Elizabeth had a sense of what a homicide lieutenant's life must be like. They would bring him items one after another, and he would evaluate them, and sort of put them into his pockets. Yeah. They just called in with the IDs on the other ones. And? The two on Grant Street were for Telly's, too. The house was owned by the old man they found in the river. Thanks, Delamo said, then turned to Elizabeth. I think your theory is starting to look a little weak. Why? Well, there's an old black man we found in the river about supper time with a thirty-eight bullet in his head. It seems that two other guys got killed in his house, with one or more shotguns. Then you got Fratelli and Salvatore Gamucchio, and this other guy who got his neck broken. All in the space of about three or four hours. It's a lot of work. Lieutenant, came another voice, we got some more blood way over there. Get a bunch of it on slides, Delamo said, and then look for some more bodies. I think we're going to have to drag the damned lake as soon as the sun comes up. I think there may be some way to drain it, said the voice. Find out. Call the parks department. Right. Delamo turned back to Elizabeth. I guess that once again the lone gunman theory doesn't hold up. How can you be sure? Because I don't care who this no-name, no-description guy is. It's pretty unlikely that he came in all by himself and wasted six-plus men in at least three locations in three different ways in one night. And if he came here because he hated Angelo Fratelli, he would have killed Angelo Fratelli. He wouldn't have killed three men who worked for Fratelli first. Do you disagree with that? I'd have to know what he was thinking to answer that. Oh, God, she thought. I'm only a few hours behind him, and this man is sending the police to look for a gang while he wastes time convincing me. How do you think one man could do all that? I'm not sure how, said Elizabeth, but I know that ten years ago a man in Las Vegas who had never laid eyes on him came to me for protection because he was afraid to go to sleep. I couldn't blame him, because that morning we'd found nine bodies around town. The man who killed them is the one I'm looking for now. It wasn't long after Ms. Waring left that McElroy appeared at Delamo's elbow again. We just got a radio call from downtown, Lieutenant. 
They said another Fed will be here in a few minutes. We're supposed to extend him every courtesy. Delamo turned to look at him. What the hell is that about? Why wouldn't we? I'm just repeating what they said. The guy wants to examine the body. Fingerprints, pictures, the whole thing. Didn't you tell them we already did that? We've got a positive ID. It's Fratelli. Not that body. The other one. The one with the broken neck. Thirteen. Eddie Mastruski had shown him what to do in a variety of situations that arose in their business. He remembered Eddie waking him up in the middle of the night in a hotel in Milwaukee. At first the boy had been terrified because he thought the only reason to get up in the dark was that the police had somehow found out about the man Eddie had killed by the lake. His name had been Good Eye Fraser. Eddie had told him it was because Fraser had lost an eye in a fight years before, and it had been replaced by a very expensive and well-crafted glass sphere. That was the good eye. The other was small, red, and piercing, and Fraser moved his head like an enraged turkey to bring it to bear on his enemies, a group that seemed to include everyone it looked at. The boy had assumed the police were now moving up the two stairways quietly because only a few hours before the satisfied customers had paid Eddie in a room behind an old pool hall a mile from there. They had scarcely been able to contain their joy at Good Eye's demise. There could be no question of Good Eye's friends seeking vengeance because his friends had been the customers. They had literally stopped a game of rotation on the back pool table and passed a hat around to collect the money. The boy had leaped out of the bed, snatched his revolver out of the drawer of the nightstand, and groped for his pants. At this point he had seen Eddie's grin. "'Don't get excited. Everything's fine,' he had said. "'It's just time to go home.' The boy had been puzzled, but Eddie was busy packing his suitcase. "'We did the job and we got paid for it. But if we're still around after a day, those guys in the pool hall are going to start wondering why. We're dangerous now. The police might find us, and that's bad enough. But we also showed them we could take out a man they were afraid of. And that's even worse. They might get scared that we'll take over and bully them the way Good Eye did. And then they'd be even worse off. Or they might get to feeling ashamed that they had to hire us and that we did it so easy. They'll think, if it was that easy, we should have done it ourselves, so we wasted our money. No matter what they think, it's bad for us, so we won't give them time to think. Anyway, it's part of the contract. If you hang around after a job and get the customers into an uproar, you're denying them the peace of mind they paid for, and you deserve to die. It's only fair. Fair? The boy was still groggy from sleep, and Eddie's reasoning was hard to follow, even in broad daylight. To kill us for that? Sure, Eddie had answered. In this life you always get a little bit worse than you deserve, so you have to take that into account. He had been a child then, and some of it was vague in his memory, but as he thought about it now, the rest of it began to come to him. It had been easy, as Eddie had said, and he realized that Eddie had probably just approached Fraser from his glass-eye side. But the part that seemed different now was the payoff in the pool hall. It hadn't taken place in the back room, really. That was where they had made him wait while Eddie had accepted the money. His memory of it was the loud laughter and hooting coming from the men around the pool table in the front. For the first time, he remembered it as though he had seen it. Eddie sends the boy into the back room and closes the door, then walks up to the pool table and reaches into his pocket. When his hand comes out, the glass eye rolls the length of the table, looking as though it's winking at the men gathered there. What other proof would they have asked for? He knew what Eddie would have said about his situation at this moment. It was his own fault, so he deserved it. It was the result of what Eddie would have called a lapse of professionalism, and he would have said that it had started with the Honorable Meg. Eddie had been the ultimate pragmatist, with little time for sentiment. 
He had never married because it would have been foolish to imagine he could keep his second profession a secret from anyone who lived with him. He had had a series of liaisons with married women in the neighborhood, whom he referred to as his home delivery customers. He would go to their houses on slow afternoons, bringing some lamb chops or a roast for their husband's dinners, then return in a couple of hours and go back to work behind the counter. He would not have approved of the Honorable Meg. But as Wolf searched through his memories of Eddie, he could recall nothing that would help him out of this mess. Eddie had never worked in the league where the customers were more dangerous than the jobs. He had known his limits. Wolf realized that everything he did now would take on huge proportions in the future. There could be no more mistakes. It was time to lose the rented car. If he turned it in, he faced the risk that somebody would have had it traced through the credit card. Just outside Cleveland, in the fringes where car lots, carpet stores, and furniture warehouses marked the farthest reaches of the city, he found a huge new apartment complex. He parked the car on the street in front of it, then walked two miles down the road to a big motel and called a taxi to take him to the airport. Eventually, the people in the complex would realize that the car did not belong to somebody visiting their neighbors, or the cops would notice that it hadn't been moved and would tow it. But that process would probably take a week. If he wasn't out of the country by then, he would probably be dead. It was time to go see Little Norman. Little Norman was the longest-running lounge act in Las Vegas. Each day at four o'clock in the afternoon, for eighteen years, he would eat his breakfast in the back bar at the Sands, then place a two hundred percent tip on the table, stand up to his full six feet six, and stroll out in a pair of cowboy boots that added two inches to his height. Today's boots were hand-sewn iguana with carved silver toe caps and little silver imitation spurs at the heels, selected because the iguana hide went well with the Armani suit he was wearing. As little Norman stepped out of the bar and across the casino toward the door, the throngs of gamblers looked only at the clicking, buzzing, jingling displays on slot machines, or the brightly colored playthings on green felt tables. The only people who really watched little Norman were some men on the walkways above the mirrors in the ceiling because they were paid to see everything, and a couple of women in the cashier's window because they were bored. Their eyes settled on him for only a second and moved on. Little Norman was a regular, part of the garish sameness that they looked at every day. There are places in the world where a man nearly seven feet tall, blacker than the king of the Zulus and weighing 280 pounds might well cause eyes to linger, but Las Vegas isn't one of them. Little Norman was a familiar sight, and he never caused any trouble. If he had, it would have been very quiet and ended very quickly because there were not many people who could have offered more than negligible resistance. Little Norman had discovered Las Vegas in 1958, when he arrived there as the bodyguard of a boxer named Walt the Animal Homer. A convincing bodyguard for a celebrity who made his living beating other celebrities senseless had to be big, ugly, and mean. Anyone could see that Little Norman was big and ugly enough, and the rest of his credentials came to the Las Vegas Police Department, by way of his parole officer in Kansas City. Walt Homer turned out to be a bad ticket. He had his nose moved half an inch to the right in a match in Florida later that year, and the promoters decided not to invest any more in his doubtful future, so it was left in doubt no longer. But in those days, little Norman was a warm, comforting presence for people in certain professions to have around. He met some friends of the promoters, made himself agreeable, did some favors, and eventually built a place for himself in the world. By the time he returned to Las Vegas fifteen years later, it was in the position of responsibility and trust he now held. After breakfast, little Norman always promenaded along the strip, stopping in each of the casino lounges he passed. He would spend a few minutes in each bar, conferring with various consultants he kept on retainer, waitresses and dealers who worked in the casinos, chambermaids who worked above them, and people who simply made it their business to be there because little Norman had told them to. Whenever he had heard enough, he would reach into the pocket of the tailored suit, pull out a wad of twenty-dollar bills, and strip off one note or several, 
depending upon the freshness and weight of what he had been told. What little Norman was doing was checking the weather in Las Vegas. For a number of years now, ten to be precise, the weather had been fine. The money he paid for the recitations he heard each day came to him indirectly from fourteen old men, none of whom lived within five hundred miles of the city, who had gotten into the habit of depending on little Norman. His job was to ensure that nothing ever happened to disturb the tranquility that had prevailed with few interruptions since their predecessors had formally agreed to it forty years ago. Today, as little Norman sampled the weather, he stared particularly intently at his observers and listened for mistakes. It wasn't that any of them would be so foolish as to tell him a lie, but after so many days of clear weather, they might have missed something. As usual, he asked them who had checked in that they recognized, and who had played with a lot more money than his clothes indicated he should have. But today he also asked if there was a man of average height and build, with sand-brown hair, who seemed to be looking for someone. He would have sat watching at a remote table in the bar, or passed through the casino slowly, never gambling or talking to anybody. None of little Norman's people had seen such a man, so by the time he had finished his rounds at eight, he was satisfied that the weather was still fine. At nine p.m., little Norman's long strides took him into Caesar's palace, where he had a light lunch with a girl named Yolanda. She claimed to be nineteen, but provided him with evidence that was ambiguous. When he went to the men's room, she tried to steal some of the money he had left under the check for the waiter. This meant that she was old enough to be squeezing each opportunity to put something away for the future, so she might have seen a sag or a wrinkle already, which argued twenty-five. But doing this also meant that she was young enough not to realize how bad that sort of behavior was for her future, because until the waiter picked it up, that money still belonged to little Norman. He explained the distinction to her patiently, with a reassuring smile on his face, and she listened with the alertness of a rabbit. For her benefit, he added, that Las Vegas was going to be a cold, hard place for her if she didn't value the goodwill of people like waiters and doormen. She demonstrated her native intelligence by openly taking the money out of her sleeve and putting it back on the table. Not on the check, but under her own plate. Little Norman liked her for that. By eleven p.m., Little Norman was making his second circuit of the casinos. He couldn't be everywhere, but he could seem to be. He made eye contact with everybody he saw, whom he knew, so that if they had seen anything he might like to hear, they wouldn't need to wonder where to find him. Little Norman returned to his car in the lot at the Sands at six in the morning. It was a bright red Corvette with an engine that could do a hundred fifty if he had been reckless enough to try it. He had bought the first one he could afford in 1960, and kept trading them in ever since, always bright red because that was the color of the first one he had seen in Kansas City. It was the color Corvettes were. He always had experienced a comfort in having more car than anybody he was likely to have to chase down. Little Norman had lived in some of the big hotels downtown when he had first come to preserve the good weather. The fact that he could afford this luxury had appealed to him then. Now he lived in a three-bedroom house on the edge of town near an entrance to the interstate. The fourteen old men were deeply conservative in their souls, and they didn't trust a man who lived as though he didn't intend to stay. The traffic was sparse, and little Norman drove home with only a couple of almost stops at corners where he had mistimed the lights. He unlocked the door of his house and entered— punched the buttons on the panel in the wall to let his security system know who he was. Then he locked the door and walked into his bedroom. Outside the window at the back of the living room that looked out on the empty swimming pool and the cactus plants, Wolf ducked into the darkness. One, five, two, four, fifteen, twenty-four. He waited, then moved to the bedroom window, stooping to look through the crack in the blinds at little Norman's bedtime ritual. The big man carefully took off his clothes and boots and put them in the closet, then opened the drawer on the nightstand, pulled out a forty-five ACP pistol that Wolf judged was a Beretta, and slipped it under the pillow beside him. 
He disappeared into the bathroom for a few minutes, then returned, climbed into bed, and turned off the light with a remote control on the nightstand. Wolf waited for a half hour, lying on the still warm weeds beside the house, then stood up and began the walk to his motel. It was a couple of miles away, and he was tired. The next day, Little Norman was pleased to learn that the weather in Las Vegas was still fine. He made his rounds wearing boots of crocodile and ostrich hide, and celebrated with an evening meeting with Yolanda in a room he had rented for her at the frontier. It was after five a.m. when he compressed himself into his corvette and drove back to his house. It wasn't until he reached his bedroom that he learned the weather had changed. Hello, Norman. He didn't have to turn his head to know who it was, but he did it anyway. He wasn't going to go into the darkness without being man enough to look. Hello, kid. You're not surprised to see me. I'm surprised you let me see you. Little Norman stared at him. He looked almost the same. He wasn't that much older. No big gut, no less hair, maybe a few wrinkles. Little Norman's mind was full of irrelevant impressions now, each setting off thoughts that would have been distractions if it had mattered what he thought. The butcher's boy would kill him, and they both knew that he wasn't going to stand around and wait for it to happen. He would make an attempt to get to a weapon because he was Little Norman. But he wouldn't make it in time because the man sitting in his chair holding a forty-five on him was who he was. Little Norman also knew that the gun wouldn't jam or miss fire because it was the one he kept under his pillow. The butcher's boy had fooled the alarm system and sat here in the dark waiting for him. This didn't surprise him either. Alarm systems weren't for people like them. They were to keep out some junkie who needed your stereo. He let his eyes dart to the nightstand for the remote control, but it wasn't there. He could have turned out the lights and taken his chances in the dark, but of course this man knew that. So it had to be the lamp itself, quick and low and hard. I'd like to talk to you for a minute, said the butcher's boy. About ten years ago, I know why you're here. I'd be here too. Okay, let's start with ten years ago. I didn't think I was setting you up. I thought they really were going to pay you. If I'd known they were going to take you out on the strip and kill you. He stopped and shrugged. You know me. The butcher's boy nodded. He would have made sure they didn't fuck it up. I was the best. Maybe not ten years ago, but before that. You were the best once. Not a lot of people can say that, especially the ones who were. Little Norman nodded. I might have been able to talk them out of it, too. I always liked you. You were the only one in the trade that seemed to really be alive, besides me. Little Norman kept the lamp in his peripheral vision. He was too far away to grab it. He would have to bat it at the boy. I'm curious, kid. I know you're not going to tell me where you've been. No. But tell me this. Did you have any fun? This seemed to take the boy by surprise. Fun? Yeah. I mean, was it worth it? Ten years is a hell of a lot of time to be hiding in a hole somewhere. Did you put together any kind of a life while you were gone? I liked it. It was a hell of a lot better than I thought it would be. I'd have stayed forever. It doesn't make me any happier to be here, but at least I didn't waste the time I had. I'm glad. At least old Eddie taught you something that did you some good. Don't tell me when you're going to do it. Just make it in the head. I'm not here for that. I'm not taking you this time unless you can't stand good luck and go for the lamp or something. I want you to talk to the old men. There was no question of who the old men were. What for? What do you want to say to them? Remind them of what happened ten years ago. I behaved like a professional. 
I did the job. I came here to get paid, and the customer tried to chew me up. They don't give a shit about any of that. They didn't then. They cared because of what you did after that. You buried a lot of people. It took them years to clean everything up. I want them to remember that, too. You understand what I'm saying? You want to scare the old man? Has it been that long? You don't remember who they are? If they kill me, they get nothing. If they leave me alone, they can forget about me. I'm not working anymore. You did Talarese and Mantino and Fratelli. Three medium big fish in one week. Talarese is the one who found me. Mantino had a specialist waiting for me when I tried to get out on a plane. Fratelli had people looking for me. I guess he was doing Balacantano a favor. That ain't the story they're telling. Little Norman could tell that this wasn't what the butcher's boy had expected to hear. What are they saying? Talarese was wearing a police wire when you got him. Talarese? Bullshit. You wanted to know what they're saying. That's it. A lot of people think somebody who had problems with what was on the recording hired you to get all three of them. Some people think you just went crazy from hiding. You figured it wasn't enough to put Carl Bala in jail. You had to cut down the ones he left in charge, so his family would fall apart. I did them because it was the only way they left me to stay alive. Little Norman watched him for a reaction. Then you made a mistake. If Talarese was wired, Mantino would be on the recordings. He'd be glad Talarese was dead. I didn't imagine that guy at the airport. When I left, the cops were moving in on him. Did you know his face? No. A tall guy with blonde hair and a mustache. Did you ever let anybody take your picture? No. Couldn't Mantino have found somebody who saw you in the old days? Think about it. You sure he wasn't one of the cops? Wolf didn't have to think. Who did the wire belong to? I won't know unless they arrest somebody. Maybe they won't. Maybe you killed everybody worth jail space. I'm leaving now, said the butcher's boy. He stood up, the gun still trained on little Norman. Tell the old men what I said. Make sure they know what they're doing if they decide to come after me. You think Carl Bala's going to leave you alone? Carl Bala can't do anything unless they let him. What about the police? I'm worried about the old men. How do I give you their answer? Wolf shook his head. This is the last conversation anybody's going to have with me. If somebody is looking for me, watching me or waiting for me, I'll know where they came from. All you're offering is that if they leave you alone, you'll leave them alone? The butcher's boy gave a little shrug. It's not a bad deal. He stepped backward out the door and closed it behind him. Little Norman strained to hear his footsteps, then listened for the squeaking hinge on the front door, then waited for the rattle of a car's starter. He heard none of them. No, he said aloud. Not a bad deal at all. Elizabeth cradled the baby in her arms. Amanda was asleep, but every time Elizabeth tried to ease the bottle out of her mouth, she would suck on it a few times to reassure herself that it was still there. Elizabeth stared across the baby's room at the wall. It had occurred to her a few seconds ago that if she were the butcher's boy, right about now, she would be on her way to Boston to get Giovanni Battista. It would have to be done right, though, a virtuoso performance, because Battista would be expecting him. He was the last of Balacantano's old stalwarts, and if the butcher's boy killed him now, it would accomplish two things. It would cut off, at least for the moment, Carl Bala's most potent remaining means of finding him, and it would scare the hell out of everybody outside the family who might consider hunting him. This was the part that nobody else had ever understood about the butcher's boy ten years ago. In order to survive, he'd had to remind people of their mortality. 
That would be what was on his mind now, surviving by convincing people that if they didn't leave him alone, he would kill them. What else did he have? Now she slipped the bottle out of Amanda's lips, jammed it upright beside her in the padding of the chair, then carefully eased her weight forward and straightened her legs to stand. So far, so good. Amanda was still limp and sleeping, a little gurgle in the back of her throat coming in slow, regular intervals, like a snore. Elizabeth stepped carefully on the boards of the hardwood floor that she remembered didn't creak much, and made her way to the crib in her stockings. She leaned over the bars with Amanda in her arms, setting first the little heels, then the bottom, then the back, and only then, very slowly, the head on the mattress. She pulled the soft blanket up to the baby's armpits and was turning to sneak out of the room when she heard the telephone down the hall ring. She froze and looked at Amanda, then tried to step toward the doorway more quickly, each step now landing unerringly on a board that cracked like a rifle shot, and the phone growing unaccountably louder. She slipped out, quickly closed the door, and skated on her stocking feet to the telephone in the office. Yes, she said into it. She knew her voice sounded angry, and how could they know? Richardson's voice had a stupid cheerfulness. Hi, Elizabeth. Hope I didn't get you up. No, she said. You know, I never asked you. Do you have any kids? Sure. She could hear him beaming, probably looking at a picture that he kept somewhere out of sight. Dan's twenty-two and Brenda's nineteen. She just transferred to Northwestern. Of course the question had been a mistake. She had wanted to know whether he had any idea what time one-year-olds get up, or whether he had simply forgotten. But the instant she had asked, she realized that Richardson wouldn't have been the one to get up with a baby. Actually, I was going to call you before work anyway. I'd like to have the Boston office watch Giovanni Battista as closely as possible starting now. I know it's expensive. And also get the people who watch airports and borders to step up security on the major routes from Boston into Canada. Why Canada? That's in case the ones who are watching Batista make a mistake. The butcher's boy is ready to leave. I can feel it. He'll do something to get them off his back so he can disappear. Killing Batista is one possibility. There are others, of course, but that one just struck me. Can you do it? I'm not sure what we can do. We're going to have a meeting. The deputy assistant wants to talk about the case. Which one? Hillman's in charge of us. How soon can you get here? I'm not sure. I've got to get Jimmy up and give him his breakfast. Then I'll call the babysitter and ask her to come early. I'll be there as soon as I can. As soon as she let the receiver's weight press down on the button, it rang again, as though it were alive. She snatched it up. Yes? It was Hamp. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm sorry to call you before work, when the baby's probably getting ready to nod off. How did you know? Do you have kids? I just have a knack for waking people up. Can you talk? Yes. Where are you? Cleveland. They found the car he was using. I can see it from where I'm standing. He abandoned it in the parking lot of a big project. He left it clean. I hope you're not waiting for me to sound surprised. Did you get anything out of it? Dead end, Hamp said. He rented it on the Ackerman credit card. As far as I can tell, he hasn't let anybody run the card through a machine since then. Elizabeth sighed. Great. Jack, I think the place he's going might be Boston. He could be after Giovanni Battista. There was a long silence on the other end, and she could hear the sounds of traffic. Finally, he said, I don't think so. Why not? Maximum trouble, maximum confusion. Batista is the logical one to hit. That's right. It's practically a straight line. L.A., Santa Fe, drop off the car in Cleveland, then Buffalo. There's not much left in that direction but Boston. I see your point. Too obvious for him. What's your theory? I think he's someplace in the Midwest. I think he's laying low and looking for a way out. What are you going to do? 
The best place to wait for him to poke his head up is Chicago. I can get just about any place from there in an hour or two. Jack, there's something I just found out that I ought to tell you about. My boss has called a meeting. The deputy assistant is going to be there, so it's got to be about money or resources, or whatever you want to call it, so don't worry about it. I'm independently wealthy. I have a pension from the LAPD. I'll call you with my new number when I get to Chicago. The conference room looked different, even though it was another dark, rainy dawn. It was because the last time she had been here she was alone, laying out printouts on the big table and sitting in one chair, then another, and looking at each corner of the room without knowing she was seeing it, because the front of her mind was thinking about the way he would be traveling. People in the room changed it, and even though it was their place, it wasn't an improvement. Hillman, the deputy assistant, was already seated at the head of the table. It was typical of Richardson to relinquish his space to a visiting potentate. In a subtle way, this made it the deputy assistant's meeting, and he obviously knew it. He sat back and watched her enter and look around at the others, then take a seat at the opposite end of the table. If it was going to be that kind of meeting, then she would take a place where she could face him. Elizabeth studied him without letting her eyes rest on him. He had thick brown hair that had begun to recede, and he had allowed some hairdresser to convince him to comb it forward in the front, so that at first it appeared to be a hairpiece. When she had come in, she had assumed he was tall because he had wide shoulders. But now he lifted his arms and rested them on the table, and they were so short that she thought that she must be taller than he was, and that he had probably arrived early enough to be seated before anyone saw him. He was going to interfere, just as his predecessors had ten years ago. Simply by being here and asking questions for an hour or two, he would cost them half a day. In half a day, the butcher's boy could put them another ten years behind him. The deputy assistant looked down at his watch, then at her. "'Miss Waring?' "'Hello, Mr. Hillman,' she said. There were three other women in the room, and all of them were in their twenties and wore designer glasses that had been chosen as accessories to outfits of the sort that nobody in this office used to wear except in court. From the looks of their hair, all of them had gotten the call hours before she had. "'It's nice to see you again.' She could tell that Hillman wasn't sure if he had seen her before, but if she had been in the Justice Department for more than ten years, she had a right to expect that the upper echelon at least knew her by sight. I understand you've been transferred from fraud. What's your first impression? I'm not exactly new, she said. This is where I started. And I'm not transferring back. I'm just on loan for this case. Hillman nodded sagely. That's right. It was as though he had been testing her hold on her sanity. The reason we're having this little get-together is that this case came as a surprise upstairs. I'd sort of like to get up to speed. I understand that this butcher fellow assassinated one of our informants in New York so that the wire was discovered. Then the theory is that he flew to Santa Fe and killed a boss named Peter Mantino, and then went to Buffalo and killed the boss there. Elizabeth nodded. That's one possibility. Richardson looked alarmed. Just a day ago you were sure of it. He glanced at the deputy assistant, as though he were checking to see if he was on fire. "'Has something changed?' Elizabeth answered him, but looked at the deputy assistant. "'The Buffalo police pointed out to me that it's a lot of work for one person, no matter who he is. It meant he had to kill several other people in Buffalo, at least three, in different ways in a few hours. Not that he couldn't do it, but it leaves the question of why.' Why? This time it was the deputy assistant. I understood that this is what he does. It's easy to think of reasons why a boss is murdered. Somebody hires the killer, or he has a personal grudge to settle. It's not as easy to imagine why one man would come in and shoot two or three soldiers in one part of town, then go shoot the boss and three more soldiers afterward. Nobody would hire one man to do that. And the only reason anyone would want that sort of massacre is an unfriendly takeover. The butcher's boy isn't eligible for management. Richardson smirked. 
I don't think we really need the advice of the Buffalo police on this sort of thing, do we? I didn't ask for it, but it makes a certain amount of sense. Richardson prompted her. But you aren't buying it, are you? Some of it. The others waited, but she didn't go on. Finally, Richardson prodded her. Which parts? The last time we heard of the butcher's boy ten years ago, he did something very similar. Only we didn't know what was happening until later. I think that something went wrong that made his clients turn on him, so he was on the run and did it to churn up the water so he could get away. I can't be sure why he's doing it this time, but I don't think it's for money. All right, Elizabeth, said the deputy assistant. She noted the change to her first name. You've just come from fraud, so you know something about revenue center budgeting. That's what I'm here about. We have limited resources to work with. This is one case, one man. What do we get if we catch him, and what does it cost? Elizabeth thought for a moment, then decided. She was going to have to defeat Hillman by tunneling under whatever position he took, so that she got there before he did. In fraud, that wasn't hard to answer. We were recovering money stolen from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We just figured out who took the most, who was likely to still have it, and we went after him. This is different. I don't have the slightest idea what it would cost to catch him, and I don't know what we get. The deputy assistant nodded again, and this time he was smiling in contemplation of the triumph he was about to savor. You have to look at this from the Malthusian point of view. I have to go upstairs and tell our bosses what I think we should do with our finite resources that will result in the greatest good or the maximum damage to evil, if you will. The range of options is staggering, and we'd like to do it all. But you have to be hard-nosed about this. Is this something we should pursue on a federal level? He smiled as though he knew the answer, then added, Of course you could tell me that this is the kind of decision I get the big bucks for making. He looked around, and the people at the table chuckled on cue. He seemed pleased. But I've got nothing to go on unless you help me. All right, said Elizabeth. What a loathsome little man. She would have to argue his position for him and let him see what was wrong with it. As I said, I believe that the butcher's boy fell out with his employers ten years ago, and as a result killed a number of organized crime figures, some important, some not, in order to create the maximum chaos so that he'd have time to get away. I think that he's an evil man, and in a perfect society would be forced to suffer some punishment. But if you're asking if you should take, say, two million dollars from enforcing civil rights laws to spend on getting him, I don't know. I doubt it. The current administration had spent virtually nothing on enforcing civil rights laws, and everyone at the table knew it. Richardson looked faint, but the deputy assistant seemed to relish the conversation. Give me a reasoning, Elizabeth. The reason we wanted him ten years ago was that we believed he knew a great deal about the men who ran organized crime and their activities. He'd have to. He was a sort of contract exterminator for people at a very high level. But I think he's been in hiding for ten years. If that's true, what he knows is mostly old news, which might make it hard to get convictions. There's also the problem that his knowledge is pretty much limited to capital crimes. If we find him, we may not take him alive. If we do, he probably won't tell us anything. I can't assume many judges would grant him immunity to testify, or that immunity would be worth much without protection from the Mafia, which would get us into the area of the Witness Protection Program. If he stayed alive while they were looking for him for ten years, he can do better on his own. And, of course, it would put the department in the position of setting a man free who has probably killed dozens of people. Dozens? Literally? Hillman raised his eyebrows. That's if the stories are true. It's hard to tell. And we won't know unless we go out and catch him. Elizabeth didn't take the bait. I can't guarantee we'll ever know more than we do right now. 
I'm not qualified to tell you whether taking him off the streets will be of political value to the department. I do know it probably won't contribute much to the safety of the average citizen in his home. In fact, what he's been doing all week is killing off some of the very people we'd most like to take out of the game. That includes the informant you mentioned. Tony T. was a bad man. I'm impressed, Elizabeth, said the deputy assistant. I asked for hard-nosed, and that's exactly what I got. What's your conclusion? I think the opposition is more likely to get him than we are. You do? Sure. They would consider him a more serious problem than we do because his memory can put a lot of them away for life. They know more about him than we do, and they have an unlimited budget. She hesitated for a second, not because she was considering not saying it, but to be sure he got it. And they operate on utilitarian principles, too. Richardson came out of the elevator and stalked directly to Elizabeth's desk. He likes you. He does? He thinks you're the best thing that could happen. She shook her head. I could see it from the minute I walked in there. We were made for each other. The electricity in the air, the— Jesus, Elizabeth, you handled him brilliantly. You won. Now be gracious in victory and stop fighting. He wants us to go for it. Fourteen. Wolf stood in the shower and let the heavy flow of water pour over him. He needed to be soothed. When he moved, he could feel a small hitch in his back where he had taken the jolts of the bus ride across Arizona. He had been awakened a few times during the night, not by the sounds of cars, the motel ice machine, or the voices in other rooms, but by his mind running through its accumulated clutter. Each time when consciousness came, he would find himself in mid-thought, sometimes in mid-sentence, fully aware of the specious train of logic he had been following in his sleep. The last time he had been thinking about Meg. He hated to think about her now when he was awake because she was gone forever. He never had any trouble recalling the sight of her or even the scent of her perfume. He had been constructing a dream about her. In it he would live, and then he would go back and look at her. It wouldn't be easy to accomplish, because women of her class ventured off the enclosed protected parks their husbands inherited less and less often as they grew older. They were occupied with their children until they sent them away to some awful boarding school, and after that they saw a select group of friends who were, after so many generations, so closely related that they looked like sisters. When he reached this part of the dream, the sense of loss and disappointment woke him up, and he began to scheme in the darkness for some way to go home. At some point in the night he had let go of it, and awakened to the one thing the darkness and isolation had let him forget. He had been doing his feeling and thinking on the premise that he was a constant, unchanging being, that the continuity of his memories and consciousness somehow guaranteed that he was the same. But now, as he became more alert to the physical world that chilled his bones, put pressure on his joints, and reflected his body in mirrors, he remembered. When he was asleep, or when nothing reminded him of it, he felt exactly the same as he had the first time he had put on his Little League baseball uniform. He could even remember the incredible whiteness of the flannel, and feel the softness of it against his legs. That was the ridiculous part of memory, or one of the ridiculous parts. It was only his body that wasn't still ten years old. Wolf dried himself with two of the big rough white towels and walked into the bedroom. There were really two problems now, and the way to get through this was to look at them separately. The old men were the big problem. He had done the right thing by going to Las Vegas. Little Norman might be able to convince them that the best thing they could do was to let Carl Bala stay in his cage and forget about helping him with his revenge. The other problem was new to him. He knew that Little Norman must have been telling the truth. Tony Talarese had been wearing a wire. It was the only thing that explained the commotion in the kitchen when he had popped the bastard. It had been so obvious. Why hadn't he figured it out? Because it was such an outrageous idea that his mind had somehow blocked it. But now the New York police knew something about him. 
Hell, they must know a lot about him, if they could have five cops waiting for him in the Los Angeles airport a few hours later. Because that's what it had been. He had seen the whole thing wrong. It wasn't four cops looking for a shooter. It was five cops looking for him. He sat down on the bed and thought about this, and it was still wrong. The New York police couldn't have gotten on a plane and caught up with him like that. They would have needed to take practically the next flight out of New York, and what could they expect to do in Los Angeles? They wouldn't have jurisdiction. Now it fell into place inevitably. It wasn't the New York police. It was federal cops. The FBI. It fit better anyway. They were the ones who were always bugging telephones and taping microphones to people, and they wouldn't have to put anybody on a plane. They would simply make a phone call to the Los Angeles office to have their agent bring four bozos across town to scoop him up. Wolf dressed quickly and walked across the street to the payphone outside a small diner. He had twenty dollars in quarters, two ten-dollar rolls that he had bought from the sleepy change girl posted near the slot machines in the lobby of his motel in Las Vegas. He had picked up the habit from Little Norman in the old days, and it had come back to him. Little Norman had always told him that his hands were too small to use by themselves. A fist wrapped around a roll of quarters might lose a few hundredths of a second getting there, but when it did, it would make an impression. He put a quarter into the telephone and dialed the number. The operator came on the line and said, Please deposit 335. He laboriously pumped fourteen quarters into the slot, and after the fourteenth, the operator wouldn't go away until she had said, You have fifteen cents credit. Then it sounded as though she were climbing into a jar and then screwing the lid on after her. And finally he heard the ring. It sounded different from the ones here, sort of bubbly and quick and it made him feel as though he were home. It was maddening. He was listening to her phone, and he could see the room in his memory. Hello? Hi, he said. I'm going to have to talk fast. After leaving me alone this long, I should say you are. He tried to remember how long it had been since he had heard anyone talk with a smile in her voice. Not to make excuses. It's the connection. Wiring problems, I think. She would understand that. It was from one of those silly books she had made him read. The British spy had detected a couple of ohms of extra resistance on the line to his reading lamp, and concluded it must be a bug. An American would have gone through the place with a bug detector. You could buy one for twenty-five bucks. Oh, she said. Then, oh. It was the FBI that worried him. In another book she had forced on him, he had read that the National Security Agency had the capability of recording every transatlantic telephone call. The book hadn't said whether they did it, or what use they made of all those tapes, but if they didn't share them with the FBI, they were stupid. He had heard a lot about American intelligence services, but he hadn't heard that they weren't devious enough. "'I'm going to have to stay longer than I thought,' he said." Why? Can you? It's because I made a mistake. I'd like to say it was something else, but it wasn't. Is there anything I can do? This was the hard part. If they were listening, it had to be plausible nonsense. Yeah, it's funny I should be thinking about this right now, but I can't get it out of my mind. The best thing you could do is spend today rearranging things. Maybe move your clothes and stuff. A good place might be at the north end, where the bed used to be. He spent a second hoping she had gotten it, and knowing she couldn't have. He thought of Yorkshire Pudding, and there was an archbishop, but if he got that crude, they would have it before she did. But she said, Oh, the present arrangement isn't good? Her voice had the sort of concern he was listening for, but he needed to be sure. I've done a lot of this kind of decorating, he said. If you take my advice, I think it will brighten things up a lot. Is it that dark now? He was satisfied. She knew. It just struck me as a good idea. I'd love to look the place over myself, but I just can't get away right now. I'm hoping I'll be able to soon. I'd be very sad if you couldn't. I would, too. 
There was a long silence on the other end, and he thought he could hear her breathing. It began to bring her back as a physical presence, the barely detectable scent on her hair, the incredibly soft skin just in front of her ear. And then... I wanted to say, Margaret said, just in case we don't get to speak again soon, that I... She paused, and then said the next two words softly. Love you. He drew in his breath to answer, but she went on rapidly. Please don't answer, because it wouldn't mean anything if you did right now. I wouldn't have said it today either, but I thought I'd better, given the circumstances. These things often don't get said, and then you regret it and all that. I know this is being unfair to you in case you wanted to say it for the same reasons, but that's the way it is. I love you. After all that, it makes me feel worse than I thought, because it's so typical of you. I've got to go now. Don't forget what I said. Michael, wait. What? That was stupid of me. I'm sorry. I just... you know. I hope it's not long. But if it is, I'll... Don't. He hung up the telephone and heard a loud jangle as the machine dumped the load of quarters into its collection box. As he watched for a break in the traffic so that he could get back across the street to his motel, he felt worse. He hadn't made her understand. He should have told her something closer to the truth. He wasn't delayed. He was probably dead. The Dons might sit back and wait while he disappeared and then tell Carl Bala in his prison cell that it was just one of those things. But if he didn't disappear, then he was in trouble. After allowing him a decent interval, they would change their minds. And already the people who worked for Carl Bala would be out in force, hanging in all the places where he had ever been seen, watching for him. He might be able to avoid them for a time, but not forever. He had never worried much about the authorities before. He still didn't think they could catch him, except by some gigantic stroke of blundering good luck. But what if they could actually keep him from leaving the country? He had just used up the only passport he had that would get him past the computerized scanners they had installed in the airports since he had left, and there was no way he could try again to buy one. What had happened in Buffalo had closed that down for all time. He had to get out before Bala had time to replace Tallarese and Mantino and Fratelli, and the new men got things organized enough to come after him. What could it take? Two or three days? A week at the outside? What the hell else did the old son of a bitch have to do? Wolf was starting to feel a kind of claustrophobia. Somehow the country had shrunk. Ten years ago it had been a place full of possibilities. He could disappear simply by fading into a crowd, or take a quick jump that put him five hundred miles away so they would have to start looking for him all over again. Now everything seemed to be a lot closer to everything else. He had to find out something about this FBI business. Sergeant Bob Lempert had spent most of his career under suspicion. In 1965, he and an older cop named Mulroy had been assigned to stay in a hotel to be sure nothing happened to a bookmaker named Ricky Hinks before he could testify in the conspiracy trial of Paul Cambria. Ricky Hinks was later found to have slipped into the bathroom, cut the shower curtain into strips with a razor, and tied them together to make a rope. He had then used it to lower himself from the bathroom window to the alley below, where he had been shot to death by persons unknown. It was considered to be bad luck all around, certainly for Ricky Hinks, who must have lowered himself into the gun sights of some obstructors of justice, but also for officers Mulroy and Lempert, because he had died without revealing how he had managed to slice up the curtain with an electric razor or lower himself sixty feet on a twenty-foot rope. The internal inquiry was not released in detail, the Gary police chief was quoted as saying, because it was inextricably intertwined with an ongoing investigation. The two officers involved had done their duty. But from that moment on, Bob Lempert's career took a detour into limbo. He was considered to be a competent cop at a time when cops who were eager to respond to those 2 a.m. domestic disturbance calls from sparsely patrolled neighborhoods or to venture into the very asshole of the city to check out shots-fired reports were at a premium. Jobs were plentiful in Gary, Indiana, for healthy white veterans who could read, and not many of them paid less than a cop made, 
so there was no point in throwing away a good body. Lampert remained a trusted member of the force, the kind you wanted behind you when you kicked in a door. But this trust went only so far. You didn't want him behind you if you kicked in certain very expensive doors, and you didn't want him in plain clothes where he could get too used to the availability of payoffs. But for your B and E's, your aggravated assaults, your shut up and go back in your house because I'm the law situations, you couldn't do much better than Bob Lempert. Lempert had made sergeant when he was pushing fifty. In his case, it was a sort of honorary title because nobody wanted him put in charge of anything. This was not because the aroma of the 1965 incident had lingered in the nostrils of the powerful for so many years. It was because from time to time the odor returned. In the mid-seventies, when Eddie Parnell, the challenger for the presidency of the Laundry Union, was killed with his two brothers on the eve of the election, people pointed out that Eddie and his family were not completely ignorant that some such thing might happen. All three of them wore pistols in shoulder holsters twenty-four hours a day, and would not have opened the door to just anybody who took the trouble to wrap his knuckles on it. It would have had to be somebody they had no reason to suspect, somebody who could walk in armed without being frisked, somebody they couldn't have simply told to come back tomorrow after the ballots had been counted. It would have had to be a cop. In the eighties there had been a number of puzzling incidents, notably the strange death of a known cocaine dealer named Milo Muchelmas Figueroa. He had been shot down at his heavily fortified house after firing several ineffective shots with an AK-47 into trees near two officers. In the inquiry, it was learned that the two officers had no search warrant because they had not intended to enter the dwelling. In fact, they were off duty and had simply been fired upon as they were passing by. Odder still were Mr. Figueroa's garb, consisting of a sleeveless T-shirt and silk boxer shorts, the hour he had chosen to go berserk, which was four a.m., and the fact that he had chosen to defend his fortress from outside its walls. None of this would have merited a page in the annals of cocaine-induced paranoia, except that when the premises were thoroughly searched, not a milligram of cocaine was found, nor any currency. One of the off-duty officers who assisted at Mr. Figueroa's suicide was Bob Lempert. Lempert could not be considered a bitter man, in spite of all this coincidence and bad luck. He was, in fact, cheerful most of the time. He had stayed on the force long after he had done his twenty years, and showed up for work each day, ready with either a joke of his own or a laugh at someone else's. Today he was in a worse mood than he had been in since the Internal Affairs Division had called him in to ask about the death of Miriam Pernasky, the jeweler. That time he hadn't really been prepared since it had been such a rush job. Miriam Pernasky was one of the modern practitioners of the ancient process of changing money into gold, then changing it back again in another country. At some point in her career she had lost her appreciation for simplicity and begun performing the same kind of alchemy simultaneously for several local dealers in recreational chemicals. Then she had made the mistake that attorneys and accountants sometimes do, which was to merge the accounts of several clients. Having made this first step into unsound bookkeeping, she had gradually betrayed her fiduciary responsibility for the funds of the Cambria family entirely, and begun feeding what she received into the big end of the funnel, paying out what she needed to at the small end, and paying herself whatever profit she could make in between. When mutual fund managers did this, it was called an administration fee. When money laundresses did it, it was called skimming. At the moment when Lempert had learned about this, he was told that she was already on her way to the airport and that he had an hour to stop her. Afterward, when the shooting team had grilled Lempert, he had been able to explain her unfortunate accident adequately. The woman had sideswiped a police car because she was in such a rush to get to the hospital having been shot in the abdomen by persons unknown, probably in a robbery attempt. But what had put him in a bad mood was learning what was in her suitcases only after the ambulance had arrived. It was more than a million in cash, and bank deposit books with numbers in them that were so big, they didn't have any meaning. Lempert was in the same kind of mood today. Paul Cambria had told his man Puccio to get the word out. 
the butcher's boy had come back. If he were the sort of man who had a lot of luck going for him, he might have managed to drop the hammer on the bastard because Lempert was one of a small, select group of people who had seen the butcher's boy up close in the old days and was still alive. About fifteen years ago, Lempert had worked with him. At least, that was the way he would have put it to Paul Cambria, if he had been important enough to talk to Cambria personally. Actually, he had been the driver, or he would have been if necessary. It was the night when the butcher's boy was supposed to walk through the back door of the Garibaldi Social Club and quietly rid the city of the menace of Andy Ugolino. The idea was that afterward, if things weren't quiet, Lempert would pull up in a squad car, everybody else would run the other way, and the butcher's boy would slip into the back seat and get a ride across town. As it happened, things had gone very quietly, and the police escort hadn't been necessary. But Lempert had seen him twice, once before and once while he was walking out of the social club. The problem was that the butcher's boy had also seen Lempert. At the time, Lempert had believed that it was likely to be useful in the future to get to know all the important people he could. Important people knew other important people, and opportunities could come from anywhere. He even had the odd notion that they might get to be friends. Lempert was an ordinary guy, after all, and he had never heard anything about the man that said he wasn't one, too. When he said it to himself, he had a picture in his mind. He didn't analyze it, but the essential elements were that the guy would be somebody you might drink a beer with in a neighborhood bar, and that he should have some passing interest in sports, maybe enough interest to place a small bet now and then. There was a subtle bond between men whose lives were contested, who could keep living only as long as they won. That wasn't exactly Lempert, but he had been in some tight spots. So he had contrived to meet the bastard. Puccio had told Lempert he was going to see the guy the day before and give him the money. It was supposed to be in a restaurant called The Golden Cock, and Puccio had wanted to be sure there wasn't some plan to raid the place that day because the cops knew there were slot machines in the room upstairs. Puccio didn't want to be sitting in the place holding a hundred thousand in cash when some idiot rookie with a fire axe in his hand burst in through the back door to arrest illegal gamblers. But even more fervently, he didn't want to be sitting across the table from that particular man when the cops came in. Lempert assured him that the place was not due to come up on the list until August, and maybe not even then. But it gave Lempert an excuse to show up and meet the butcher's boy. It was a mistake. He wasn't an ordinary guy. Lempert walked up to the booth in the corner just as Puccio was saying something in a low voice about whacking Ugolino. The man was a disappointment at first glance. He didn't look like much, no big shoulders or bull neck, and he was wearing a herringbone tweed sport coat with no tie. He had thin sandy brown hair and brown eyes, and his fingers were long and thin, like a musician's. One hand was sort of playing with his napkin on the table as though he were preoccupied, and his eyes seemed almost dull as they passed across Lempert. Then he looked up. Sit down. Lempert had grinned and pulled out a chair, but then he noticed that Puccio was scared shitless. What the fuck? he whispered. Get out of here. Lempert's grin lingered on his face because he didn't know what to do with it. The man repeated... Sit down. This time he let the napkin slip a little, and Lempert's grin disappeared. Under the hem of the napkin he could see the black muzzle of a silencer aimed at his belly, and the hand was preparing to pull the trigger of the pistol through the napkin. He sat down. The man turned his expressionless face on Puccio. Keep your money. But he's... I know who he is. He's your cop. Look said Puccio. He just made a mistake. Please, don't kill him. Lempert had never heard these terms applied to himself before. Even after he had seen the gun, it had not occurred to him that he had done anything that could conceivably raise the stakes to that level. On reflection, he realized that he should have known before the gun, as soon as he had seen the eyes. They were not the eyes of a man who was afraid or angry. They weren't even eager like the eyes of a cat or a dog about to tear something up. Those eyes had a kind of excitement or anticipation. This was not an ordinary guy. Lempert had been a cop for a long time by then, 
and he had seen something like this before. He didn't know a lot about what he was looking at, but he knew that if this man started to smile, Lempert was going to dive for the floor and try to get his gun out in time. The butcher's boy said, I won't. I'm going to get up in a minute. You're both going to sit where you are until I'm gone. Don't send for me again. Puccio looked at Lempert, a quick glance that was intended to communicate a lot of things at once. It said something like, See what you did? But it also said, If you speak or move or even change your expression, we're going to die. And if I die here like this, I'll hound you through hell for all eternity. Puccio was like that. He never forgot or forgave or made allowances. He was a brilliant man, and it was his tragedy that the Cambria businesses had grown so large that he couldn't handle all the details himself. Lempert let all the life go out of him and sat there, barely breathing. "'Look, kid,' said Puccio, "'I apologize. I'm embarrassed. The money just doubled. I'll throw another hundred thousand in out of my own pocket. The job's not worth that.' It was a strange thing for a man to say. The price isn't the issue. Puccio nodded, but slowly, and he didn't talk with his hands the way he usually did. I know. I'm sincere. I'm trying to make up for this and show you I'm a serious man. The butcher's boy looked at Puccio for a minute, then said, All right. Lempert wasn't sure he had heard correctly at first because he was busy remembering the sight of the Gosha brothers. Puccio had actually had them hung on meat hooks in the freezer of the Ritzmar Quality Packing Company, like some Don in a movie. Only he had taped a button on the electrical track so that they were still going around and around when the rest of the employees came to work on Monday morning. Lempert had arrived just after the homicide guys, and they were still up there. The rumor was that they had run their own football pool in the plant and had cost Puccio about ten thousand dollars in receipts. Puccio was already saying, I know you'll get out, but just in case. The butcher's boy let his eyes settle on Lempert and said, I want him. No sense having everybody in town see my face. Afterward, Puccio didn't kill Lempert, but he did everything he could to make him think he was going to. As soon as the butcher's boy had gone, he shrugged his shoulders, chuckled, and patted Lempert on the back. We dodged it that time, he said. The only reason Lempert could think of why Puccio would behave that way was if he didn't expect to see Lempert again. When Lempert had tried to stammer out, I'm sorry, I didn't know, Puccio had said, It's forgotten. Just don't do it again. It was only after Ugolino was dead and Lempert was still alive that he started to take breaths that actually kept enough oxygen going to his brain. At that point he understood what was going on. By the time he had arrived in his squad car to watch the butcher's boy come out of the social club, Ugolino had been dead almost an hour. That was what the coroner's report had said. Lempert read it three times to be sure. But what gave him such chills that the skin on his jowls tightened and made his whiskers actually rise to the touch was that the death was listed as natural causes. The best he could figure it was that the bastard had somehow gotten to Ugolino in the crowd and injected him with something that made his heart stop and then let him slip down under the table at the booth in the back before anybody saw him. Who the hell would try to kill somebody like Ugolino that way? But whatever he had done... He had hung around for an hour inside the building before leaving. Paul Cambria had gone to Ugolino's funeral with his foreman Puccio in attendance. In the surveillance photographs, the two of them had looked dignified and mournful as they accepted the homage of Ugolino's family and friends. Two hundred thousand was a bargain. They didn't just get to see Ugolino dead, they got to eat him afterward, like cannibals. Now the butcher's boy was supposed to be back. It made Lempert's jaw ache to think about it. He could get rich in the fraction of a second it took to exert four ounces of pressure with his right forefinger. But it wasn't just money. The invisible men who quietly owned the planet would be so pleased that they would give him a charmed existence. Nothing could ever touch him again. 
The secret agony he had felt and lived with since the first time he had been passed over for promotion twenty-odd years ago would be transformed in an instant into a cosmic joke. Sergeant, hell, governors didn't live the life he would live if he were just lucky enough to be standing there when the bastard showed his face. It was exactly like winning the lottery. But there were problems. Puccio had called him to give him the news, and he wasn't looking at it like an early payday. That meant Paul Cambria wasn't either. Paul Cambria was one of the men who ran things in the world, and that put him just below the old men themselves, the ones you saw only in blurry photographs. If Paul Cambria had something to worry about, then the rest of the human race was in trouble. But at work, two days later, he learned why a thinking man like Puccio wasn't seeing this development as an opportunity, but as an occasion that might cause his name to be left out of next year's phone book. The FBI was in an uproar because suddenly, for no known reason, Antonio Tallarese, Angelo Fratelli, and Peter Mantino had stopped being suspected organized crime figures and become homicide victims. The FBI wasn't just sending circulars, but was making urgent inquiries to learn if anyone in any big city police station had ever heard of anyone, a.k.a. Butcher's Boy. Lempert could almost feel the velvety texture of the first cushion-soft stack of hundred-dollar bills. The bastard wasn't out depopulating the civilized world. He was on some kind of a batch job, slicing off a few of the heads that stuck up above the crowd. Lempert didn't have to ask himself who was likely to be the next of the heads. Puccio had told him. Lempert was going to get rich. Lempert sat in the back of the van he had taken from Impound and watched the line of people inching slowly toward the front door of the cinema Marrakesh. Over the door, the giant 1930s marquee had actually been washed, and a couple of thousand burned-out light bulbs had been replaced. Some of the plaster carvings on the lintel had actually had a little gold paint slapped on them, too. The green, foot-high letters on the marquee said only Belladonna. The movie had so many big stars in it that there wouldn't have been room for them. And maybe it didn't make any difference, because everybody knew what it was and who was in it, and the star was supposed to be the director anyway. In a way, it was ridiculous for Paul Cambria to take his wife to a movie like that, even if it was an opening. It had to be comical to him. The idea was supposed to be that this beautiful young girl, the daughter of some mafia guy, not a local boy but an old Sicilian with a mustache, takes over after his untimely death and gets very rich. To the real thing, someone like Paul Cambria, it had to be pretty strange. Those guys didn't even tell their wives what the hell they did for a living. It was also odd that Cambria would sit in the dark with a thousand people for two hours. Maybe he thought his guys needed to know that he wasn't going to pull in his horns just because there was somebody looking for him. Anyway, it was a one-shot deal. They were having an opening in Gary only because the writer or director or somebody was from here, and because some of it had been filmed in town. One day there were a couple of trucks here, some guys with lights they turned on in the daytime and a lot of confusion, because this was roughly the place where Punch Mail had been blown away in the thirties but that was about it. There hadn't been any movie stars within a thousand miles of here. The real opening was going to be in Hollywood tomorrow, and that was where you would see the stars. Not just these schmucks in corduroy coats with patches on the elbows and big thick glasses. Lempert judged that his chances might be good tonight. If Cambria was in the theater, his guys would be there too. They would be all around, stuck to him like shit to a blanket. The butcher's boy would know that, too. Still, he might just be crazy enough to want to go inside anyway and cut Cambria's throat while they were all sitting around with their thumbs up their asses, but you couldn't bet your future on how crazy somebody was. You had to assume that he knew what he was doing. He would get Cambria afterward. All Lempert had to do was sit in the warm van on the swivel chair and wait and watch for the muzzle flash. It was like a duck hunt. When he had parked the van here this afternoon, he had taken the precaution of writing himself a ticket and sticking it under the wiper so that nobody else would decide to do it. He had thought this through very carefully, and he was ready. 
He had a Ruger Mini-14 next to him, all sighted in on the front of the theater with a four-power night scope. It would take about half a second to put his shoulder to it, pop the window, and draw a bead on the bastard as soon as he saw him. A beginner wouldn't have thought of the Ruger. The barrel was short enough to swing around in a van without banging it on something. Lempert was a good target shooter. He knew that if he could just get a clear view for the first shot, so the target would stay put, he could punch four or five holes in him within two seconds after that. When the ushers, in their brand-new old-fashioned bellboy suits, came out and shut the doors, Lempert studied what was left outside. There were eight uniformed patrolmen that he could see, picking up a little overtime pretending to control the crowds that were already inside the building watching the movie. He looked through the scope at each of their faces in turn. There was Jimmy Clinton and his partner Bucklin, looking like the Pillsbury Doughboy with all the fat he had put on in the last few months. And, oh shit, only in winks. They were the ones to watch for. They had managed to wangle this assignment, of course. It was probably easier than just signing in and cooping in their car in the cul-de-sac off Breckenridge. He didn't like seeing veterans out here. One or two of them might be calm enough to realize what was happening in time to put a round or two into the van. The other four he didn't know. All of them were young, and one was a woman, so at least it wasn't the butcher's boy in a uniform. He was certainly capable of thinking of that one. Lempert turned in his swivel chair to study the upper windows on the street again. If you assumed the bastard wasn't out-and-out out berserk, you had to imagine that he might find his way into one of those buildings with a rifle. Lempert saw no changes from the last time he had looked. There were no glows from dim lights on the ceilings, no shades raised a little, no objects visible. He ducked his head, made his way on his knees to the front of the van, and peeked out the windshield. There was nothing up the street that could be construed as a problem. The traffic was moving at the usual rate. He crawled to the back window and moved the curtain half an inch. There were no new vehicles parked along the street, no knots of people the butcher's boy could join to get a closer look at the place. There was one more thing that Lempert had to check. He opened the back door of the van, swung his legs to the street, and quietly closed the door. There wasn't any point in locking it, with eight uniforms loitering around across the street, and unlocking it made noise, so he left it. He walked away from the theater and turned the corner on fourth before venturing to look over his shoulder. His colleagues were standing around now talking to each other instead of watching the place. Probably not one of them had any idea that Paul Cambrio was even here. He wondered if that would have made a difference. Probably not. You had to know the rest of it before it meant anything. Lempert turned again at the alley behind Chautauqua Avenue, put his head down, pulled his collar up and jammed his right hand into his jacket pocket so that he could grasp his service revolver before he took the first step down the alley. If the butcher's boy was in one of the buildings, he would have a car waiting in back of it, or, at most, one street over. Whatever happened with Paul Cambria, he would need to have a reliable, invisible way of getting in and then getting out. The one thing Lempert remembered about his experience with the bastard ten years ago was that he thought things through he would probably have a couple of ways out. Lempert made his way up the alley, trying to look like a shlemiel who was watching the ground to keep from stepping into a puddle. But every few yards he scanned the old brick buildings, fire escapes, and the dumpsters looking for a change. He wasn't afraid he would miss a parked car, but he might miss something else. A broken window or a garbage can moved a couple of feet so it could be used to climb in through a vent. It wasn't that he had any intention of going into an empty building after him. Not this one. But if he just knew where the bastard was, he was pretty sure he had him. All he had to do was wait. The waiting reminded him that it was time to take a leak. He looked up and down the alley, then stepped into the shadows behind the shoe store and urinated against the wall. It was a delicious feeling because of the danger and the darkness. Lempert continued up the alley another block before turning on to Sixth and crossing the street to the other side. The cops standing out on the sidewalk would be cutting the amenities short about now and getting into their squad cars to rest their feet, which meant they would have nothing to do for about two hours but stare up the street and watch the lights change. He made it across while they were still gathered in a gaggle in front of the theater, then made a circuit of Atlantic Avenue behind the theater and back to Fourth. 
If tonight was the night the bastard was going after Cambria, then he hadn't done anything much to get ready. Lempert made his way back to the van on Chautauqua, still walking along with his head down and his collar turned up. As soon as he had passed the last parked car, he stepped into the gutter and followed it to the rear of the van. He had swung the door open and was all the way inside when he felt it. He had stopped moving, but just to be sure, the son of a bitch slid it up his back and let the cold muzzle touch the nape of his neck. It was the kind of thing any of them would do because Puccio had taught them to be sadists. He was angry, but he supposed he would have to go through the whole idiotic cross-examination before he reminded this one that Puccio had called him and that he was doing no more than what Puccio wanted everyone to do. "'What do you want?' said Lempert. "'I want you.' "'Holy shit! It wasn't them. It was him!' Lempert started to shiver. He was on his hands and knees, and his damned elbows wouldn't stop shaking and giving out on him. What if the bastard thought all this twitching was some kind of a lame attempt to struggle? Suddenly he was overcome by a clear vision of his stupidity, and it brought a sort of repentance. What the hell could he have been thinking, coming out here to try and ambush a man like this? The money wasn't even real anymore. I think you remember me. Lempert started thinking about a move a burglary suspect had tried on him once. He had told him to lie face down and kiss the pavement. But when the guy got on his hands and knees, he sprang forward like a damned gazelle, so all Lempert could do was trip the guy and then put the boots to him. The butcher's boy could open fire and blast his spine. Then, as if he were a damned mind-reader, the voice said, Don't do anything. I'm going to take the gun because I want to talk. As the invisible hand reached into his jacket pocket and took the service revolver, Lempert felt a secret joy. But then the hand went directly to his right ankle and took the other one, too. The thirty-two. What do you want to talk about? First I want you to crawl up to the driver's seat and pull out of here. Why should I? Because I won't need to kill you if you do. The answer mesmerized Lempert. Need to? But of course he would say anything to get Lempert to drive out of here. If he burned Lempert here, he wasn't going to be able to walk away whistling. Eight cops, even those eight cops, were not going to let him do that. But need to? It gave him a tiny bit of hope that he might get out of this. If the butcher's boy didn't want to kill him, maybe he still had a chance. And even if Lempert somehow reversed things and managed to kill the bastard instead of having the bastard kill him, what was he going to say to the eight cops himself? What was the dead suspect doing in the van? He crawled to the seat, pulled himself up, started the engine, and tried to look in the mirror to back up. Turn the lights on, said the butcher's boy. Oh, yeah, said Lempert. He could barely get his hand to stop shaking so that he could turn the switch. Oh, God! He really had forgotten them, and now the bastard thought he was playing some trick. As he started to turn out onto the street, the butcher's boy said, "'Go straight while we talk.' Lampert obeyed, and he decided the bastard had made a mistake. There was something about driving, the thing he had spent eight hours a day doing for more than twenty years, that revived him. He was in control of all this power, so he couldn't be powerless. "'So why didn't you kill Paul Cambria?' "'I don't have anything against Paul Cambria. I came to see you.' Lempert's bravado disappeared. He had to talk to him, to say something that wasn't in the groove of the bastard's logic. How do you even remember me? Things come back to me. I figured you'd be hanging around Cambria, so I found him. You're still a cop, right? Yeah. Oh, sweet Jesus. What could this be about? The bastard didn't say another word for three blocks. Then he got it. Carlo Balacantano. Ten years ago. The bastard had some wacko idea that because Lempert was a cop, he could get to Carl Bala in a federal prison. What happens when he finds out Lempert can't? Finally, I want you to get something for me. I'll pay you. It was coming. Maybe he could convince the bastard with some bullshit story. If you come to the prison with me, all I have to do is flash my badge and they'll let us in armed. Bang. 
What do you want? Pull over up here. Lempert looked around as he slowed down. He made a guess. This man wouldn't shoot him in front of a copying store that was still open, and next door to a bar that had barely begun its prime hours, and across the street from a pizza place. He stopped the van by the curb, but didn't turn off the engine until the man said, Come on. We're going in there. The bar? He must mean the bar. Lempert turned off the engine. Drop the keys on the floor and come out after me. He dropped the keys on the floor, then waited until the bastard got out. He looked for an opportunity, but there was none. Then they were both on the street, and he could see the bastard in the light. He hadn't changed much. It was almost eerie. He was six feet away and had the service revolver in his hand, and his hand in his coat, and Lempert had no doubt that if he moved wrong or tripped on something and stumbled, he would have a hole in him before he hit the ground. They walked into the copying store. There were typewriters and computers for rent, and lots of envelopes and colored paper for sale, and about a dozen Xerox machines in two rows. When Lempert saw the kid behind the counter, with his long, greasy ponytail and dark, bushy eyebrows that showed over the tops of his dark glasses, he decided there was a god. He remembered pulling this kid out of a 280Z after following him for ten blocks. It was the end of the month, and Lempert needed to write a few more tickets. So he had decided that this kid was going too fast. The kid had smirked at him, so he had whirled him around, slammed him against the car, and frisked him then put the cuffs on him and made him lie on the ground while he searched the car for drugs. If only he had found some or planted some. Then this kid wouldn't be the one to lean on the counter and smirk at him while he got his brains blown out. "'Here's what I want,' said the butcher's boy. "'I want a copy of whatever the FBI is sending out to the police computers about me.' "'The NCIC file? How am I supposed to do that?' Maybe somebody will fax it here from the station, or Washington, or whatever. Maybe you can get one of these computers onto a phone line and call it up. Anyway, do it. Give me a minute to think. If you do it, I'll pay you. If there's some trick or something, I... And then he paused for what seemed like a long time. Won't. Lempert went to the kid at the counter. I want to use a phone. The kid recognized him. He hesitated, and Lempert had the impression that he was scared. But it gave him no pleasure. Here's the phone. Lempert only briefly considered saying something on the phone that made no sense. Who could say what this man knew? He dialed the squad room and heard McNulty's voice say, Police Department, Metro Division. Of course, it had to be McNulty working tonight, somebody who not only didn't like Lempert, but was also so stupid that his partners wouldn't ride in a car with him, unless they had personally checked the shotgun to be sure there wasn't a shell in the chamber when he stuck it in the rack. "'It's me, McNulty. Lempert,' he said. "'I need a favor.' "'Don't we all?' said McNulty. Lempert thought for a moment. What was in his desk? Nothing that would get him into this much trouble. "'I want you to look in the lower left-hand drawer of my desk and fax the stuff in the file folder on top to me.' So where are you, Paris? This is serious. Where are you at? Lempert turned to the kid, who was pretending to be dusting a shelf with a cloth. Give me the fax number here. As the sheets rolled out of the machine, the butcher's boy barely looked at them. He just took them out of the tray, glanced at them, folded them with one hand, and stuffed them into his coat pocket. Most of the time he watched Lempert. What kept driving Lempert crazy was that the kid at the counter knew him. He was watching the proceedings out of the corner of his eye, and unless he was retarded, all this must have struck him as strange. He could probably see the lump in the butcher boy's coat where he held Lempert's service revolver, but he also knew that Lempert was a cop, and naturally would assume that the butcher's boy was a cop too, and since cops carry guns, there was nothing strange going on at all. Anybody else would slip out the back door and dial 911. Even this kid would, if it was anybody else but Lempert. Now the bastard was probably going to kill them both, walk out of here and drive away in the van. The keys were on the floor. Finally the machine stopped grinding out pages. The butcher's boy said, that's good enough. How do you usually get your money? 
Lempert knew he didn't mean his police pay. A post office box. Write it down and give it to me. Lempert couldn't believe it. You're really going to pay me? As the butcher's boy looked at him, Lempert could tell that he was being evaluated and that somehow the assessment wasn't good. I said it. Lempert smirked. Yeah, I heard you. People lie to you a lot. About money? Just about everybody. The butcher's boy looked at him with a mixture of pity and distaste. Then it's your fault. You should have killed the first one. The man was absolutely serious. He had killed the first one. Lempert could tell. And it had a strange effect on him. For a few minutes he had been gaining strength. He had begun to look at the hand that gripped his revolver and feel a certainty that his hand was bigger and more powerful. And just a minute ago he had begun to wonder if maybe it wasn't faster, too. He had begun to visualize how he would grab it while it was still in the pocket and break it at the elbow, and his blood had started to warm in preparation for the moment. But now the other feeling had returned, the one he had felt when he had first met this man years ago. Not this time. Not this man. He simply was not somebody you could do that to and have any real expectation of succeeding, because you couldn't surprise him. A dozen people must have already tried whatever he had just thought of, and all of them were dead. Lempert wrote the post office box number on a piece of paper that was meant to refill the fax machine and watched the free hand pick it up and put it in the pocket with the other sheets. But then Lempert was distracted. The back door of the copying store, the one that opened onto the parking lot of the plaza, sent a glint of light in his direction. It had moved, and the reflection of the overhead fluorescence had flashed, too. As he watched, he could see the reflection swinging a little, back and forth. Somebody he couldn't see had touched it. A sick feeling came over him. It was somebody testing to see if the back door was locked. Apparently the butcher's boy hadn't seen it. He said, You'll get some money in the mail in a couple of weeks. Let's go. He tossed a twenty-dollar bill on the counter where the kid could see it and moved toward the front door. Then he stopped. Coming? Lempert was sweating again. Whatever happened next, he was going to be in the middle of it, standing here without a weapon or a place to hide. If it was cops, he could give a yell and dive to the floor, and they would know enough to fire. He hoped it was cops. But how the hell could it be? It must be either the wind or Puccio's men. God, he hoped it was Puccio's men. Even if they were the ones who actually got him, Lempert would share in the credit. It was only fair. As Albert Salconi stood outside the back door, he saw Ficio across the door from him, reach out his hand. Salconi gasped, then realized there was no way to keep Ficio from touching the door. He pressed himself against the back wall of the building, blew the air out of his lungs, and waited. As he watched the door swing back and forth a little, he forced the hatred he felt for Ficio to drain out of his mind. Ficio was a kid by today's standards. In Salconi's day, by the time you were nineteen, either you were in some jungle wearing camouflage fatigues or you were in jail. Now a kid that was nineteen might not have been in a real fight in his life. Salconi turned to Ficio and shook his head disapprovingly. Maybe Ficio understood. At least he looked crestfallen. Salconi hoped he was devastated. But there was no way to explain to him now why he should be. Either the door was unlocked, in which case it would offer no resistance when they moved in, or it was locked. If it was locked, then when one of them tried to get in for real, it wouldn't budge and he would have to fire through it. Either way, there was nothing lost. The one thing you didn't want to do was test it and let the occupants know you were coming. Salconi had been planning to have Ficio go in through the back door alone while he waited in the street at the front of the store. But that wasn't going to happen now. So much for all the cunning that had gotten them this far. Puccio's and his own. Puccio had come up to him in the theater and told him to find out what he could about the van that had been parked in the street across from the building. He had said there was something peculiar about it, and Salconi had known Puccio long enough to forget about asking questions and get out there. When he had sneaked to the rear corner of the van a while ago, 
He had peered inside and seen something every bit as peculiar as Puccio had suspected, but not as ominous. It was Bob Lempert, sitting in a swivel chair like the ones bass fishermen installed in their boats so that their butts wouldn't get sore. He had gone back inside and told Puccio that it was only Lempert, but Puccio had not been reassured. He had been puzzled. He had said in Italian, He can't be doing that for the police department. The only reason he might is if he was pretty sure the butcher's boy was coming to get Paul. I told him to keep his eyes open like everybody else, but he's too lazy to sit out there all night without getting paid. He thought about it for a moment. You know, he's just stupid enough to have seen something in the police reports and kept it to himself so he could collect on the contract. Do me a favor. Go out and find a place to keep an eye on him where he can't see you. And take Ficio with you. Salconi had responded to that with a raised eyebrow, and Puccio had read it instantly. I know, but you might need somebody to come in and get me, and he won't attract attention. Then they could hear the movie starting, and it was time to move. Salconi had led Ficio out the back of the theater and up the alley to Salconi's car. He had thought about the situation for a moment, and then gone around to the trunk and pulled out the two Mac-10s. He had shown the kid how to flip off the safety and put it on automatic, then handed him the gun and told him to keep it on the floor by his feet, where he wouldn't make a mistake and take off the roof of the car with it. Then they had driven around the block and come up the street looking for a vantage point from which they could see whatever it was that Lempert was watching for. But at that moment the van was pulling out of its parking space and moving up the street. Salconi had followed it nearly a mile to this store. It wasn't until the van's doors opened that he had seen that Lempert hadn't been alone in the van. The truth was much more startling than anything Puccio had imagined. Lempert had hired himself out to the butcher's boy. He was driving the getaway car. Salconi had forced himself to take a moment to think about what he had seen. It made sense for the butcher's boy to hire Lempert. Lempert knew enough about Paul Cambria to know where he would be tonight, and how to get close enough for a shot, and probably how to get past the police afterward. Salconi didn't have time to send the Ficio kid back in the car to the theater for help, and anyway, that would leave Salconi stranded here if Lempert and the butcher's boy decided to leave. He would have to kill the two of them right here. He had brought Ficio up to the back door of the copying store and told him the plan. What he had neglected to tell the boy was that when Ficio stepped through the back door and opened up with the Mac-10, it didn't much matter what he hit. Salconi would be at the front of the building. By the time Salconi stepped in, either the butcher's boy would be dead, or he would be busy killing Ficio. But then, without warning, Ficio reached out and pushed on the door. If they had seen it, they hadn't opened fire. That meant that either they hadn't seen it, or they were on their way out the front door. Either way, Salconi couldn't afford the luxury of going around to the front. He had to move. All right, kid, said Salconi. Go through the door fast as you can. Stop and open fire. You mean now? Now. To Lempert, everything seemed to happen at once. First he was surprised to see that the butcher's boy hadn't waited and made him go ahead. He pushed the front door open, and then he seemed to disappear for a second. Lempert whirled to look over his shoulder just as the back door swung inward hard so that it banged against the wall. He recognized the two guys. One was Salcone, the guy Puccio always talked to in Italian because they came up together in the same shithole in Pittsburgh that didn't even sound like it was in America. And the other was a kid they called something that sounded like Fish, who wasn't much older than the one who must have ducked behind the counter. They both held little assault weapons that looked sort of like Ingram's, although he had never seen an Ingram from this angle. In fact, from here, the angle looked a little off. Lempert's body jerked, partly in surprise because even the body feels noise somewhere in the diaphragm when two forty-five caliber automatic weapons roar in an enclosed space, and partly because the forty-five caliber bullets were punching through his chest, arms, neck, and head. Wolf crouched beside the door with his back to the bricks and covered his face while the machine guns blew the glass out of the front window beside his head. He knew they would be approaching the front of the building fast to get a shot at him as he sprinted down the street. The first one was the older man, who walked directly to the empty window frame and leaned out to see which way the prey had run. 
Wolf looked up at the underside of his chin and fired the revolver through it. When the man toppled forward, he still held his little Mac-10. As Wolf snatched it out of his grip, he realized he had seen the man somewhere in the old days. He leaned inside the ruined window and opened fire on the second man, who was approximately where anyone would be, squatting low beside the front door that he didn't have the guts to open. Then Wolf dropped the Mac-10 on the body and looked at the face again. He remembered where he had seen the man. He was the one who used to keep the security people busy, while Puccio stole suits off the loading docks of clothing stores in Pittsburgh. In the old days, he'd had more meat on him, and looked like a longshoreman or a trucker. Now he had flecks of gray in his hair and wore photo-gray glasses, sort of distinguished, like a professor. Seeing him here like this was not a pleasure. Little Norman must have failed. As he walked to the van, he kept his pace leisurely. He got into the driver's seat, picked up the keys, started the van, and, as he pulled away from the curb, glanced into the copying store. From this height he could see that the kid at the cash register still was not ready to peek up over the counter. It was hard to blame him. Wolf could feel his heart beating faster than he liked it to. What the hell was wrong with these people? They must have seen Lempert and followed the van, and then the older one had seen Wolf. Coming through the back door together like that was the tactic of losers. It was the way addicts robbed grocery stores. Then somebody had panicked or made a mistake and opened up on Lempert. Or was it even a mistake? It was as if the whole world had lost all sense of the way things were done and the way men behaved, so you couldn't even figure out what they thought they were trying to accomplish. The words, the slaughter of the innocents, came into Wolf's mind. That had been Eddie's term for it. Presumably it was something that had happened in the Bible, but he had never looked it up. He remembered Eddie arguing with a man who was trying to collect on the same contract. It was one of the few times Eddie had ever let the boy work with colleagues, because he considered them to be competitors by nature, and acquaintances only through some regrettable coincidence of geography. But this time Eddie and the boy had found a major prize. A man named Frank Bassett had run a small-time burglary ring based on restaurant reservations. He had placed Confederates as waiters and busboys in the best establishments, and each night they would go over the lists to see who would be at the restaurants, leaving their houses empty. If it were particularly tempting, Bassett would hit the house. If a woman came in wearing diamonds, for instance, they would know that her house was worth the trouble. Eddie had sniffed as soon as he heard this. Well, for Christ's sake, if she's wearing them, they're not going to be in the house, are they? But that had not been the only flaw. Wolf couldn't remember the details, except that there had been a child and a babysitter in one house, and that the owner had been a lawyer with friends who had connections. Eddie had heard about the large, open contract at a time when he had been feeling vulnerable. Eddie had found Bassett in a small town north of Syracuse, along Lake Ontario. It was winter, and most of the cottages near the lake were closed. Apparently there had been some plan in Bassett's mind to go to Canada, because Wolf remembered a big boat, frozen in the ice along the shore, where it had been tied up. But when Eddie and the boys surveyed the house, Eddie had a nasty surprise. He discovered that he and the boy were not the only ones who had found Bassett. A man named Cathead Maloney drove past in a two-tone Pontiac just as Eddie was peering at the target through binoculars. Eddie had dragged the boy to his car and followed. Eddie had been so angry when he caught up with the Pontiac on the lake road that he had rushed to its side and flung open the door. Then he calmed down rapidly. Cathead Maloney had three other men with him. Eddie had proposed that they share the danger and rewards, and Cathead had agreed in theory to the proposal. Their arguments had come over the execution. Cathead had decided that the way to get Bassett was to wait until dark and approach the house from the lakeside, walking on the ice to surprise him. Eddie pointed out that if a light went on, there would be six of them standing in the middle of a featureless white backdrop that stretched behind them at least forty miles, too empty to hide on, too slippery to run on, and probably too thin to hold their weight, since Lake Ontario was too deep to freeze with any solidity. Cat had responded that if the ice was thick enough to strand a twenty-five-foot boat with a car engine in it, then it would hold five men and a boy, and implied that anyone who passed up six-to-one odds against a mere sneak thief 
with the advantages of darkness and surprise, didn't really want to work very much. Eddie held his temper, although the last part had nettled him. He counted that Frank Bassett never worked alone. He'd had three men in the restaurants and four working the houses, and if he were alone now, he wouldn't need a twenty-five-foot boat in the first place. From this point the discussion deteriorated until finally Eddie uttered his benediction. I give up. It's all yours, Cathead. Have a ball. It's going to be the slaughter of the innocents. Eddie had been right. There had been at least six very tense, alert, heavily armed men in the cottage, and Cathead Maloney and his partners had received the full benefit of their ability to find a light switch in the dark and aim a rifle afterward. Wolf drove along Route 90, across the state line into Chicago, then pulled off the interstate. He went past a gas station and noticed a set of three payphones near the men's room. He glanced at his watch, then patiently wheeled around the block and pulled in beside them. He walked into the office, asked the tired young man sitting on the high stool for the key to the men's room, and opened the other roll of quarters he had bought in Las Vegas. It was 4.30 in the afternoon in Las Vegas, and unless things had changed for no reason in two days, little Norman would be in the sands having breakfast. The efficient machine voice told him to put in more money, and he did. He asked the hotel operator to page Norman. Seventy-five cents later, he heard the voice. Yeah? Norman? I thought I wasn't going to hear your voice again. I ran into trouble. Did you do what I asked? You know what that is, kid. It takes time. I started. How does it look? How can it look? Carl Bala lives to eat your eyeballs. The Castiglione's know that if they forget that you did the old man ten years ago, they lose respect. The New York families aren't sure they can pretend that Tony T. wasn't right in their backyard when you came to see him. Are you giving up? No, but it's a fantasy. The old men aren't like that. You chose this life. You knew what it was. Norman? What? Tonight some people came for me. I'm going to assume that the man they worked for didn't get the message yet. It's a gesture of good faith. Oh, shit, kid. They don't care about your good faith. Just run. I'm running, Norman. Tell them. Right. Just remember I don't work for you. I work for them. Wolf hung up the phone and walked back to the van. It was time to get out of the area. The simplest thing to do was to try to drive another twenty miles to O'Hare Airport and find a room in a small motel in the neighborhood where there were miles of them. It was already beginning to feel like a long night. At the cashier's counter in the Sands coffee shop, little Norman was preoccupied. He paused for a moment before placing the telephone back on its cradle. He was watching the liquid crystal display on the little screen that stuck up over the back of the telephone. It still held the number. 312-555-8521 Illinois Chicago area 15. Wolf awoke in the big, hard bed and stared in the direction of the window. He wondered what had awakened him. The thick, opaque curtains were still drawn over the glass, so the room was dark. But at the side there was the tiny, muted glow of a ray of light bouncing off the white lining of the curtain and onto the wall. It was daytime. He reached to the bedside table and held his watch close to his eyes. It was only 7.30 a.m., it couldn't be a maid who hadn't seen the Do Not Disturb sign. He listened, then swallowed to clear his ears and listened again. There was no sound at all. It was almost eerie. He resigned himself to the fact that he wasn't going to sleep again. He threw off the heavy covers and felt a kind of relief at the sound of the starched sheets sliding over one another. At least he wasn't deaf. He walked across the thick carpet to the window pushed his index finger to the edge of the curtain and squinted to see what Rosemont, Illinois, looked like in the daytime. He started to breathe deeply in order to wake up and stop the shock before it made him slow and stupid. 
He stepped to the other side of the window and slowly moved the curtain a quarter of an inch. But when he looked out at the parking lot from the new angle, it was still the same. There were no cars in the lot. Last night there had been at least twenty, all in a row outside his window. Now all he could see was black macadam, with the spaces marked in faded white paint. Somehow they had come in and evacuated everybody from the little motel without waking him, and now they were getting ready to move in. Wolf dressed quickly and threw everything he had brought with him into the little suitcase. It must be the FBI. They had come in with pass keys or even called every room on the telephone to tell them to get out quietly, and in a minute they would be coming through the only door with shotguns. There would be something like a SWAT team watching the only window. He had been lucky they hadn't seen the curtain move, or there would be holes in it already. He looked around him. There was the closet door, but there was also a sliding door on the side wall. It had to be a door to the next room, put there in case somebody wanted to turn both of them into a suite. He put his ear to it and listened. There was no sound of movement in the next room. If they were planning to come in that way, they would have it unlocked. He exerted a soft pressure on the door to see if it would budge, but it didn't. Wolf concentrated on dismantling the standing lamp. He cut the plug and jerked the cord through the long steel pole, pocketed it, and unscrewed the bulb and receptacle. Then he forced the motel's bottle opener between the door and the jam. Now he fitted the hollow steel pipe over the opener to extend the handle by six feet. When he pried with the long lever, the door lock gave a little groan, then popped. He slid the door open and saw an identical door on the opposite wall. Closing the one he had just come through, he headed for it. Inside the third room, he decided it was time to try another way. He picked up a chair, tied the lamp cord around the back of it, and carried it into the bathroom. Setting it in the center of the floor, he stood on it, then reached up to push the plywood hatch off the access hole to the attic. After shoving his little suitcase into the crawl space, he reached up, grasped both sides of the cubby hole, and pulled himself up. Inside the crawl space it was dark and dusty, and the sloping roof was only a yard above the floor of bare two-by-fours with layers of insulation between them. Here and there were wires for the light fixtures below. As soon as he had turned around on his hands and knees to face the hole again, he pulled the chair up with the lamp cord, set it aside, and put the cover back on the access hole. Wolf crawled carefully from one two-by-four to the next, at each advance setting a suitcase down ahead of him, quietly making his way down the long empty space. He could see the small louvered vent at the end of the building, and he used it as a goal. In the hallway, Cabell whispered to Soda, Remember, anything that's alive in there is no friend of yours. Soda grinned at the door and clicked the slide on his new Mac-10. Lock and load, he whispered. Soda's dumb cheerfulness was beginning to wear on Cabell. The fact that the last time he'd had a weapon in his hand, he had fired point-blank into a pane of bulletproof glass at a man selling lottery tickets, didn't inspire confidence. Cabell and Soda were thieves. The difference was that Cabell knew it, and had been nervous about going along on something like this to begin with. But Soda seemed to think he was a badass. Puccio had decided it was some kind of weird mafia justice that somebody should shoot this guy with the gun that Salcone had carried when he got killed. To Cabell it was just asking for trouble, so he had given the gun to Soda, who hadn't figured out that if you found blood on a gun, it wasn't from the guy it was fired at. Puccio was calling in lots of markers today. Landsberg was only another thief like Cabell, but he had his own crew working out of a travel agency Puccio owned. Once in a while, when a whole family sailed for Fiji or some place, Landsberg's crew would come in with a moving van and take out everything but the plumbing. Everybody owed Paul Cambria the right to work in town, but Puccio was the guy who kept track. There were at least ten or fifteen guys around the motel right now, all of them called in the middle of the night. Cabell kicked in the door, and when he brought his foot back to the floor, he let his momentum carry him to his right and into the room as Soda slipped in low into the left. For a second, Soda's mind didn't allow the possibility that the room was empty. He fired a short burst into the couch, which seemed to be the only thing that wasn't where it was supposed to be. Then he rushed into the bathroom, where there was nothing to point his weapon at but a couple of wet towels draped over the shower curtain. Cabell said, You didn't happen to slip out for a smoke while you were supposed to be watching the hall? No way, Soda protested. But Cabell hadn't said it seriously. He was already checking to see if the window had been opened. 
He did it cautiously, without moving the curtain, so that Landsberg wouldn't get a glimpse of him from outside and put a hole in him. He looked around the room and then saw it. You said there wasn't but one door. He walked to the sliding door that led to the next room and studied it. There was a deep indentation beside the lock, and the wood around it had been compressed and cracked. He silently pointed to it, stepped to the side, and abruptly slid it open to allow Soda a clear shot. But Soda just stood and stared. Cabell cautiously craned his neck to peer into the next room. It was identical to this one, and he could already see that some damage had been done to the lock on the sliding door that connected it to the third. He turned to Soda. You go out in the hall. When I flush him, that's the way he'll go. At the end of the attic, Wolf lifted the plywood square just enough to fit the muzzle of Little Norman's pistol. The roar of the automatic weapon a minute ago was a sure sign that somebody down there was getting jumpy. It also seemed like a reliable indication that the people down there were not from the FBI. As he looked down through the crack, he saw something he had not expected. There were a man and a woman, both about fifty, lying on the floor in the motel office. They were both on their backs, so he could recognize them as the owners. But they'd both had their throats cut. He could see that the counter drawers and cash register had been rifled. Wolf lifted the hatch a few more inches. It was stupid. All they'd had to do was flash a badge they could have bought in any toy store and tell everybody there was a gas leak. For a moment he considered staying in the attic and waiting for his pursuers to leave. But something about the scene below made it seem foolish. They weren't going to leave. He ran a mental inventory of the contents of his small suitcase and decided there was nothing in it that would tell anyone anything about him, so he left it in the attic, then lowered himself to the top of a filing cabinet, went to the counter, and began to look in the drawers. There was no sign that the couple lived here, so there had to be a car. Finally, he found the woman's purse, a large bag made out of something that looked like carpet with wooden handles. Her keychain had a little flashlight and a whistle on it. It was sad that she would have imagined that those things would keep somebody from hurting her. He moved toward the back door of the office. The car had to be in the back because the lot was empty. There were only a couple of things in his favor now. One was that the only men he knew about for sure were still somewhere behind him firing automatic weapons into empty rooms, so nobody would expect him to emerge from the office. Another was that there couldn't be many people still around who knew him by sight after all these years. He glanced back at the two bodies already half-drained of blood. Of course, those people outside didn't seem much worried about killing the odd bystander. If any one of them had a functioning brain, at least some soldiers would be positioned around the motel, waiting for him to break cover. He had to get them to show themselves. He searched the other counter cabinets. What he was looking for wasn't hard to find. It was a big cardboard carton full of boxes of matchbooks printed with an idealized drawing of the motel, with imaginary trees around it and the words, Hanover House Motel. He had seen the matches in all the ashtrays in his room, and the supply had to come from somewhere. He opened a box and took a couple of books out of it, then tossed half the boxes up the access hatch to the attic and poured the rest against the wall of the office that joined it to the rest of the motel. He lit the pile of boxes in the attic first, then climbed down and waited a minute until he heard a crackling noise that told him the old, dry two-by-fours were beginning to burn. Now he tossed a burning match on the pile of boxes against the wall. After a few seconds, the first matchbooks ignited with a bright, sputtering, sulfurous flare. Then the whole pile seemed to go up at once in a big flame, like the afterburner on a jet, licking up the wall, peeling the paint off it, and covering the upper parts with a poisonous black smoke. He backed away, keeping himself within arm's reach of the door because he wasn't sure just how fast this place was going to burn. Cabell was preparing to kick in the door of the fifth room when a familiar sound reached his ears from a distance. It sounded like an electric smoke detector. At first he felt the special sort of anger that he reserved for people like Soda. It would be right out of Soda's repertoire to toss a burning cigarette somewhere just because there was nobody to make him pay for the damage to the carpet— and therefore no reason not to. Right now he hoped Soda was listening to the reason not to, but then a second thought occurred to him. What if the ten or twelve impatient geniuses stationed around the place had heard the gunfire a while ago, and then expected Soda and Cabell to come out? 
They hadn't, so those guys might have assumed that it meant they couldn't, that what they had heard was the sound of the butcher's boy shooting him in soda. He thought about the ones he had known before this excursion. Some of them were thieves like him, a couple had something to do with the gambling business, and three were apparently pimps. The only ones he was sure had any experience at all with this sort of thing were Puccio's own men, and where the hell they were right now was anybody's guess. The others would react to the sound of an automatic weapon the way he would, with a resolution not to enter the building hastily. But whose idea was it to burn the guy out? Well, if that was the plan, it was time he got with the program. He went to the door of the room, opened it, and peered into the hallway. Soto whirled and aimed the little submachine gun in his direction, but he didn't fire. Jesus, said Soda, you scared me. It's about time, said Cabell. Let's get out of here. As he glanced down the hallway to look for the most likely exit, he saw two things he didn't like. One was that black smoke started to pour out of the crack under the door of one of the rooms down the hall. It wasn't seeping out. It looked as though it were being blown out with a fan. The second thing he saw didn't look as ominous at first. On the ceiling of the hallway, thirty feet from Cabell's head, a little red disc popped and fell to the carpet. Then the little brass pinwheel it had held in place started to spin. It gave a hissing, gurgling noise, and then began to spew a thick spray of muddy, rust-colored water onto the carpet. A second later, the next spigot did the same. Cabell started to run, but it was too late. All along the pipeline, the spigots of the sprinkler system popped and vomited red-brown icy water down on the hallway. The first eruption was so cold that Cabell's heart stopped and he gasped. But in an instant, he and Soda were drenched. As he sloshed toward the exit, he could taste the metallic, gritty stuff, and he kept waiting for the pipe to clear itself and maybe blow the sediment off his head and out of his eyes. But he made the exit without knowing if it ever got any clearer. As they dashed out of the main entrance and slopped onto the pavement, Cabell could see two or three other men moving away. He looked to see if any of them were running, but they all moved with the same chagrined strides that he was taking. The son of a bitch they were supposed to kill must be long gone. If he had still been here, they would have heard him laughing. Wolf finished ripping the woman's dress off her bloody, lifeless body. He slipped the wet rag over his clothes and cinched it together with her dead companion's belt, rolled up his pant legs up over his knees, then pulled a little tablecloth that had Chicago embroidered on it off the counter, folded it, threw it over his head, and tied it under his chin like a scarf. The torn, blood-stained dress covered his clothes, and if nobody got too close, he might make it the five yards to the car. The only one out there who would be positive the woman couldn't be dragging herself out of the burning building to drive herself to the emergency room was the one who had brought the knife across her throat. If any of the others were still around the motel, with all the noise and smoke attracting police and firemen and gawkers, they weren't likely to open up on anything wearing a bloody dress. He just had to hope the one with the knife was gone. As he slipped the bolt on the back door of the office, he had a brief attack of irrational reluctance. There was something horrible about the possibility of dying in this bizarre costume but he reminded himself that he didn't know any way of dying that wasn't horrible, and if they got him, it wouldn't much matter what he looked like. He swung the door open and bent over to cross the open space as quickly as possible. Wolf slipped into the old Ford station wagon, started it, and pulled away from the back of the motel slowly. There was a car parked across the drive, but nobody seemed to be in it, so he pulled around it and bumped across the lawn and onto the highway. When he saw the fire engines coming toward him, he pulled over to let them pass, but after that he felt it was probably safe to get into the left lane and give the car its last hard ride. It was probably only good for about a half-hour drive, and after he abandoned it, the heirs would undoubtedly junk it. "'I love you,' said Elizabeth. "'I know,' said Jimmy. He was cheerful about it, and he seemed to mean it but she wanted him to say, I love you, too. And he didn't seem to think this response was appropriate from somebody who was already four and on his way out the door to catch his ride. Be good. Okay, he said, then stepped out the door and ran down the steps toward the van. She watched him climb up the big step and pivot to sit down hard on the bench seat in the back. They grew up so fast. No, it wasn't growing up. 
It was growing away, becoming a separate person. Elizabeth spotted Amanda crawling across the floor toward the pole lamp. As she approached it, she was like a soldier in a movie scrambling up the last few yards of a beach under fire. Her little legs pumped so fast that her knees slipped out from under her, and she made a premature grab for the pole. Elizabeth closed the front door and got there in time to hold the lamp upright as Amanda lifted her body, hand over hand, up to a standing position. She looked pleased and proud as she stared up at the bulb, her little face containing a hint of the explorer planting a flag on a peak, as well as a hint of the escaped felon. She had made it in time to keep her mother from stopping her. "'Up, up, up, so tall,' said Elizabeth helplessly. It was a simple manner to hold the pole firmly while Amanda bent her knees and bobbed up and down in an attempt to dislodge it and topple it over. "'Careful, baby girl. That's not a good game.' Elizabeth acknowledged that she should have stored it in the garage with the glass coffee table months ago. Maybe tonight, when she had gotten into her jeans and sweatshirt, she could face that corner of the garage. Jim used to do that sort of thing. A lot of the stuff in there was just where he had put it a year ago, and it would probably stay there forever. She wasn't very good at getting rid of things. Elizabeth heard Maria open the door behind her and then hang her purse on the doorknob. Hello, Maria, she said. Say hello to Maria, Amanda. Say hi, Maria. How's it going? Maria moved into the living room. I'm here, little Amanda, she said. I miss you so much. I wanted to come back just as soon as the sun came up. I said, where is my little Amanda? I better get dressed quick and run to the car. This was to tell Elizabeth that she knew she was late and that nothing was wrong. Now we better say bye-bye to Mama. This was to tell Elizabeth that she was dismissed. Maria snatched up Amanda and carried her to the door for the ceremony. Elizabeth kissed the baby's incredibly smooth little cheek, and Amanda's fat little chin started to quiver, her eyes filled with tears, and she began to cry the lament of the forsaken. Elizabeth said, I'll be back before you know it. I love you and the tiny, uncomprehending victim held her arms out in a final plea as her mother slipped out the door. For some stupid reason, this morning she could feel tears forming in her own eyes as she hurried down the steps toward the garage. She knew that the stupid reason was that her period was going to start, and that a lot of unnecessary hormones were coursing through her and making her feel weepy. But at the same time, she also didn't know it, because even though it always happened— and had since she was thirteen, each time it was as though such a reaction had never occurred before. Because what she was feeling was as real as any other feeling at any other time, and maybe it was, after all, the true reaction. Maybe the difference was that at other times she had the strength to keep herself from seeing things clearly. As she started the car, she thought again that it was probably going to begin giving her trouble unless she found time to get it into the shop for maintenance this week. Maybe Thursday, so it would be okay again by Friday, and they wouldn't have any excuse to keep it over the weekend. This morning, everything seemed to be overdue and about to fall apart. As Elizabeth drove into the city, she made a point of looking at the trees. She had read in a doctor's column in a magazine that looking at trees was a cure for stress. It had something to do with focusing one's eyes on faraway objects, and something to do with the color of the leaves but the same column had said that a cure for depression was looking at the light in the sky just before the sun came up. She hadn't missed a day at that in one year and two weeks. Elizabeth found herself in the organized crime office earlier than expected. Maybe looking at trees was a cure for slow driving. She sat down at her desk and saw with sadness that someone had taken the time to provide her with an inbox. She didn't want an inbox, so now she would have to spend some time trying to find out who had done such a thoughtful thing, and then try to keep from hurting her feelings. Elizabeth had learned years ago that analysis had to do with taking the flow of information that moved through the bureaucracy and preventing it from moving in its normal way through the old channels. Sometimes she collected tidbits and left them lying around for weeks until they made sense, and sometimes she merely scanned the printouts and knew that there was nothing in them but distractions. If you had an inbox and an outbox, 
you were treating information the way it was meant to be treated, which was the wrong way. The system put you here to process paper, but you had to resist the system in order to make it work. She put her purse in the inbox so that nobody would deliver anything there, and walked to the communication room to look at the night's reports. As she entered, she saw a copy of the NCIC entry lying on the desk. Something had been added to the bottom of it. Information concerning the suspect. Attention E.V. Waring, Department of Justice, Washington, D.C., as agent in charge. Wolf sat by himself in the back of the diner in the Chicago Railroad Station and looked at the pile of folded papers. If they had not been about him, he wouldn't have had any idea what they said. As he had thought, Charles Ackerman had been burned for all time. The paper referred to him as A.K.A. Charles Ackerman, A.K.A. The Butcher's Boy, real name U.N.K. They had tagged him with Tony Tallarese for sure, but said they also wanted him for questioning about Peter Mantino and Angelo Fratelli. So little Norman had been right about the wire on Tallarese. That had brought the FBI in right away. And then somebody there had told them who he was. Still, the physical description part didn't seem to fit this theory. Hair color, eye color, height, weight, all UNK. If somebody had recognized him, what the hell had they used? Smell? What it sounded like was that they had heard about his identity from somebody who didn't know he was telling them. They must have picked it up from the wiretap. If they had put a wire on Tallarese, they would have tapped his phones, too. In one way, it was reassuring. They didn't seem to know anything about him at all, where he was, what he looked like, what he was doing. In about four other ways, it was starting to scare the hell out of him. The reason he was stuck in the United States in the first place was that somehow they had managed to figure out he was using the Charles Ackerman passport, then had shut down an airport 3,000 miles away in time to keep him from using it again. Maybe they had shut down every airport in the country with one phone call. He had no way of knowing how they did things, or whether there was any practical limit to what they could do. In the old days, he hadn't spent much time worrying about the police. He had thought about them only when he was actually doing a job. If he managed to get through it without making too much noise, leaving fingerprints or getting himself hurt, he stopped thinking about them at all. It didn't take much thought to stay out of their way. Once you got out of the water, you could probably stop worrying about getting bitten by a fish. He wanted to stop worrying about the FBI. He thought about going to Mexico. He could certainly get across the border, but what then? He didn't know anybody in Mexico and the Mafia must have lots of people there to keep an eye on its drug interests. It was a fairly obvious place for him to go into hiding, so they would be looking for him with fewer chances of missing him. Even if he could buy a passport there that would get him into England, it wouldn't do him much good. The British customs man would ask him a question in Spanish, and he wouldn't understand it. He could get into Canada with even less strain. A Canadian passport would be perfect— but the setup there had always been worse than in Mexico. The Mafia had established footholds all along the border during Prohibition in order to bring in liquor. Even before that, a lot of the old mustache peats had gotten into the United States by signing up for a wheat harvest in Manitoba or someplace and walking across the invisible line. It was hard to know what the mob controlled there, but one thing they were sure to have a corner on was forged passports. He kept remembering the computer scanner that immigration had used on his passport at Kennedy. He needed a real passport, or he was going to be stopped. And unless he got out of the country soon, there was no question that he was going to die. The way he had survived in the past was by quick retaliation. The hand would move in his direction, and he'd sting it, and it would hesitate long enough to let him disappear. It still worked, too, except for the part about disappearing. It wasn't the Mafia that was keeping him in the fire. It was the damned FBI. But he was overlooking something. Organizations didn't do anything. It was some person in charge, some human intelligence that was working on him. He looked at the sheets of paper again. On the last one was Attention E.V. Waring, Department of Justice, Washington, D.C., as agent in charge. Wolf finished his coffee and walked out into the cavernous train station. The place was not just wide, but vertically immense. 
in a way that buildings constructed now could never be unless they were designed to shield some sport from the weather. The ceiling must have been seventy or eighty feet above him, and they could have held a cattle drive through the waiting area without taking up more than a third of the marble floor. These places had seemed archaic to him when he was a child, remnants of some richer time, when there was more stone and wood and leather in the world, and more time to think about what things looked like. In the old days, these places were always noisy with the echoes of feet, luggage carts, yelling, and amplified announcements. But for some reason, he couldn't remember ever hearing a train. Now the station still echoed, but the sound of his shoes on the marble was all he heard, as he walked to the one ticket window that wasn't boarded up, and bought a ticket to Washington, D.C. Elizabeth looked at the list she had made before falling asleep last night. The way to keep the cost down was to get in touch with the people who already were paid to watch things, and give them something specific to look for. If she was right about what was happening, he was running. That meant small motels, cars fraudulently rented or stolen, bogus identification and credit cards, and paying cash for merchandise anybody else would buy with a check. These were details that gave him a chance to make a mistake. If he did, he might come to the attention of a police department somewhere. All she could do was to send out circulars to introduce the possibility that the next time it could be him. It was essential to keep the butcher's boy from getting out of the country as long as she could. If he had survived for ten years with Carlo Balacantano screaming for his head, then he must have lived someplace where Carlo Balacantano's voice wasn't very loud. She had made a formal request to the State Department to examine new passport applications for male Caucasians, aged thirty to forty-five, with extreme care, checking independently at least two of the statements or supporting documents supplied. It might not turn him up, but it would delay the processing, which might keep him here a little longer. This had brought a strange inquiry from the CIA, but the questions they had asked had been about McCarran, the man who had been found dead with Fratelli in Buffalo. Maybe he was a former agent or something. Whatever their interest was, it couldn't hurt. The main thing was to keep trying. If every policeman in every department asked his informants about the butcher's boy, and every person who watched airports and steamships and provided passports and rented cars kept alert, somebody just might notice him. The most depressing thing about it was that the only way she was going to recognize him was if he did something, and what he would have to do to identify himself was to kill someone else. Elizabeth started to move her eyes down the list again, but now Richardson was standing over her desk. You know what I think is going on? he asked. I think this is a cleansing ritual. What are you talking about? Who was Tony Tallarese? He was about forty-five years old, a capo at the time of his life when he should have been out there scrambling. But what was he doing? He wore fancy clothes, spent lots of money, had a house that Al Capone would have thought was too ostentatious. But the main thing was he was corrupt. He'd been stooping the waitresses in his brother's restaurant, the wives of at least two of his soldiers, and his brother's wife's niece, which in those old-time families is incest. But most of all, he'd been robbing his boss while he was in prison, and he was wearing a wire for the FBI. Think about it. Elizabeth rested her head on her fist. Okay, I'm thinking about it. What conclusion am I supposed to be reaching? Richardson frowned and churned his hand in the air to conjure the next example. Peter Mantino. He was about the same age. He'd been in charge of the Western operations for a while. Was he in Las Vegas robbing the suckers? No. Was he in L.A. cutting into the drug trade? No. Was he in Portland or Seattle trying to organize the ports? No. He lived in Santa Fe like a retired homosexual art dealer. He did nothing to increase his family's stake in the richest, fastest-growing region in the country. He was lazy and corrupt. Elizabeth squinted her eyes and tilted her head to look up at Richardson. It's been a long time since you actually prosecuted a case, hasn't it? I mean in front of a jury. Angelo Fratelli, Richardson stopped for a moment. You're not buying this, are you? Go on, 
Angela Fratelli, she prompted. Corrupt. What I'm getting at is this. We suddenly get three killings, at least two of them done by a very special professional exterminator. Forget everything else we think we know about him. In fact, forget him completely. One correspondence that we seem to have overlooked is that these three people were lousy specimens, and that raises the possibility that their deaths were purchased by reformers. What sort of reformers were you thinking of? Two kinds come to mind. One is the old men at the top, the last generation, who came to power before World War II. They see that the next generation has grown up into a bunch of slobs and they don't like it. They decide, in effect, to replace all of middle management. Okay, said Elizabeth, that's possible. But you said two kinds. The other one is conservatives. Somebody out there who's older than the old men? In a way, an ultra-neoconservative movement. This is something you know about, or are you making it up? A little of each. You've got the generation that's coming up now in their twenties and thirties. All over the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, in this country, you have a big stampede toward the past. Every last one of them is dirt ignorant and more conservative than their great-grandmothers. Why should the Mafia be immune? No reason that I know of. So what would these people be after? Power. They're old enough now to have seen a little action and done some dirty work. When they see the degenerate jerks who are in charge, they become instant reformers. Okay, then what? They get in touch with a hitman. Elizabeth thought about this for a moment. No, I don't think so. That's not the way it works. What do you mean? Reformers have to pull the trigger themselves. If they think the generation that's in power is fat and lazy, they have to prove that they themselves are not by killing them personally. I can see the old Dons hiring some messenger to go out and clean house, but I can't see a revolution by proxy. Richardson paused. No, he said, I guess I can't either. What are the other alternatives? I don't know, said Elizabeth. I can't prove that the lieutenant in Buffalo was wrong. It makes perfect sense that with Carl Bala in jail, somebody might kill his caretakers and take over his holdings. And what you were saying about the three victims makes it seem more likely. If you have a business with terrific potential but inefficient management, you have unfriendly takeovers, right? Okay, let's start with what we know. Tony T. was killed by the butcher's boy. He waltzed in there alone and flew out on the next flight. Is that how you'd do an unfriendly takeover? Elizabeth shrugged. It wouldn't be a bad start. You hire somebody who's supposed to be the most efficient and reliable at that kind of work, but who has no known connection with you. He spends a couple of days decapitating the hierarchy and disappears again. That leaves the field clear. With Carlo Balacantano locked in jail, his lieutenants dead, and his troops presumably in disarray. Is that what's happened? I don't think so. But if the information we've been treating as factual is accurate, then it's possible. You mean we still haven't started at zero? We have to go back further? I'm just saying that we shouldn't get too attached to our facts. We both listened to the tape recording of Tony T. getting killed. He says, You, Big Bang, lots of screaming and scuffling. Then Mrs. T. says he's wearing a wire. Nobody says, Hey, wasn't that the butcher's boy, or words to that effect. Not on the tape, when they were alone. Only Mrs. T. says it later, and what she says is that her brother-in-law told her, but she'd never seen the man before in her life. Why would either of them lie? I don't think they did. But do you remember what it was like ten years ago? When Dominic Palermo came to me in the middle of the night looking for protection, he told me all this stuff about a hired killer. He'd never seen him, just heard about him. The people who were talking about him just referred to him as the butcher's boy. What if there is no such person? 
What if it's just a name for a whole lot of men who have done murders for money? Nobody knows who it was, so it all gets attributed to somebody whose exploits are, by this time, mostly imaginary, like Buffalo Bills, or maybe even attributed to a completely imaginary person like Paul Bunyan. You're leaving out the best evidence we have. Carlo Balacantano. He told you about him. He told me that the butcher's boy was the man who really committed the crime he's spending his life in prison for. I mentioned him first. But you believed him. I still do. I think Carlo Balacantano was framed for the murder of Arthur Fieldston, and I think this department was so eager to put him away that people forgot to ask a lot of questions they were being paid to ask. Did you say anything at the time? You mean you didn't hear? I said it until everybody got tired of listening, and then I said it again until they decided I wasn't a team player. That's what got me my vacation in Europe. No. Richardson looked genuinely shocked. Elizabeth couldn't tell whether he was lying, but how could he not be? He had been here in those days. I thought... They said you'd just sort of burned out because of the killings. She wondered if he was figuring out the rest of it and hoped he wasn't. He had at least the right to assume that he had his job because he had earned it and not because all the competition had turned it down. It's not as bad as it sounds, she said. I did all right. Jim came over and joined me there, and that's how I got him to marry me. Richardson accepted the escape route gratefully. Really? That sounds romantic. Oh, Jim was a romantic guy. She smiled. But she could already see Richardson's youngest analyst hurrying toward them with the morning's list of disasters. He followed her eyes and saw her, too. Lana, he said, what have you got? I'm not sure, she said. She glanced at Elizabeth and seemed to wonder if she should acknowledge that she knew the older woman was somehow above her in the department, so she said, I wondered if one of you had time to look at this. She laid the printout on Elizabeth's desk and hovered while Elizabeth and Richardson read it. Elizabeth saw the inconsistency almost instantly. Salcone, Albert, 42. Ficio, Daniel, 19. Lempert, Robert, 53. Sergeant Lempert Robert, a police officer. Lempert and Ficio both shot numerous times with an Ingram Mac-10. Salcone shot with Sergeant Lempert's service revolver. But a witness says Salcone and Ficio both had Mac-10s, and they came in together and killed Lempert and another man. What is this? asked Richardson. Where is this? Gary, Indiana, said Lana. We've got one too many dead people, said Elizabeth, or one too few. Jack Hamp stepped up to the yellow cordon of police tape and waited for one of the patrolmen to meet his steady gaze. Ducking under the tape to enter the area, and then flashing an ID only after somebody stopped him wasn't a good idea at this particular crime scene. Somebody would stop him, and it might be a more vivid experience than he was in the mood for right now. Policemen didn't much like letting strangers in when a fellow officer was shot down. They protected each other from having a photographer come in and put the picture in the newspapers. When an officer was shot, they made sure all the papers got to run was a formal portrait of the man in his uniform, usually taken about the time he graduated from the academy. The man Hamp had been staring at seemed to feel the heat on the back of his neck, turned and strolled toward Hamp, who held out his identification wallet so that the policeman could take it into his hand. Jack Hamp, Justice Department, he said. I'd like to come in and look around. The policeman handed it back to him and said, Suit yourself. Hamp let this reverberate in his mind as he slipped under the tape and walked to the front of the store. It wasn't right. It didn't tell him what was going on, but it wasn't right. If they were eager to accept federal help, the policeman would have taken him to the ranking officer on the scene and introduced him. If they were still shaken by having one of their own killed and were operating on the herd instinct, he would have brought the head man out to the tape to talk to Hamp. But this man had done neither. 
Before Hamp reached the broken window, he could see the destruction inside. Automatic weapons at close range made more hits than misses and spread a lot of blood around. The floor and walls of the store made a horrible first impression. Hamp didn't have any trouble spotting the captain. He was the only one around who didn't look as though he'd had to pay attention to the fitness regulations. He approached the man warily. Jack Hamp, Justice Department. The captain saw his hand but didn't shake it, so he added, Sorry about Sergeant Lampert. The captain looked at him, then looked away. He didn't say, yeah, he was a good man, or we'll get the bastard who did it. All he did say was, what can I do for you? This told Hamp that what he could see right now was about all he was going to see. But that was all right. Because looking at dead men didn't tell you as much as looking at the ones who were still alive. 16. Wolf was only a little surprised after he had looked through every telephone book the Washington Public Library had, and still couldn't find a listing for anybody named E.V. Waring. There were lots of Warings in the books, but no E.V. He supposed it wasn't unusual for somebody who worked for the Justice Department on cases like this not to want his address printed out where everybody could read it. But it was the Department of Motor Vehicles that really surprised him. He paid his ten bucks, filled out the department's form at the long stand-up writing table, waited for three hours, and finally was told that E.V. Waring didn't have a vehicle registered to him. This was more peculiar, but Waring was listed on the NCIC printout as agent in charge. So maybe he had a government car. Still, this was starting to feel like somebody who actually went to some trouble to keep out of sight after the office closed at night. Wolf was experiencing a sense of increasing uneasiness. Waring had to be the one who was making it hard for him to get out of the country. Waring had figured out his escape route and blocked it within hours. He was also careful enough to keep himself from being found easily, and this was the part that was worrisome. Wolf could find anyone. If he wanted to, he could start going through lists at the county clerk's office to find the house Waring undoubtedly owned, or pay the credit bureau for a credit report, or use any of a hundred other lists that solid citizens couldn't help getting their names on. But all of these took time. On his second day in Washington, he took a bus to Georgetown University. He walked around the fringes of the campus until he found a stationery store that looked as though the owner had been around long enough to be trustworthy and was prosperous enough to stay. He picked out a folding leather notebook cover of the sort that he had seen people who worked in law offices use for notes. He ordered the engraving on the leather, then picked out the paper for it and selected a serious, business-like typeface for the printing. By afternoon, Elizabeth had decided that she liked Lana. It was such an odd name for a woman her age. It was a relic of the fifties, and she had to admit that Lana must have been born in the late sixties. But Lana had found another anomaly, so Elizabeth forced herself to think about it. This time it had happened right inside Cook County. It was a small motel, and the couple who owned it had been murdered. But either before that or afterward, several heavily armed men, claiming to be police officers, had gone from room to room just before dawn, telling everyone to leave because they had cornered a fugitive in the building. Then they had gone through the place, breaking in all the doors, and ended by burning it down. Or maybe they had opened the doors to make the fire move faster. The police had already declared the fire an arson to cover up the murder of the proprietors when they got a call from one of the motel guests who was in a phone booth in Springfield and was curious to know if they had caught the fugitive. A second call came from Carbondale, and that guest wanted to know if the police were going to refund part of his room rental since he had been forced to leave a full eight hours before checkout time. Elizabeth picked up the telephone and dialed the number of Jack Hamp's motel room in Chicago for the third time, listened to six rings, and then set it down again. It was infuriating to know that he was practically on the scene, and she couldn't even tell him it had happened. Finally, she took the report and started to walk toward Richardson's office, then realized that she was walking alone. She stopped and turned. Come on, Lana. Lana hesitated, then caught up with her. I don't usually just pop in, she said. 
and then gave a nervous, apologetic laugh. "'He's not doing anything more important than this,' said Elizabeth. "'What have you got?' Richardson asked as they entered. "'We're not sure,' said Elizabeth. "'What I think we've got is several men trying to burn him out of a motel near O'Hare. "'I'm not sure who that would be. "'It's Castiglione territory.' "'Maybe Paul Cambria's men,' said Richardson. "'I've been trying to sort out the one from yesterday. "'The night the cop and the two guys with machine guns got killed, "'Paul Cambria was at a public function in Gary, maybe a mile from the spot. "'The local cops think he might have been trying to establish an alibi. "'A mile from the place where his men were going to shoot someone? "'An alibi should have some distance. "'More likely our friend was trying to get Paul Cambria. "'I'm not sure where the cop fits in.' but Elizabeth was racing ahead. And he missed, or somebody saw him. Anyway, something went wrong, and they followed him to Chicago, who knew where he was going to stay, and she stopped. What's wrong? asked Richardson. The cop. You're right. Sergeant Lempert. He doesn't fit in, does he? Maybe he's what went wrong. Richardson was getting excited now. Maybe he's the reason the butcher's boy couldn't get Cambria. Lempert saw him near Cambria doing something suspicious and chased him. For a mile? Alone? asked Elizabeth. Followed him, then. Kept him under surveillance. Only he wasn't the only one. But wait. The only reason the two soldiers with machine guns would kill Lempert is if he were with the butcher's boy, and they couldn't just wait until he left. Which means he must have actually arrested the butcher's boy. Lana said, I don't follow. Elizabeth said, I do, but I don't buy it. Richardson spoke faster now, as his scenario became clearer and more obvious. The cop and the butcher's boy are in the same store. A Xerox copying business, which probably means the butcher's boy ducked in there to evade capture because there's nothing else he could conceivably want in a place like that. The other two wouldn't shoot a cop unless they had to. The only reason they would is if he was going to take the butcher's boy away to some place where they couldn't reach him. And where is that except the police station? But then how? said Lana, and stopped. How what? Well, Elizabeth said quietly, they usually handcuff a person with his hands behind his back. But what you're saying is that the butcher's boy got out of the handcuffs, took the policeman's gun, and shot somebody who couldn't hit him first with a machine gun. You're right, said Richardson. I got carried away. Elizabeth nodded. He can do that to you. And we're not even sure he was the one, said Lana. But if he was, Richardson said, then you've got to take my hypothesis seriously. There's no vendetta against Balacantano that could include Fratelli and Buffalo and Cambria and Gary. I already take it seriously, said Elizabeth. You do? Sure. I was making a mistake. What I was doing was putting myself in his body, saying, What would I do if? And that's the wrong approach. In the first place, we don't have enough information that we can be sure is true, and so we can't build a theory that's based on it. In the second place, he wouldn't do what I'd do. Or rather, I wouldn't do what he does. That's a better way of saying it, because it's a proposition I can prove, and it means the same thing in the end. We don't know what he feels or if he has any sensations that we would recognize as feelings, so we can't build a theory on that. All we can do is try to figure out what would be the smartest thing for him to do, because that's pure logic, and catch him while he's trying to do it. Elizabeth saw that Lana had slipped away and turned to see where she had gone. She was outside in the hallway talking to a deliveryman. Is she any good? asked Richardson. Didn't you hire her? Not really. The system hired her. She was in the pool of applicants and had the best school record. When she came in for an interview, she was wearing clean clothes and showed no symptom of mental illness, so I would have had to make a written argument to hire anybody else. Nicely put, said Elizabeth. I think she's smart. Eventually, she's probably going to figure out that she's wasting her time here and do a lateral transfer. Lana signed the man's clipboard and came back with a wrapped package. It's for you, Elizabeth. Thanks. She put the package under her arm. 
Aren't you going to open it? asked Richardson. Weren't we in the middle of something? Open it. The other two watched while Elizabeth looked for a return address, then tore the brown paper off and opened the plain white box. Inside was a leather folder with gold leaf that said E.V. Waring. When she opened it, she saw the stationery with the heading E.V. Waring on it. I didn't order this, she said. Maybe it's a present, said Lana. Is there a card? asked Richardson. There's an envelope for one, but nothing inside. See? What a shame, said Lana. It's beautiful. Richardson said his version of the same thing. It cost a lot of money. English glove letter, engraved vellum. It adds up quick. What am I going to do? asked Elizabeth. What do you mean? Somebody sends you an expensive present for no reason at all, and you don't have any idea who did it? She noticed that Lana was at her desk talking into the telephone. Of course, the messenger. He would know who had paid for the delivery, or at least the name of the store. There must be paperwork because Lana had signed for it. At least her brain was working, even if Elizabeth's wasn't. The phone on her desk rang, and she snatched it up. Waring? Ah, Elizabeth. Jack, I've been trying to call you about... About the fire in the motel. I just heard all about it on the police radio. Police radio? Where are you? Gary, I've been talking to the cops at the copying store. I figured you might be looking for me and thought I'd better call you. Elizabeth's mind strained in two directions at once. First things first, find out what Jack knows. Good. We've been trying to work it out. There's something missing, so it still doesn't make sense. This Sergeant Lempert... He's what I'm calling about, said Hamp. What I'm about to tell you doesn't get written down on paper. It's an impression, a kind of instinct. I don't want to have to fly to Washington and try to prove it, okay? If you say so. Lempert was dirty. Watching the cops going over the scene a little while ago, I got the feeling they didn't think much of him. It's just a feeling, and I don't have time to go into it real deep, but he was dirty. Elizabeth groaned. What? Nothing. It's just that it so obviously fits, and it's the one thing that never crossed my mind. I mean, it did, but I kept pushing it out because it didn't lead anywhere. It didn't take me to the next step, except that what I was doing was assuming I was the one who got to say what the next step was. That's stupid. There was a pause, and now her voice betrayed annoyance. If the police knew, why didn't they tell anybody? It's hard to say what they knew or when they found out. But they're ashamed, which means that they're sure. No matter how you look at it, they don't get anything out of telling somebody like me. Elizabeth was already exploring this new terrain. If the sergeant was taking money from somebody, it wouldn't have been our friend. There's nothing we know about him that would lead us to the conclusion that he'd have a corrupt policeman on the payroll. So who would? The local mafia. And that explains why we have three bodies lying in a copying store. They were all on the same side. The only one that's missing is the winner. Though I'd love to know what he won. Another wake-up, and that's about all. The next morning he's in a motel outside Chicago, and they tried to kill him there, too. So what did he want in Gary in the first place? I know what I'd want if I were in his place. I'd want a way out. Maybe he thought Lempert could do it for him. People who can be bought once can be bought again. And cops meet a lot of people who can do a lot of things. And Lempert arranged an ambush? That sounds about right. Where are you going next? Back to Chicago? Yeah. He's long gone, but I thought I'd go rake through the ashes like everybody else. If we're lucky, I might be able to talk to somebody who knows something. Jack? What? This is kind of... embarrassing. But did you send anything to me at the office? No. What's embarrassing about that? Well, it's a present. It just came, and the card got lost, and... You see what I mean. 
You didn't open it, did you? Sure, why? Forget it. I was going to tell you to call the bomb squad, but if it hasn't exploded yet, I guess it must be from a secret admirer. I guess so. It ain't me, though. I've never laid eyes on you. You might be ugly. Goodbye, Jack. It was after six when Elizabeth finished going through the supplemental reports from the Gary police, the Cook County Sheriff and the Chicago Fire Department, and then pulling the files on Salcone and Ficcio. There was no question from the rap sheets that Salcone had worked for the Cambria family most of his life, and if Ficcio was carrying an identical weapon and entered the shop with him, then he must have too. But no matter how she put it all together, it still didn't tell her exactly what had happened. She put away the papers and prepared to go home. Now that she was alone in the office, without the unnerving sensation that somebody could overhear her thoughts by looking at her, she allowed herself to admit the truth. If she set aside the ugliness of what had happened, and thought of it as an event in the butcher boy's personal history, the last two reports were promising. Whatever he was trying to do, he was getting himself into deeper trouble. Now he was being hunted by the mob in Gary, and more ominously in Chicago, the territory of the huge, powerful Castiglione syndicate. He would understand better than she did what this meant. He was still alive, but the chance of his seeing the end of the month was virtually non-existent. As long as he survived, each day it became more difficult for him to move freely, and eventually he would realize that he couldn't do it any more. Years ago she had spent months looking at windows he might have touched or carpets he might have walked on, talking to people who might have seen him, always arriving after he had left, never getting closer than a few hours behind him. But pretty soon now he was going to have to walk into a police station somewhere. He would have to come to her, if only he could stay alive long enough to realize it. She almost forgot to take the leather folder with her when she left the office. At home she was going to hold the paper up to the light and try to read the watermark to see if she could find some store that sold that kind of paper. Lana's inquiry to the delivery service had yielded an order number that helped them to locate a copy of a receipt that said only cash and Elizabeth's name and office address. It wasn't as though she had a lot of friends who might suddenly send her an expensive present. She corrected herself. When she had begun making tactful inquiries this afternoon, she had run through six of them. Then she had forced herself to call Don Yeeter, who had been one of Jim's friends in the old days. Since a few weeks after Jim had died, Don had shown an interest in her that made her nervous and a little queasy, and she was relieved when she realized that he had no idea what she was talking about. She had left the present in the white box and even retrieved the paper wrapping from the wastebasket, because either might help. Ten minutes after it arrived, she had begun wishing the gift hadn't found its way to her, and now she was beginning to resent the giver. She spent enough of her life trying to decipher puzzles, and the best she could hope for at the end of this one was to get an address for a thank-you note. When she reached her car, it was already looking lonely in this part of the lot. As she unlocked the door, she remembered that it was Thursday, and that she still hadn't taken it to the garage for its rejuvenation treatment. She felt guilty, and as she settled herself into the driver's seat, the feeling escalated to regret. But when the engine started, she forgot about it. All that was important now was to get home to the kids. Wolf watched the woman pull the little green car out of the parking lot and into position for a right turn onto the street. Even though there was nobody behind her and nobody across from her, and anyone coming down the road could see that her only choices were to turn right or rise into the air like a dirigible, she had her turn signal blinking. She was Evie Waring, without a doubt. There was no particular reason to switch the signal on, but no particular reason not to, and it made more sense to use up one ten-thousandth of the life of a forty-cent bulb than to surprise a pedestrian she hadn't seen. The engraving should have said, Evie Waring, no fool. As he pulled out after her, he wondered if she had fallen for the stationery after all. It could be a trap. She could lead him out into some spot in rural Maryland, 
where forty FBI agents were waiting to drop on him like an avalanche. He had made sure the gift was something engraved with the name so that Evie Waring couldn't give it to his secretary. But he hadn't considered the sophistication of logic that Evie Waring might command. Suppose she had figured out why he had sent it. But Waring, Miss or Mrs. Waring, was careful and methodical. If it was a setup, there would be at least one car behind him. He kept glancing in the rearview mirror as he drove, but no car stayed long enough to worry him. He concentrated on keeping one vehicle between her car and his so that she couldn't get a clear view of him for long. He followed her to a quiet street in Alexandria. There were tall trees and a lot of two-story houses built in the fifties by upscale couples with identical taste. He could have called hers the white one, except that he could have said the same about most of the houses on the street. All of them had some form of brick facing. When she pulled into the driveway, he considered lingering to get a closer look at her. But a glance up the street revealed cars in all the driveways and lights on in the front windows. So there was too much chance of being noticed. He drifted past. Wolf turned at the next corner and cruised up the street behind hers. The houses there were almost the same. He tried to assess what he had gained from the time he had spent locating Evie Waring. Well, for one thing, he had stayed out of sight and given the old men some time to think about the value of peace of mind. For another, he had probably forced the FBI to use up a lot of money it was allocating to pay its grunts overtime to watch airport departure gates. But Evie Waring herself was going to take more thought. Miss Waring wouldn't pay the freight to live in a neighborhood like this, in one of these four-bedroom houses, but Mrs. Something would. Also, the car she had been driving had been Japanese, so it couldn't have been issued by the United States government without starting a riot in Detroit. That meant it was registered in another name, probably her husband's. Suddenly it occurred to him that he had fallen about as far as he was likely to go. He was probably going to be reduced to popping a suburban housewife with a deer rifle some morning when she opened the front door to pick up her paper in a pair of fuzzy slippers and a housecoat. The Sport of Kings Two days later, Elizabeth gave up on the stationery. The paper was made by one of the largest manufacturers in the country, and the engraving, the manager of one of the stores told her, could have been done by anybody in the business, on the premises, in about an hour. The leather folder was impressive to his professional eye, but since it was stamped with a famous French trademark, it could hardly be traced without a great deal of difficulty. Elizabeth felt guilty using the folder, but since she had gone to so much trouble, she decided she had earned it. On that same day she learned that she had a new neighbor— there was something annoying about having Maria be the one to tell her because a few months earlier she had told Elizabeth that the Bakers were having loud arguments. They're going to get the divorce, she had pronounced with the air of a gypsy fortune teller. Elizabeth had said she didn't think so. Then, when the divorce was still on the stage where the opposing lawyers were bluffing each other about assets, Maria had said, She's going to take the house. Elizabeth was more wary this time and merely asked, How do you know? And Maria had answered, The house is important to a woman, as though her employer had just arrived from Jupiter. Sure enough, a few weeks later, Brad Baker's car was gone and Ellen was planting tulips in the front yard. Then, only a few days ago, Maria had announced that Ellen Baker would move out soon. She was a fool and took the house, she said. The money was what she needed. Money doesn't make you weep when you see it. Elizabeth never saw the rental sign go up and never saw it go down. All she saw was the man. He wasn't anybody she would have noticed except that he was living across the street from her and therefore couldn't be ignored. He was of average height and build, about five feet ten or eleven, in his late thirties or early forties, and he had light brown hair that she decided had probably been blonde when he was a child. When she looked at him across the distance provided by the width of the street and their two little front lawns, she had to admit that he seemed unremarkable enough to share the general characteristics of a whole physical subgroup of men she'd known, including, there was no way to keep this thought from emerging, her own dead husband, Jim. He wore sport coats that seemed to fit him and ties with subdued patterns, 
didn't carry his keys on his belt, have a wallet with a chain attached to it, or wear shoes with noticeable heels, so he was probably all right. She was secretly pleased that he left for work every morning when she did, because it meant that she didn't have to rely on Maria for a description. She waited a few days for Maria to tell her he was taking drugs or bringing prostitutes into Ellen Baker's house during his lunch hour. But he hadn't stimulated Maria's interest, and Elizabeth forgot about him. Alexandria wasn't a bad place to be while he waited for things to sort themselves out. It was important to stay away from the parts of the Washington area that were likely to be full of people who worked for Jerry Vico. Unless things had changed in ten years, they would be out in force looking for just about anybody who was alone, just in case they could take something from him or sell him something. But Alexandria didn't seem to be that kind of place. He slept in a quiet residential neighborhood, then put on respectable clothes and left each morning at the time when people who lived there left for work. He timed his departure to coincide with E.B. Waring's. It was a risk, but he decided that it was more of a risk to be invisible and therefore inexplicable. Eddie had taught him this method when he was a kid. He had called it turkey hunting. Everybody thinks turkeys are stupid, but all they ever see is the fat-ass domesticated butterball kind. But the wild ones are scrawny, tough, and smart. They live in the woods and only come out into clearings they know to peck around, and then they go back into the woods. If they see anything that's different, they don't come out at all. So what you do is this. Wait until maybe midsummer. Then you take a broomstick and saw it off to about forty-eight inches. You paint it black and go out in the woods to a good clearing. You prop it against a log at a thirty or forty degree angle, and then go away for a couple of months. The first day of the season, you get up in the middle of the night, go out to the clearing and lay your shotgun right where the broom handle was. When the sun comes up, the turkeys peek into the clearing, see your gun, think it's the broom handle, and walk right in front of it. It's the only way to get them. Eddie had bagged Otto Corrigan that way. He had closed the butcher shop for a month and moved into a house in Cincinnati right next door to Corrigan's with the boy. The month that followed stuck in Wolf's memory as one endless sunny afternoon with the smell of grass and trees and the buzz of seventeen-year locusts. Eddie had him working on the lawn and trimming the shrubs and planting flowers, tomatoes, and radishes all day long, while he himself performed less strenuous chores that Wolf could no longer remember in detail. It didn't matter what either of them did as long as they were visible in the yard. Corrigan was supposed to be a lawyer, but he had only one client, and instead of a secretary or a clerk, he had four big guys in his house who looked like defensive linemen. He almost never went out, and the four guys made sure no one ever came close. By the end of the month, Corrigan and his four bodyguards were so accustomed to the sight of their next-door neighbors that on the last afternoon, when Eddie and the boy came for them, they appeared not to notice. But Wolf had not needed to rent the house across the street from Evie Waring to kill her. There was nobody protecting her, and unless she was carrying a firearm in her briefcase— she didn't appear to be capable of protecting herself. He had taken the risk because he wasn't sure that what he wanted was to kill Evie Waring. Now that he had found her, he wanted to stay close enough to watch her. Once he had gotten past the first moments, when his instinct for self-preservation had prompted him to get rid of her as simply and quickly as possible, he had begun to let his imagination work on her. The only thing he wanted now was to get past whatever barriers she had erected to keep him from disappearing, and killing her probably wouldn't help. But it was just conceivable that there was some way of finding out what those barriers were, who was looking where, and what they were looking for. The solution to his problem might be as simple as reading some papers in her briefcase, but probably it wasn't. There were a couple of things about Evie Waring that gave Wolf something to think about. She had kids. One was a little boy who got picked up in a van that had the name of a private school written on it. 
The other was a baby who was walked around the block every day in a stroller by a babysitter who went home at night. He never saw a husband, although he spent all of one day and night watching for him to show himself. A couple of days later, the mailman arrived, just after the maid and the baby went out, so he went across the street and pretended to knock on the door, but used the gesture to cover his other hand's movement into the mailbox to pluck out the letters. He scanned the envelopes and saw that about a third were addressed to Elizabeth Waring, and that the others were for Mrs. E. Hart, Elizabeth Hart, or Occupant. Since a couple of them were utility bills, he decided that there was no husband to worry about. He began to wonder if the easiness of it was making him complacent. The more he studied her and thought about her, the less impatient he was to do anything about her. He could take her off any time he wanted to, but as long as he didn't need to make a move, there was nothing for E.V. Waring, Department of Justice, to interpret. She couldn't do him any harm unless he made some ripples on the surface. The time for her to die was the day he was ready to leave. Carlo Balacantano was playing gin with the Mexican counterfeiter. As he laid down the nine of clubs, he watched the man's left arm and saw the tattooed scroll work on his bicep move a little. He wondered if this was the sign. For years, Bala had been studying parts of the hundred-dollar bill the maniac had tattooed on himself to see if he could discover a nervous twitch. But the nine of clubs didn't attract Espina. He moved his left arm to scratch an itch on his face, then drew a card from the pile. Carl Bala hated losing more than he hated death. He was an old man now, sixty-six, but life in the prison had allowed him no vices. He ate plain, nutritious food, breathed clean, dry air, and was forced into the moderate exercise of cleaning one of the outbuildings each day. He knew he was living a life that was much like his grandfather's in the mountains of Sicily, and would probably last the same one hundred four years. Death was still a remote prospect, but losing was a daily experience. The tattooed Mexican grinned at him, laid down his hand in a fan, and said, Jin. Balacantano looked at the ten cards with distaste. The wily little bastard hadn't even been collecting clubs. He had picked up the eight just to make four eights. Bala forced a smile and wrote down the thirty-six still in his hand. The horror of it was that he didn't see a way for it to end. Ospina would probably leave here in a few years, but he was so crazy that he would be rolling out hundreds in a basement in L.A. as soon as he'd had a decent meal. How hard was it to catch a counterfeiter with a green Benjamin Franklin on his belly and Federal Reserve note on his chest? So he would be back, this time with a longer sentence. For some time, Bala had been quietly nourishing a hope. The visit from that woman had raised a distinct possibility. He wouldn't be the first one to have secretly cut a deal with the authorities and been rewarded for it. He had attained a high position in life by developing a shrewdness about people— and he was sure that Elizabeth Waring had believed him. She hadn't believed Bala's necessary disclaimers, but she had believed the part that was true. There really was a butcher's boy, and he really had set up Carlo Balacantano for a killing he himself had committed. And that sure as hell ought to be enough for an appeal or a pardon. In a little while, Bala was going to have another visitor— this one was a second surprise. He was coming as an emissary from the old men. This pleased Bala enormously. To the outside world, he was one of the old men, but not to the old men. To them, he had always been a kind of younger brother. He was powerful and controlled a lot of bodies and a lot of territory. But when he had started having his troubles, he was only in his fifties. He had never had time to get white hair and sit on the commission demonstrating his wisdom. Now they were sending somebody to consult him about an important matter. Maybe he had spent so much time in prison that people had begun to think of him as older and more important than he was, like that guy Nelson Mandela in Africa. But he doubted it. It was more likely that something was going on out there. They had heard something about his pardon coming up and wanted to make the effort now to keep on his good side. 
Maybe they would even imply that they had done something to bring about his release, although he knew different. He saw the guard coming for him from a hundred feet away. They always looked around at other people as they made their way across the yard, but the man's eyes kept coming back to him. Bala stopped shuffling the cards and stood up. He noticed that Espina didn't seem disappointed. He was confident that Carl Bala would be back, that the endless gin game would continue, and that by the time he took his next vacation in the world, he would be another million points ahead. But Carlo Balacantano just might have a surprise for him. Bala held his arms up and submitted to the pat-down. The guards had never been particularly thorough with him because they knew that a man like Bala didn't need to carry a homemade knife for protection, and that if he felt a sudden urge to harm somebody, he wouldn't do it himself in a waiting room. They only did what the prison regulations required them to do, then guided him out the door and turned him loose in the pen. He looked along the fence and saw his visitor immediately. It was little Norman. He was disappointed and insulted. What the hell were they doing sending that giant black Mau Mau son of a bitch? What kind of emissary was that? Then it occurred to him that although little Norman might not be an important person, he wouldn't be a bad choice if he wanted somebody killed without a struggle. His head spun first to the right, over his shoulder, and then to the left. If the guards had suddenly disappeared, he was going to try to make it to the fence. They were there, though, still looking bored, but alert enough to look up. He stood where he was and let little Norman take a couple of long strides to him. Mr. Bollocantano, said little Norman, I don't know if you remember me. How the hell could anybody forget you, said Carl Bala. You lose five pounds or something? Little Norman chuckled deep inside his chest. I guess I do have that kind of face. Why did they send you? A few days ago the butcher's boy came to see me. What for? He wanted me to talk to the old men for him. I talked to some of them, and they said I had to come and tell you. What did he want from them? He says the only reason he did Tony T was because Tolerese sent people after him. Then he did Mantino and Fratelli because they were trying to keep him from getting out afterward. Good. I thought they were worthless, but now I'm sorry they're dead. Mantino and Fratelli, anyway. He looked up at little Norman with his hard little eyes. At least they didn't come around and try to cut a deal for him. Little Norman shook his head. You can play that on me if you want to. By the time I knew he was around, the most I could have done about it was make him kill me. And I did what he asked because I wasn't going to be the one who decided on his own not to deliver a message to the old man. Carl Bala shrugged. You could live a long time. So they sent you to me. They want to know what you think about it after all these years. He says he'll disappear forever if you all leave him alone. If you don't, he seems to think he can make some trouble. Carlo Balacantano straightened to his full five feet eight inches and began to walk. His face was cold and impassive. It was a feeling he had not experienced since 1951, when he had been hit a glancing blow with a baseball bat in a bar in upstate New York. The man who had hit him had been one of his own soldiers, a big guy named Capella, who was smashing a jukebox, and the bat had bounced off the metal top and into the forehead of Carl Bala. This had been the occasion of a profusion of apologies, and Bala had felt the same terrible frustration. He couldn't kill Capella for the clumsy accident, or his other soldiers would have turned on him, and he couldn't betray how much it hurt or how angry he was, because he would have looked weak. But he had never liked Capella after that, and the man had been forced to seek advancement in Portland, where there was more room to swing a bat. What Carl Bala wanted to say was that if any of the old men ordered their soldiers to leave this psycho alone, what was it but giving aid and comfort to his enemy? 
If anybody held back now, they wouldn't have to worry about some lone maniac slipping arsenic into their milk of magnesia. He would send an army to batter down the walls of their houses, drag them into the street, and hack their heads off with hatchets. But he couldn't say this. In the first place, saying it to little Norman was about as satisfying as telling the mailman that you were going to write a nasty letter. In the second place, if he said it, they would kill him in jail. Still, it did make something he'd had floating around in the back of his mind push its way to the front of it. He was going to get out of here, and when he did, there was going to be a war. Apparently, the old men had gotten so old that their balls had shriveled up like dried figs. He was going to get out of here and roll them up one by one. What Carl Bala said was, I'm trying to be reasonable about this. I've been in here for eight years because of this man. I asked before the trial that my friends and associates do their best to help me. I got no help. I asked that they make this man pay for what he did to me. I was told that nobody could find him. Now he's back and he's killed Mantino and Talarese because they were mine, and Fratelli because he helped me. What am I supposed to say? That it's all right? Little Norman towered silently above Balacantano as he walked along, a half-step behind and to his left. Tell them I repeat my respectful request that this man be found and his body turned over to my people in New York. Yes, sir, said Little Norman. I'll tell them that. Anything else I should say? It was common knowledge that somewhere in New York there was a safe deposit box full of things that Bala Cantano's men had lifted from the house of the man he was convicted of killing. The key was going to be planted on the body of the butcher's boy. Bala Cantano wasn't really listening. He was thinking about how soft and weak the old men must have gotten. It would be easy. With a little probing, he could find two or three at the beginning who would probably let him take over just for leaving them alive. Then he would be that much stronger when he was ready to face the ones who still had a little blood in their veins. He realized that little Norman was waiting for him to say something. You can go now. I'm in the middle of a gin game. 17. Wolf watched the small green Mazda back out of the driveway across the street and then walked out his front door in time to be seen. He didn't want to let her see his face too often, just to be somewhere near the edges of her peripheral vision and consciousness as the man who lived across the street. He would have preferred to rent a car, but he didn't have the kind of identification that companies felt comfortable with, and so he had bought this one for cash at a used car lot in Virginia Beach. It was about as far from Washington as he could conveniently get and still have Virginia plates. These transactions were always delicate. If you walked into a Mercedes showroom and handed them 80000 in cash, you had better be able to convince somebody that you were a lovable millionaire. The car had to be a beater, so the amount wasn't huge. The best way to do it was to find a place small enough so that you could talk to the owner. If the man had just taken something as a trade-in that he wasn't particularly fond of, cash would be attractive. He wouldn't have a price he had to get back, and once the car was off the lot, he could put any figure he wanted down in his books. But for Wolf's purposes, the car had to be right. He ended up with an 83 Dodge Colt that hadn't even been put out on the line with the others yet because they hadn't had time to spot-paint the nicks on the doors and roll back the odometer. It was plain, unassuming, and unmemorable, and it ran well enough. It was a little below the scale for his new neighborhood, but not so much that it attracted attention. He started it, backed out of his driveway, and had shifted into first before he caught something in his rearview mirror. Elizabeth Waring's Mazda wasn't moving. As Wolf let the car drift forward, he steered it so that his rearview mirror would show him what was going on. The Mazda was stalled, and she was walking quickly toward the back of his car, waving her arms. It was too late, and the appeal was too blatant to drive off and pretend that he didn't see her. In the mirror, she seemed to be staring right into his eyes, which meant she must have seen him move his head to spot her. 
He had to pretend he had seen her all along. Wolf stopped, backed up until his car was in front of hers, then got out and talked to her over the roof of his colt. Hi. I see you've got troubles. Anything I can do to help? Elizabeth Waring threw up her arms, her brows knitted in despair. Anything. It just died. Wolf turned off his engine and walked to her car. It was unbelievable that he had let this happen to him. He went over it in his mind. He had seen her come out of her house, turn to wave to the Spanish maid and the baby, and walk to the garage. Then he had put on his coat and checked the doors of his rented house. If she'd had any trouble starting the Mazda, that's when it must have happened. Because when he had returned to look out the window again, she was already backing out of her driveway. Then he had stopped looking. He reached under her dashboard and popped the hood, then went around, lifted it, and looked at the engine for any obvious sign of trouble. If he could just get the damn thing going before she had time to get bored with her trouble and start looking at his face, he might be able to get through this. Nothing under the hood was disconnected or leaking, but everything looked a little grimy for a car this age. He walked back to the driver's side, slid in, and tried to start the car. He heard the ignition click, but the starter motor didn't engage, and he smelled gas. He got out again. Your carburetor got flooded and your battery gave out. Not necessarily in that order. Do you have jumper cables? Elizabeth seemed to be thinking about something else. Look, she said, I know you've got to get to work. Thanks for trying, but I'll just call the gas station. Wolf decided he had better look at his watch before answering, and he did so. It's no problem. Honestly, I don't have to be there for another hour. But she persisted. No, it's not right. I'm not one of those women who just assume that any man who happens to be within screaming distance is there to be used. Or at least, I don't want to be. It just takes a minute, he said. It's not hard or dirty or anything. We'll just see if we can get it started. Have you got cables? Yes, she said. They're in the trunk. He pulled her keys from the ignition, opened her trunk, and surveyed the mess. There were toys, a child's car seat, a whole package of diapers that looked about the size of a bale of hay, a couple of umbrellas, and at the bottom a pair of jumper cables whose plastic wrapping was still intact. He unraveled them, hooked the alligator clips to her battery terminals, and then turned his car around. When the two cars were nose to nose, he unlatched his own hood, connected the cables to his own battery terminals, and restarted his car. Okay, he said, handing her the keys. Try it. The car started immediately, but as he disconnected the cables, he could hear that the Mazda wasn't running evenly. It sounded as though the cylinders weren't all firing. He closed the hood and said, You got a garage you can take it to? Yes, she answered. I take it this means it isn't healed. That's right. I can get the heart to beat, but it takes a mechanic to get it off life support. Tell me where it is and I'll follow you in case it stalls. That's all right, she said, and this time she looked worried. The only reason this happened is that I kept putting off taking it in. I'm guilty. So buy it a new wax job and apologize. If you stall out in a major intersection, you're liable to get hammered. I'd have to be pretty unlucky to have it happen at an intersection. Wolf shook his head. They only stall when you slow down, and you only do that when you're coming to a corner. She seemed to see a vision of it, like a premonition. It's on Millwood, the corner of Millwood and Fanshawe. See you there, he said, and walked back to his car. This was going to change everything. In an hour, Wolf was watching her walk through the doorway of the Justice Department. He pulled away from the curb and drove down Constitution Avenue toward the Federal Triangle. This morning he was on his way to look for tourists. There was no use kidding himself. Every day that he spent in the United States was making it more dangerous for him. He would have to see if he could find a British citizen and separate him from the herd. If he got the right one and hid the body well enough, it might be weeks before his relatives made enough noise to get the authorities to do anything about putting him on a list and by then Michael Schaefer would be sitting at home again. He felt a strange reluctance to get out this way, and he weighed and examined the feeling. If he'd had to explain it to somebody, 
he would have had to say that he wasn't in the mood to do the work. He felt tired. Eddie had always said that if it didn't feel right, it wasn't. It had been Eddie's theory that some little part of the subconscious mind had caught a danger signal, maybe seen something or figured out a flaw, or even smelled something it didn't like, but hadn't yet been able to formulate it into a package the conscious mind would accept. Eddie always said that ninety percent of the brain was never used. Actually, in his case, it had probably been more. He had once had himself hypnotized by a dentist because he couldn't remember any of the words to Annie had a baby except his name was Sonny Jim. She put him in the bathtub to see if he could swim. But Wolf wasn't nervous. He was just tired. He had spent most of the last ten years hoping that he would never have to do this kind of thing again. But here he was, up to his armpits in blood and not even working, just hunting for some harmless stranger so that he could live long enough to get home. He drove into the city with the rest of the world and looked for a place to park that Vico hadn't bought simply for the chance to have his people slip a Slim Jim into the door and pop the locks. Paul Martillo was in a lousy mood because people treated him like dirt. He wasn't some chump. He was a registered lobbyist. He wore tailored suits and fine silk ties and talked to congressmen and even cabinet officers on business involving the limits of civil rights and the responsible exercise of free speech by the electronic media. He represented a confederation of reputable organizations, notably the Italian American Anti Libel League, Citizens for Fair Reporting, and the Dorothea Goro Scholarship Foundation, named after a dead olive oil heiress. But subscribed to by many fine people who were still alive, Martillo had just left the office of a congressman from New Jersey named Amaroy. He had been told by the congressman's secretary that he should wait in the outer office and that Amaroy would see him as soon as he got off the phone. Amaroy had kept him waiting two hours, and then as soon as he had gotten into the private office, the man had started to look at his watch. In fact, before he even shook hands with him, Amaroy was looking at his watch. Martillo hadn't invented the system. It wasn't his fault that it cost four or five million dollars to run for Congress. The ambitious jerks had dug their own hole each time they ran for office, putting a little more into the campaign, getting themselves on television a little more often. All that Martillo did was go among them and try to make friends. Then he would make a list of the friends and turn the list over to the groups he represented. When it was time for congressmen to run for re-election. The friends were not forgotten. This making of friends was not a clandestine activity; it was a growing profession engaged in by about twenty thousand people. There was no corporation of any size, no charity, no union, no city that didn't have somebody like Paul Martillo on the hill. So where did a two-bit hack politician who ran for office because he couldn't make it as a lawyer? Get off treating him like he was still a bagman making his way around Detroit for Toscanzio. The answer was that somebody had told Amaroy what Martillo was going around talking about this week. Martillo hadn't liked bringing it up any more than the congressman had liked hearing it, but he had to say it, and Amaroy damned well had to listen to it, because they were both taking their money from the same place. Amaroy didn't want to have anybody say anything specific in his presence. So Martillo had to play the stupid kids' game too. He did it because it meant that Amaroy wanted to be able to continue to take the money. Martillo had said that the numbers of the organizations Martillo represented continued to be pleased that Amaroy was a leader in the fight for equal justice. So of course he would be interested in the strange case of a man imprisoned for murder on the flimsiest kind of circumstantial evidence, just because he was a well-known and prosperous businessman of Italian descent. The man in question continued, in fact, to be a large contributor to the Dorothea Goro Foundation, in spite of the fact that he had been in a federal prison for eight years. This was how his case had come to the attention of the foundation, which, as the congressman knew, was nominally dedicated to the promotion of parochial education. What it came down to was that Victor Toscanzio had ordered Martillo to go around and pull some strings. On the face of it. This was an odd thing for him to do, but Toscanzio was not a frivolous man. So if he was doing it, Balacantano must have offered him something substantial. The whole lobbying business was something Toscanzio ran for the old men. It wasn't his to jeopardize on some whim, and he knew it. 
but he also had a reputation for incredible luck. Only a few old paisans like Martillo knew what kind of luck it was. Tosconzio had the uncanny gift of sensing when a change was going to take place, and getting in before the bell rang. Carl Bala was obviously an active commodity again. Also, there were the rumors. From time to time, people had said that Carl Bala had gone crazy in prison, and maybe Tosconzio had decided it was going to be important soon to be one of the people who had tried hard to get him out. Martillo didn't have any objection to letting his fate ride on Tosconzio's bet, whatever it was. He had done pretty well so far. Now he was in his black Lincoln town car on his way to have a lunch briefing from a senator from Florida. This was the kind of hold-up that was getting to be increasingly popular, and he resented it. The bastards would send out invitations to go to lunch at a thousand dollars a plate, and there would be maybe forty or fifty lobbyists paying to sit there and listen to the windbag talk about what his committee was doing to help the ivory-billed woodpecker. It was an attempt to extort money, and it worked up to a point. Most of the lobbyists had some interest they had to protect from the sudden indifference of an incumbent senator. Martillo almost felt sorry for them. His organizations didn't have a bunch of jobs to protect. Or even any real members, only about twenty anonymous donors. So today's lunch was going to be a little different for the senator. If he didn't find a way to spend a few minutes alone with Martillo, he was going to watch two million bucks walk out of his campaign fund, and into the challengers. Martillo looked out the window of the car as his driver pulled away from the Sam Rayburn office building. As usual, the first twenty tourists in line for the tour were Japs. The movement of capital in the world was still a miracle to Martillo, although he had studied it for twenty years the way a bear studies bee swarms. Everything seemed to be the same as it always had been. It was just that there was all this floating money. It was qualitatively different from regular money, which stayed pretty much where you put it. This was like gambling money, because it didn't seem to really belong to anybody. It moved in and out of the markets and financial centers of the world. In huge quantities every day, but without warning, the floating money had transferred itself out of the country, and into the markets of foreigners, primarily towelheads, Japs, and Krauts. At the moment, the Japanese were the big spenders, but what they were spending wasn't the floating money. It was a kind of byproduct of having so much of the floating money trapped in one place for a time. It was like the wetness that formed on the outside of an icy glass on a hot day. This reminded Martillo that what he really wanted right now was a drink. Making the rounds would have been easier if he had been able to loosen his tongue a little, but this was out of the question. You didn't just gulp down alcohol when you were on an errand for Vincent Tosconzio. When you were done with work, you could drink yourself into a stupor, or shoot heroin into your jugular if you felt like it. But while you were on his business, you were his. In the old days, he had once seen Tosconzio explain this to a numbers runner with a sawed-off pool cue. Stuck in traffic, Martillo watched another busload of tourists forming a new line to wander through the halls of the Capitol building. This group looked like Europeans. Why the hell did any of these people care about looking at another public building? You could take them to an insurance company and tell them it was the Supreme Court. He looked at their faces and watched the way they walked. Foreigners walked different, and he studied them to see if he could figure out where they came from. This bunch was taller than most, very white, and they had bad teeth, so they were probably English. But then Martillo saw something that made the skin on his arms tighten, and his right foot try to stomp an imaginary brake on the floor of the car. "Pull over," he said. "Let me out." It was him. He couldn't imagine what the hell he would be doing standing in line with a bunch of limey tourists, but it was worth his life to find out. Use the car phone to call Mr. Vico. I need five, ten guys right here as fast as he can get them, and maybe four cars. Wolf moved with the queue of English couples gathering for a mass invasion of the Capitol building. There didn't seem to be any of the usual ill-behaved British children in short pants chasing each other in circles, which was promising. Children had preternaturally sharp senses, and they lived at the three-foot level, where anything he did would be right in front of their eyes. 
He had to move slowly enough to keep from spooking the herd, but quickly enough so that he wouldn't give any of its members the uneasy feeling that he was being stalked. He tried to get a sense of who was carrying what. If they had all left their valuables inside suitcases in the keeping of the bus driver, he had better know it now. As he passed a couple in their late forties, he heard the woman say, "'Not again!' The man said peevishly, "'It's not my fault. It's the damned water. I'm sure there'll be one inside the tube station over there.' The Englishman started a purposeful march away from the herd, his long skinny legs straight and stiff as he headed for the subway station. Wolf had been wrong when he had told himself that killing Evie Waring was as far as he could skid. The real end of the line was when you were following a sick tourist to a public restroom so that you could whack him for his wallet and passport. He had walked in the same direction that the herd of tourists was moving so that he could come up behind them. Now he was going to have to reverse directions without letting any of them notice. He waited a few moments until what he did wouldn't be connected with the man's departure, then turned and crossed the street. Wolf timed the cars and dodged between two of them to make it to the other side. But as he reached the curb, he wasn't thinking about the British tourist any more, but about the man who had gotten out of a black Lincoln behind him, then pivoted and reversed directions when he had. It was a rare advantage to be able to walk along facing the man who had been following him. The man was tall and trim, but not young, and the dark suit he wore appeared to be the regulation uniform of lawyers and politicians in this town when they weren't playing golf. The fact that his hair was long and wavy didn't mean anything. It could belong to the director of the FBI. He had the build of a cop, but somehow Wolf couldn't see the suit as belonging to one. Also, the shoes were wrong. They were some sort of thin, bumpy leather like alligator, and too pointed for a cop's. The soles were thin and slippery, and the heels gave off a shine when the man walked, as though they were made of a substance harder than rubber. As Wolf proceeded down the street, he never took his eyes off the man. He knew that if there were others, he would never see them unless the man did something to acknowledge them. But then the man did something unexpected. He slowed down, turned, and glanced over his shoulder directly at Wolf. When their eyes met, Wolf saw the alarm in the man's face. Immediately the man pretended to look past him, but he must have known it was too late. The face was familiar. It took Wolf a few seconds to bring it back because it was buried somewhere deep in his memory— in Chicago or somewhere. No, it was Detroit. It was Pauly the Bagman. His throat tightened in a feeling of regret and disappointment that was like pain. He had been very young in Detroit, maybe nineteen, and he had let them use his face for a few months. If somebody didn't pay his nut one week, the next week he would be in his store or on his way home from the office trying to think of something to tell Pauly the Bagman— but the one who showed up to ask him about it wasn't the friendly Polly, but the boy. He would simply arrive quietly and give the man an inquiring look. People knew who he was and told each other things that made them sweat when they saw him. What the hell was Polly the Bagman doing in Washington, D.C., wearing a tailored suit and women's shoes? They must have closed the bars and chased out everybody who had ever laid eyes on him in the old days. Hell, they must have dredged the lakes for corpses. He had to get out of this man's sight. He looked for a way to disappear, but the sheer size of the lawns and the sidewalks, like airport runways leading up to broad, high steps, made it hard to imagine how he was going to do it. He could see for a mile in any direction. He hadn't been expecting to do anything chancy here, just to find a tourist and wait until he was alone. He kept walking toward the subway entrance. If he could make it that far— he could probably step onto the first train before somebody like Polly the Bagman overcame his natural caution and followed. As he walked, Polly walked along on the other side of the street a few paces ahead. It puzzled Wolf that he would do this. Could he possibly imagine that Wolf hadn't spotted him? He resisted the temptation to reach into his coat to touch the reassuring weight and solidity of little Norman's pistol. Polly wouldn't try to take him out on his own, which meant that there must be others somewhere in the stream of people, walking along the sidewalks. But as he thought about it, he decided that if there really were others, Polly wouldn't be here at all. The man was hanging around to see where he went, which meant that there was going to be somebody he could tell. Somebody was on the way, and Polly must be expecting him to arrive soon. Directions wouldn't work if they were an hour old. 
He walked along the broad avenue, knowing that each step was taking him into some kind of ambush. People were on the way, and when they got here, Polly would see them, and he wouldn't. When enough of them had gotten into position, Polly would stop walking, turn, and point his finger. Wolf was beginning to feel hot, and his heart began to pound in his chest as he thought about it. He had made a decision a long time ago that he wasn't going to let something like this happen to him. His jaw tightened and started to chew on nothing. He wasn't going to walk along like some loser who was preparing to defend himself. They still didn't get it, and it still astonished him. He wasn't going to lie down and wait until they took their turn before he took his. He watched Polly stroll along the sidewalk across the street from him and started to drift toward him. Wolf was at the curb. Then a second later, he was in the traffic, slipping into the backstream of one car and out of the lane before the next one arrived. He made it to the double white line in the middle before something about the sound of the cars changed enough to make Polly turn his head. When he did, Wolf could see his eyes widen. His hands came up, and a nervous tremor started to grip him. His head shook so hard that he seemed to be nodding. He was already backing away, and he almost fell as he turned to break into a run. Polly the Bagman was over fifty years old, and hadn't needed to run from anyone since the February night to 1972, when the brain of a man named Fritz Hinkle short-circuited in Pastorelli's family restaurant, and that time it hadn't been personal. Polly had been just one of fifty or sixty people whom Hinkle was trying to stick with a steak knife, and he had only needed to run five or six steps before an anonymous diner dropped Hinkle with five shots from a Colt Cobra that happened to be part of his evening wear. Polly was long-legged, but his muscles were slack and slow from riding in the town car, and the leather soles of the new $300 shoes he was wearing hadn't been scraped against anything but floor wax and carpeting until a few minutes ago. He was still striving to attain what he hoped was sufficient speed when he began to hear the butcher's boy's footsteps. Polly kept his head up and elongated his strides, pumping his arms and hitting the pavement with the balls of his feet like a quarter-miler. He had a terrible sense that the butcher's boy was about to put a bullet into his spine, and that he wasn't going to hear it first. There would be a horrible wrenching pain, and then he would be down, but the lower part of his body would already be limp and dead. Or maybe the top part. Why not the top part? Just because you never heard about— Wolf watched Polly offering a credible imitation of a sprint as he abandoned the concrete and headed out across the wide green lawn. He could see that Polly wasn't running toward anything or anybody, which meant that nobody had arrived yet. He was simply a one-man stampede, like a man running from a hornet's nest. There was no point in going after him. Wolf didn't slow down. He merely changed directions. Where Polly had veered to the right onto the lawn, he turned to the left, darted across the street again, and sidestepped into the crowd. In a second, he was walking in the other direction. He joined a group of men and women who were walking up the steps of the first building he came to. He put on the same bored, resigned expression they all wore. The sign said Health and Human Services, so he stayed with them. He was reasonably confident that he wasn't about to stroll into the beam of a metal detector. As soon as he was inside the doorway, he looked back out the glass door at Independence Avenue and saw a car pull up near the spot where the tourists had assembled in front of the Rayburn building. Three doors opened, three men got out, and the car pulled away. As the three men stood on the sidewalk, each of them made a slow 360-degree turn, then picked a favorite point on the horizon and stared at it. Wolf turned and moved deeper into the hallway. He walked until he came to a corridor that turned off toward 4th Street and stayed on it until he could see another, smaller entrance. He ignored the people to the right and left of him and never paused to look inside an open door. But then, without warning, a woman coming toward him looked up from a file she was carrying and gave him a perfunctory smile. It was only then that he realized he had been smiling, too. He paused and looked out at the street before going through the door. But there seemed to be nobody out there whom Polly the Bagman would ask for if he needed help, so he set off down 4th Street with his head down and his legs matching the pace of the busy civil servants around him. He was going to have to make it to the car after all. There was no telling what Polly the Bagman was doing in Washington, but the three men on Independence Avenue must belong to Vico. If Vico thought he had a reason to send three men to stand around inside of the Capitol scanning the crowd for somebody to kill, 
he wouldn't be shy about sending twenty more. Wolf had to get out of here. The car was in the garage at the Gateway Tour Center on Fourth and E Streets. It was only a couple of blocks, but there was no way to get there except by the sidewalk, and nothing to hide him but the bodies of the other people walking the street. They were a mixed group. The ones who looked like college students or lawyers were in a hurry, moving along in both directions without letting their eyes rest on the ones that looked like derelicts, even when they had to weave a course among them. The ones who complicated the mixture most were in pairs, most of them elderly and from East Jesus, Kentucky or Marrowbone, Texas, stopping without warning to give the capital a proprietary survey or to study the grass in the lawn to see if their employees had given it the proper dose of fertilizer. Each time they did so, one of the quick ones had to do a strange little dance to get around them without stepping on their heels. Wolf did his best to imitate the quick ones. He was in trouble now. Vico was a scavenger. He had come up in the forties with the Castiglione's and been sent off to Washington to see what he could do about cashing in on the war surplus business. A lot of Castiglione people had been in the army. And seen the unimaginably huge hordes of every known commodity that had been built up in four years, and somebody had been curious enough to wonder what was going to happen to all of it later. The idea had been that a man with a supply of cash could probably pick up some useful stuff cheap. Vico had been the man with the cash, and he had found that it went a long way. He had bought up gigantic lots consisting of everything from unassembled motorcycles packed in oil. To leather bridles for a cavalry that didn't exist any more, to tinned K rations so cheap that he could make money opening them up just to salvage the cigarettes inside. From then on, the story went, he had been the organization's man in Washington. Wolf hadn't even been born then, and by the time he ran into Vico, Washington had been sewn up. The capital was a huge place that had hundreds of thousands of people getting paid for producing nothing. All day and night, trucks, trains, and planes brought in everything they used, and Vico took whatever was spilled in the process. Appliances taken off freight cars, percentages of the food brought in for the markets, even the gasoline left in the hulls of tanker trucks after they had shorted the stations to which they had made deliveries. He would take the money and multiply it by supplying the drugs, whores, and gambling the residents needed, and by lending them money to pay for these necessities at fifty percent interest. Vico had an army of vultures working the streets all the time, looking for ways to make money that he hadn't thought of yet. Wolf had met Vico only for a moment in the year before he'd had to leave the country. He had been hired to kill a man named McPray, who had recently moved to Washington. He had been a Texas businessman, who acted like an oil man. It was said that he had some connection with people in oil, but in those days, everybody in that part of the world knew somebody who was in oil. Somehow he had been involved in the buying of supplies for the public schools in a large area of the state. It was never explained to Wolf exactly how he had gained a say in the matter, but he had one. For several years he had steered the contract for paper to a company owned by Mike Moscone, but one year, without warning, when Moscone had a huge inventory he had collected in an Amarillo warehouse in anticipation, McPray had simply changed vendors. Some relative of his had gone into business. This put Mascone into a bind, and he had made some semi-public threats about having relatives of his own. The truth was that Mascone was a genuine made guy, but he was also of no importance. He wasn't even very rich. After some stewing, he decided that the only way he was ever going to be rich was to have McPray killed. By now, McPray had moved to Washington on some other scheme. And Moscone wanted him killed in a way that would make certain people in Texas believe that Moscone was some kind of serious mafioso with connections everywhere. After a number of inquiries, he had found out whom to call, and the butcher's boy had collected his money in advance and gone to Washington. Being isolated in Amarillo, Moscone had an idealistic view of how the world worked. He thought he should call Vico and tell him what was going on because it was a courtesy. Vico was true to his reputation. He sent three men to the butcher's boy's hotel to demand a third of the price for McPray. It was, they said, the overhead for doing that kind of business in Vico's territory. The butcher's boy had said he understood and started to pack his suitcase in front of them. When they asked what he was doing, he said, "I'm not going to do that kind of business in Vico's territory." 
Then he had called Nasconi in front of them and told them that calling Vico had cost him twenty-five thousand dollars. This had created a problem for Vico's men, who had been told to pick up eighty-three hundred dollars. The butcher's boy was in the airport when he saw them again. Only this time, Vico was with them. He had been about sixty then and fat. He had sat waiting in the airport coffee shop while his men pointed him out to the butcher's boy, who went in to listen to what Vico had to say. He had said that eight thousand dollars wasn't the point. It had to do with the way things had always been done. The local capo got a cut of everything that went on, and this covered the aggravation, bad publicity, and protection if it was necessary. It was simply overhead. The butcher's boy had answered that he understood, but said that he was keeping Moscone's money because he too charged for overhead, aggravation, and bad publicity. Then he excused himself, stood up from the table, and got on his plane. A month later, he had read that McPray had been found in the Potomac, suitably mutilated, and without thinking about it very hard, he knew who had done it. He also knew that Vico would have seen it as an opportunity to charge at least fifty thousand. If Vico thought he had a chance to collect on the contract for the butcher's boy, he would probably come out and walk the streets himself, even though he must have been over seventy by now and had more money than some state treasuries. The fact that it was unseemly for a man in his position to expect money for what the other old men would have considered a favor would not bother him. He would demand it. If Wolf got hit by lightning in the next ten minutes, Vico would send a man to see Carl Bala in prison on the grounds that it was his lightning. When Wolf was finally inside the garage, he had to control an impulse to run. There was something about getting out of the open that made him feel light and optimistic. He walked quickly toward the stairway, climbed to the first landing, and then up to the second level. He moved cautiously. There was no telling where he had been when Polly the bagman had first seen him. If he had been in the car, then he would be walking into something now. He stopped at the doorway onto the second level and waited. He listened to the distant sound of cars on the ramps above, then walked back to the head of the steps and held his breath. Paul Martillo was dizzy and gasping for breath. The coat of his suit had big sweat spots under the armpits, and his new shoes were scuffed from trying to catch himself when he slipped on the sidewalk. But what was most annoying was that his ears felt like they were plugged up. He had a vague suspicion that having your ears feel pressure must be a sign of heart trouble. But he couldn't remember ever hearing anybody say it. He still couldn't believe he wasn't running any more. He had gone all the way to Constitution Avenue and was making the turn up Louisiana before he realized he had outrun the son of a bitch. Then Vico's men had come along in a car, made a U-turn in the middle of Louisiana, and picked him up. As he thought about it now, getting into the car probably had been a mistake. In the first place, his leg muscles were certainly going to stiffen up because you were supposed to walk around for a while and stretch your muscles after a dash like that. In the second place. Just in case there was one person inside the Beltway who had not seen him running like a madman across the damned Capitol lawn, chased by a hitman, he had given them a good chance to see him getting into a brand new Cadillac with four of the most obvious-looking hoods that he had ever seen. Two of them had even had guns in their hands when they had picked him up. Now that he had his wind back, he began to think about the fact that this was going to be over in a few minutes, and Paul Martillo still had to live here. In fact, until this interruption, he had been on his way to see a senator. It was hard enough around here. At least the bastards had a phone in their Cadillac so that he could call Bart, his driver, and tell him where to meet him. When he hung up, he even made a little joke to hide the way he felt. I was afraid I was going to have to call the cops and get them to activate the thief buster on the Lincoln. Sitting in the back seat of the Cadillac, he had tolerated the questions from Carmine, the leader of the crew. So what's he got on? Martillo thought. I don't know, a sport coat, a pair of pants. He doesn't look like anything. Doesn't Vico have anybody out here who met him? Sure, said Carmine. But that was a long time ago. Not long enough, said Martillo. There was a little snort that stood for laughter from one of the others. Sure, these jerkoffs thought they were better than Paul Martillo. It was like the guy who came to fix your toilet, thinking he was smarter than you because you had to hire him to do it. 
At last the car pulled over beside the parking garage. Martillo opened the door and nearly fell out, straightened his tie, pulled his cuffs so that they showed a little beyond the coat, and walked into the dark concrete structure. He was a little more upset than he had let Vico's men see. As he thought about it, he realized it was just possible that Vincent Tosconzio was only doing what the old men had told him to do. They probably figured that if they got Balacantano out, from then on the butcher's boy would be his problem. Carl Bala was a nasty, arrogant maniac in his own right, and he would be capable of getting this one little guy. The old men were smart that way. They thought ahead. Which was why they were the old men, and the ones who had come up with them were all buried. On the other hand, this development was good luck for Carl Bala. If somebody didn't pull some strings in Washington, he was going to sit in jail for a hell of a long time. He would be like the Birdman of Alcatraz, one of those ancient, clean old guys who took up needlepoint or something. As he walked to the staircase to meet Bart in the town car, Martillo noted that the Cadillac was driving up and down the aisles looking for a parking space. This was why those guys were still being sent around town in threes and fours, carrying guns. Given Washington on a day like this at one o'clock, anybody with a brain knew that the lower levels would be filled. It was the only public lot for about ten blocks, for Christ's sake, and anybody who was ever going to make something of himself would take the ramp to at least the third floor to save some time. That was the real difference between the schmucks and the winners. The winners could think ahead, while the schmucks went around and around the track like donkeys. Paul Martillo leaned hard on the railing as he started to climb the steps. He knew his shoes must be making a loud noise on the metal steps, but the clanks sounded distant and hollow. He was going to have to have his ears looked at. Wolf heard the footsteps, then moved ahead again and looked onto the floor of the garage. The black Lincoln with the driver still in it pretending to read a newspaper wasn't more than fifty feet from Wolf's Dodge. He took three deep breaths as he pulled little Norman's pistol out of his coat, held it down beside his thigh, and turned back to the stairwell. There just wasn't anywhere to go. Carmine Fusco had worked for Vico for a long time, and he knew what the butcher's boy meant to him. Vico could pick up a couple of million bucks in one morning just for popping one man. If Vico had a crew working the hotels that was good enough to lift a couple of thousand dollars worth of cameras and jewelry every single day, and a guy who trucked it all to another town to sell it for a thousand, which was pretty good, it would still take more than three years to gross a million from the operation. Then you had to add another three years to pay off all those guys. That was how Vico thought, so it was how Fusco thought. He had let Martillo off at the bottom of the garage, and the jerk had stood for it. That was the joke about having somebody like him come to town from some place like Detroit and not work for Mr. Vico like everybody else. He wasn't born here, so he didn't know the city well enough to figure out that anybody who had been spotted in this part of town on foot only had a couple of places where he could have parked. As Fusco's brother-in-law Gilbert drove slowly up each aisle and turned down the next, Carmine kept the window open and listened. If the butcher's boy was looking for Martillo, he was going to have a chance at him. But if he made any noise, it was going to cost him. You had to take some risks to get a guy like this. But Carmine wasn't about to risk anybody who belonged to Mr. Vico. Then he heard the pop. It sounded more like something blew up than a gunshot, because the concrete made it reverberate for a second. He poked Gilbert. Hit it! The Cadillac didn't make much noise when it accelerated, so there was just a scream of tires as the car floated around the corner like a sailboat in a high wind. It was one big, fat slob of a car. In a few seconds it was on its way up the ramp. Now there was a second shot, this one even louder than the first, and it made Carmine see yellow for a second. So much for Martillo. It had been the coup de grace, the guy putting a hole in his head to make sure he stayed dead. Stop, he said. Let us out, and get ready to block the ramp. He and Costelli and Petrie climbed out, and then Carmine had a vision of black and silver. With a roar, the front of Martillo's Lincoln skittered around the bend, the rear end swinging about so that the grill and headlights were no more than ten feet in front of him. 
As he realized that it wasn't going to stop, he took three steps back to get up on the railing and out of its way. It passed him so close that he felt the wind. He somehow knew that there was a bullet hole with a big crack in the driver's side window, without knowing how he saw it because the car was moving so fast. As it tilted down the ramp, it seemed to be flying, and when it hit the first floor, it bottomed out and sent up a spray of sparks. Fusco gave Costelli a push toward the stairs, then looked at Petri and pointed to the left. Fusco walked up the ramp himself. It was good for his status to have the others think that he had all the guts, but the truth was that it was the safest place to be. This guy wasn't going to shoot the man in the middle first. You might shoot the one on the right or the one on the left, but you never shot the one in the middle. It was one of those odd things. Fusco was a little surprised when he made it to the top of the ramp without hearing another shot. But then he saw Martello's driver, who was dead as a can of tuna. When he turned his head, he could see Castelli bending over another body in the stairwell. It was Martillo, which left only one likely candidate for the driver of the Lincoln. Carmine, said Petrie. Wait a minute, Fusco said. I'm thinking. Didn't that guy Martillo say his car had a thief buster? Fusco smiled. It figured that Petrie would have picked up on that. Ever since those things had gone on the market, Mr. Biku had been on Petrie's butt to think of a way to locate and disconnect them. They were making it dangerous and nerve-wracking to boost a car. Wolf finally found the button that rolled down the window and pushed it. It went only halfway down before the place where his bullet had punched through, stuck in the slot, and the electric motor hummed without moving it. When he rested his elbow and forearm on the window and leaned, it rolled all the way in. This didn't help make him feel any more comfortable, but it did make the car look normal from the outside. On the inside, it wasn't normal at all. He had walked up to the driver and shot him through the window. The bullet had gone through his forehead and out the back of his skull, and he had fallen across the front seat. The problem with head wounds was that they produced a lot of blood. Even though he had pushed the body out the passenger side within a few seconds, there was blood all over the interior. The leather upholstery of the passenger seat had a pool of blood on it that sloshed onto the floor every time he applied the brake and seeped backward when he stepped on the gas pedal. The only thing on his mind now was getting onto I-395 and back to Alexandria before somebody spotted him. He had to find a way to slow everything down. It was as though the pace of things had changed in his absence. Events happened too quickly now, which made it seem as though they didn't have any relationship to each other. He needed an hour or two in a place where he didn't have to look over his shoulder. He would have to duck under the surface again and come up someplace else where he could be the one who made things happen. He wished now that he had killed little Norman instead of talking to him. He had considered it carefully and thought he'd had nothing to lose. If everybody he had ever known was already eagerly looking for him so that they could get rich, then there was no way he could make things worse. So he had offered a rational, measured bargain— in effect, he would cease to exist, and all they had to do was to let him. But they hadn't let him, and this was why things were happening so fast. He reached Alexandria with a small feeling of surprise. He had managed to sedate himself with the simple mechanical task of keeping the car between the lines. He turned onto his street, then into the driveway, opened the garage door, drove the car in and shut the door with the briefest, most economical movements he could manage. As he walked to the front door, he glanced across the street at the house of E. V. Waring. Tonight was going to have to be the night. If he left her body inside the trunk of Polly the Bagman's car and parked it in the right place, maybe he could cause some trouble for them. As he opened his front door, he saw a piece of paper stuck in the mail slot. When he plucked it out, he could see the engraving that he had selected, E.V. Waring. It read, Please stop by around eight for coffee and dessert. It's the only way I can thank you for your help this morning, and my pride demands it. The least I can do is welcome you to the neighborhood. Sincerely, E. 18. You know, this wasn't necessary, said Wolf. It's wonderful, but you didn't have to do it. 
He gestured vaguely at the long dinner table. The dark, polished hardwood stretched for at least five feet past the zone covered with white linen, china, silverware, and the remnants of a peach tort. She must have bought it in some other time, when she thought she was going to be cooking for her whole FBI squad, or whatever they called them. Elizabeth smiled. At least somebody had taught him to compliment the hostess. He seemed to be nice enough, but he was boring. Unbelievably, thunderously boring. He didn't appear to have any interests or experiences that he could be induced to tell her about. Why did she always feel that she had to do this kind of thing? It's nothing. I just wanted to thank you for helping with the car and giving me a ride to work. I hope I didn't get you into trouble. Trouble? You were late, weren't you? Not at all. I was making cold calls. Cold calls? No appointment, no warning. You just drop in on them and see if they're interested in what you're selling. What are you selling? She asked brightly. At the moment, advertising space. Want some? I don't think so. No wonder he didn't talk about it. Even he wasn't interested. Would you like some more of this tort? Wolf looked at the pastry and shook his head. Save some for your kids. Where are they, anyway? They had dinner at six tonight, if you can call it dinner. Amanda throws it, mostly, and Jimmy evades it. Amanda goes to bed around seven-thirty, and tonight Jimmy fell asleep at eight. A big day at preschool, I guess. She pointed to the little box on the sideboard that looked like a transistor radio. If you listen carefully, you can hear Amanda snoring. I'm afraid you won't get to meet them. Oh, too bad. He began to search his mind for a way of killing her so that they wouldn't see it happen, or walk out here in the morning and find the body. He didn't want to kill them, and he wanted the maid to find the body. Do you like children? Elizabeth asked. She regretted it instantly, and a wave of something that felt like heat swept over her. It was the sort of question that somebody, somebody very crude and desperate, might ask a single man if she wanted to determine whether he was a suitable prospect. Now he would think that she was pathetic. Then it occurred to her that there was a worse possibility. What if he misinterpreted the whole invitation? She had dragged him over here alone in the evening. Well, not alone, because the kids were here, but without any other adults. And he could easily think it was because she wanted to seduce him. Of course he would, when in reality the impulse had been exactly the opposite. She had wanted to assert the fact that she was an independent person who repaid a kindness with an appropriate gesture of thanks. But he could understand this and still imagine that she thought the appropriate gesture of thanks was... It took him a moment to come back to the conversation. Uh, I guess so. I mean, I don't really know much about them, except for remembering being one. But it would be sort of odd not to like them, wouldn't it? It would put me in a strange position, not liking the members of my species until they were fully grown. So I guess I do. She smiled again. She had been imagining it all. He had managed to block another avenue of conversation in the process of reassuring her, but that was no loss. She had been known to drone on about the kids. Wolf said, It must be kind of hard taking care of them by yourself. I see you going off to work every day. At last he had found a way to bring up the husband. Was he at a military base on Guam, or was he going to come through the door in ten minutes to pick up his mail or pay his alimony? I have a babysitter. She's a nice woman, and the kids like her. But it is hard. You feel guilty for leaving them, and you feel guilty at work because you sometimes have to miss a day or go home early because they're sick or whatever. What it is, really, is that when you have kids, you need to work more than you ever did. But even when you're at work, you're not always thinking about your job. And if it comes down to a choice, the job always comes second. If the job came second, she must be a hell of a mother. He had been in the trade for more than fifteen years before he had left, and he had never had to think about the federal government. But now he did. What do you do at the Justice Department? 
I'm sort of a bureaucrat, I guess. You mean you're a lawyer or an FBI agent? Lawyer, she said. My husband was the FBI agent. He got to do the glamorous stuff, and I sit in an office. Was. You're divorced? He tried again. No such luck, she said. Jim died of cancer about a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He noted the way she said it. It would be better if he could be alive. She loved him, or had reached the stage where he had a rosy glow around him, and she was telling herself that she did. But she was in luck. She was going to be one of those widows who didn't last long after her husband died. Don't be, she said. Everybody loses somebody. If it's not a husband, it's parents, grandparents. And we had the kids. I'm lucky. He nodded. That's a nice way to think about it. You sound like you think I'm deluding myself. I didn't mean to, Wolf said. I meant it. We don't have a whole lot of choice about certain things, and death is one of them. But you do have a choice about how you think about it. That's true. But I've thought about it in a lot of different ways, and I think this is the right one. Not because it's the most useful, but because it's the most accurate. Most of the time I don't feel sad. I just miss him. Wolf wasn't really listening now. Something strange was happening. From his seat at the end of the table he could see a red glow through the curtains. It was the brake lights of a car pulling up in front of his house across the street. After a second or two the lights went out. He hadn't seen any headlights. He listened for the thumps of doors slamming so he could count them, but he couldn't pick up a sound. "'Tell me about him,' he said. "'I mean, if it doesn't bother you.' It was strange the way he focused his eyes on some point beyond the wall, almost like a blind person. Maybe he was remembering something of his own. There was more to him than she had thought. "'Well, we had fun together.' You mean he had a sense of humor? Not exactly. I mean, he did, but it was sort of an FBI agent's sense of humor. I know it's not fair, but they're in a mostly male sort of world, so most of the jokes are inside jokes, and the ones that aren't are kind of simple. Somebody famous once said that the difference between men and women is that women don't like Falstaff. What the hell was she talking about? He still hadn't heard the doors. He tried to concentrate. I thought it was the Three Stooges. She grinned. That was a different famous person. He hadn't heard the doors, but a car went by on the street, and he saw that for just a second the brake lights went on as it passed his house. Maybe so. I guess what I mean about Jim was that he had a capacity for fun. The way we got together was that ten years ago we were each assigned to the same case. It was a bad case, and the outcome was awful. Afterward I took six months in Europe. One morning, really early, I was asleep in my hotel, when the concierge woke me up to tell me I had a visitor. It was Jim. We hadn't been dating or anything. He simply showed up. It must be the police. How could they have followed him here from the parking structure without him seeing? Why hadn't they just grabbed him as he had pulled into his driveway? He realized that some reaction was expected, but he hadn't heard any of it, so he smiled. Then later, about two years ago, he came home one day with three tickets for a flight to London. A flight to London? That's right. He did it because it had been eight years since the first time. Very nice, he said. That is fun. He was always doing unexpected things like that. When I say he was an FBI agent, you probably picture a fullback with a big neck. He wasn't. In fact, he looked enough like you to be a relative. He was perfectly normal, about your size, and had an intelligent look in his eyes. He had a perfectly good law degree, and we always talked about going into practice together some day. Was it possible that she had somehow identified him? Maybe she was going on like this to give her people time to surround the place. She would go out to the kitchen again to get more coffee, 
then slip out the back while the SWAT team came bursting in through every door and window. No, she had actually made herself feel sad. He wanted to look out the window at the people across the street, but he couldn't take the chance. Here, he said. Let me help you take the plates and stuff. He picked up a plate and the glass serving dish with the tort on it and stood up. He decided that if she was conning him, he would crack the serving dish on the edge of the counter and bring it across her throat. As they walked to the kitchen, he had to think of something to say. It's too bad the kids were so young. They didn't get to see much of him. I know, said Elizabeth. I think it's going to be hardest on Jimmy. He'll remember him a little bit. Then there's all that stuff the psychologists put in their books to scare mothers. What stuff? About little boys needing men to identify with? I wouldn't take that too seriously. I don't know. I find myself stuck being a combination of the strong, domineering mother and the cold, distant father. She looked at him mischievously. I run into the product a lot professionally. She couldn't see that he had stepped sideways through the door because she was looking the other way. He surveyed the kitchen, but there was nothing. The place looked like the kitchens he remembered seeing on television when he was a kid, with curtains on the window over the sink and a lot of cookie jars and salt and pepper shakers that looked like fish and fruit and little people and rows on the shelf. It was also a mess. There were pots and pans and knives and spills on the counter, and even a couple of slippery spots on the floor where something had dripped while she was cooking the kids' dinner. Eddie's kitchen had looked like an operating room in a hospital, with a gleaming stainless steel cutting table in the middle of the floor that he had bought from the same wholesaler he dealt with at the butcher shop. But Eddie had been a rotten cook, so they had eaten at diners whenever they could think of an excuse. He followed her back to the dining room for another load of dishes. He had to get a look out that window. Did you take any pictures of England? Sure, she said. But you don't want to see them. Yes, I do. Jim took almost all of them. So it's Elizabeth and Jimmy in front of this, and Elizabeth and Jimmy in front of that. What's wrong with that? She shrugged. You have to promise that as soon as you're bored, you'll stop looking. They're what you might call priceless family treasures. That means we're always in focus, but the monuments and cathedrals aren't. I put them away in Jimmy's closet because I knew that someday he and Amanda will want to look at them. If it's too much trouble, don't bother. I just thought that sometime I might like to go there. I've never been out of this country. I don't mind showing them to you. It's just that looking at pictures of somebody else's vacation is sort of a yawn. I promise not to. Carmine Fusco sat in the dark in the living room of the house where the butcher's boy had parked Martillo's car. He had been sitting in a comfortable chair to the side of the door and about fifteen feet away from it. But now he was restless, and he stood up. Imagine a man like that living in this kind of house for all these years. It was going to be an embarrassment to Mr. Vico if anybody found out that the butcher's boy had been living quietly in the Washington suburbs for ten years. He walked across the room. There was something about the darkness that made you more quiet. He could hear every creak of the floor. Castelli, he whispered. Yeah? See anything? No. Maybe he's got a date. If he can get it up after what he's been through today, I'd like to meet her. Jesus, if I could get it up after what I've been through, I'd like to meet her. Carmine moved to the window and held up his wrist beside the curtain. But he still couldn't see his watch. He knew it should have been comforting, because it meant the rest of him wasn't going to be easy to see either. But it was just frustrating. It was bad enough waiting to blow away somebody you were scared of, but losing track of time made it seem longer. Wolf waited while she kicked off her shoes and slipped into the hallway. He noticed that she didn't tiptoe, but placed her feet flat on the floor to keep her weight from making the floorboards creak. When she turned and opened a door on her left, he quickly stepped to the window and moved the curtain aside half an inch. He could see that the cars that had stopped in front of his house had pulled away immediately. They must have expected to find him there, so they had all arrived at once to storm the place. When they had found that he wasn't inside, 
They had made the cars disappear and sat down to wait. That didn't seem to him to be the way cops usually operated. They would kick in the door, flip on all the lights, and rush him. But if they found the house empty, they would spend the next five hours tearing it apart and taking pictures and fingerprints. It occurred to him that he was with somebody who knew what cops would do, but that there wasn't any way to get her to tell him. Elizabeth returned with a disturbingly large box, set it on the couch between them, untied a string around it, lifted the lid and handed him the first pile of photographs. She looked apologetic and shy and a little sad. These are London. As Wolf glanced at the first few, they made his head ache. He had stood on the embankment right where a younger Elizabeth Waring was standing, only he had been with the Honorable Meg. He was hiding in this woman's living room because across the street there were men waiting to kill him. He had no clear idea what he was going to do. All he wanted was somehow to be magically transported into those photographs and stand there in the soft British light. Elizabeth glanced at the pictures as he shuffled through them. He really seemed to be studying them. What a peculiar man! At first he had seemed so empty and dull, but he was sensitive in an odd, quiet way. Maybe he was quiet because he was so intensely interested in other people. Suddenly, without warning, this train of thought reversed itself and she felt a chill move up her spine. Maybe the interest wasn't healthy. Maybe he was some kind of voyeur. It had been so long since anyone had been interested in anything about her life, her world, that maybe she was exposing herself to something awful that she couldn't name. He had encouraged her to go on a lot longer and more openly than anyone else ever had about things that she had always kept private. It hadn't started out that way, and it hadn't seemed peculiar at the time, so how had it happened? Maybe she was becoming had become one of those widows who ended up signing over their life insurance to a con man because he had paid attention to her. Maybe even to somebody she just imagined was paying attention to her. Say a television preacher with a wig that looked like a monkey pelt. No, she told herself. I was just being polite. She pretended to go through the box, but kept him in the corner of her eye. He's nothing out of the ordinary. If you look at him objectively... He's already giving signs that he's restless. When the telephone rang, she sprang to her feet. Gotta grab that before it wakes the kids, she explained. She managed to snatch it up before the second ring. Hello? Richardson's voice came to her. Elizabeth, sorry to call now, but it's important. Something happened? Yeah. The police just identified two bodies they picked up in the parking garage at the Gateway Tour Center. One was your basic LCN infantry. His name was Jerry Bartolomeo. The other was a surprise, a guy named Paul Martillo. He was a lobbyist for a bunch of non-profit organizations, one of them being the Italian-American Anti-Libel League. What's that? Is it legitimate? There was a blast of air across the receiver that must have been a kind of laugh. I forgot, you haven't been on the mailing list for a while. It was founded by Peter Cuccione about thirty years ago to threaten the television networks because he didn't like having his kids see the untouchables. Since then, it's been run out of Detroit by the Tosconzio family. Then it's a definite possibility. I don't know if this has anything to do with the rest of it. But a guy like Martillo? I thought you'd better know. You bet I want to know. You think it's him? Richardson was cautious. Well, I don't know. Martillo wasn't a big deal, but he worked for people who are a very big deal. And shooting the guy in the middle of a workday near the Federal Triangle is kind of bizarre. It is. Richardson, we've got to get somebody down there. Jack's in Chicago, and I can't go just like that. I've got the kids sleeping. Can't they? Oh, yeah, they're little, aren't they? Four and eleven months. How about a neighbor? Elizabeth's eyes moved to Wolf reflexively and then away. A minute ago she had been trying to figure out if he was a con man, an emotional vacuum cleaner, or a sexual sadist. No. Richardson sighed. 
Okay, I guess I'll drive in myself. I'll try to get as much from the D.C. police and the FBI as they'll give me, and I'll ask them to send you copies of whatever gets committed to paper. Thanks, she said. Sorry I can't do it, but I know, he interrupted. I forgot about the kids. Wolf picked up the fourth packet of photographs and recognized a shot of Milk Street in Bath. But beneath it, at the bottom of the box, was a pile of papers, tags, and things held together with a rubber band. There were long envelopes with the British Airways logo and a couple of receipts that somebody had just tossed in. As he looked at the photographs, he felt the packet with his other hand. It was stiff, and a corner of something blue was sticking out. He recognized its texture and size. She had said they had gone two years ago. It wouldn't expire for five. He looked at her as she prepared to hang up the phone. In a second, she would turn away to put it on the cradle. He gripped the corner hard with his thumb and forefinger. Come on, turn. Come on. Now. But she didn't turn. She picked up the whole telephone, brought it around with her without looking at it, set the receiver down, and returned to the couch. Sorry. It was work. Sorry. He nodded. It was work, all right. Since the start of all this, he had been reduced to doing everything the hard way. Look, I couldn't help overhearing. If you have to go somewhere, she shook her head. No, thanks. I can't leave the kids. I'll keep an eye on them for you. I don't mind. She smiled. That's very kind, but they don't know you. If they woke up, they'd be terrified. Jack Hamp sat in his motel room and listened to the big jet engines roaring along the runway at O'Hare, louder and louder as their pilots throttled them up, and then thundering off into the sky before they made the wide turn to bank into their prescribed compass headings. The Washington report was virtually incoherent. This was one more time when he wished the computers would either take over the world completely so that people would know precisely and promptly what the hell was happening, or else just go away. The combination of human being and machine hadn't worked out too well. The report had two people dying, who at first glance didn't seem to have much to do with each other, let alone with the butcher's boy, until they both were found lying in a Washington parking ramp. Their occupations were listed as driver and lobbyist. To Hamp's practiced eye, it looked like a report where one or both of the bodies were misidentified. All it told him was that something had happened in Washington today, and that some people had died. He could have learned as much from the flashing light of his silenced phone beeper. He glanced at his watch, picked up his briefcase, and then walked the room a last time to be sure he hadn't left anything. That was another thing. The goddamned machines put out so much paper that you practically had to bundle it like a week of newspapers before you could throw it away. Not that you could throw it away, because it was always full of sensitive information that didn't answer any of the questions any sensible cop would ask. As Hamp walked into the airport, he considered calling Elizabeth Waring. It wasn't because she was the person in the home office to whom he was supposed to be reporting. Twenty years of police work didn't make you more respectful of hierarchies. It only made them one more thing you found out you could live with, like carbon monoxide and bird shit. Ninety-nine percent of the time you were out on your own, driving around town in a car and trying to solve people's problems by asserting an authority that, if only they knew it, consisted of nothing more than your ability to persuade people that whatever they were contemplating wasn't worth it. He wanted to call Elizabeth because after a couple of weeks of talking to her two or three times a day, he was fairly sure she would be able to sort the report out for him. But it was after eleven o'clock in Washington, and young widows with kids had enough to do in the evening without having to explain to somebody who the hell Paul Martello was and what he was doing in a parking ramp without a car or a set of keys. There would be time enough for that in the morning, after she'd had her meeting. She probably didn't know she was having one yet, but this kind of thing always caused morning meetings. All bureaucracies worked the same. Wolf put the photographs back in the box. Let me help you with the dishes. It was going to have to be the hard way. He couldn't even use little Norman's gun because the whole neighborhood would hear it, 
and when the men across the street heard it, they would know what it was. He was going to have to take the serrated bread knife off the counter and slit this woman's throat while their two children slept. He would have to hold her over the sink while she bled to death, and then grab the passport out of the box. The worst part of it wasn't that it was messy. It was that he had gone to a lot of trouble to find Elizabeth Waring, and now what he really felt like doing was just leaving her alone. It had probably been the telephone call. She was no threat to him. She wasn't even capable of going out at night to do whatever her boss had wanted her to do. In fact, she had probably been hoping to be in bed by now. She was simply a nice woman with no husband who had a job that she was good at, and today she had met a man who was polite and didn't scare her. She wouldn't go out looking for a man, but if she met one by accident, it would seem all right to her. Women like her probably didn't get laid very often, and something like this wouldn't have done any harm. She was smart and sensible enough to know that she was still attractive to men, and if things had been different, he would have liked to accommodate her. Cutting her throat with a kitchen knife wasn't going to throw the FBI into confusion. It wasn't going to accomplish anything. Anyway, Elizabeth was saying, the whole point of this was to thank you for helping me this morning. You're not doing any dishes in my house. Wolf stood, and the moment came and went. All right, then, he said, but I'll take the garbage out for you on my way home. A deal, she said. Going out there at night gives me the creeps. Wolf carried the garbage bag out to the side of Elizabeth's garage, where there were four big cans. He set the bag in a can carefully so that it didn't make any noise, then fit the lid back on. He looked at the kitchen door and then at the window. At least she wasn't standing there to watch him walk down the driveway and across the street to whatever was waiting for him. He could go through the backyard to the next street and then circle around. Carmine stood up again and walked through the house to the back door where Petrie was waiting. See anything move out there? Petrie grunted. What the hell does that mean? I was shaking my head. The answer is no. What time is it? He hated asking Petrie for the time, but it was so dark in here that he couldn't read his watch, and so he had to keep making up excuses to ask the others. He would have to start eating carrots, or else get a watch that glowed in the dark. About a quarter after eleven. Carmine thought about it. I don't like it. What do you mean? I mean, what if he's not coming? I mean, I don't want to sit around in here until dawn with a car in the garage that doesn't belong to him, and sure as hell won't have his fingerprints on it, and his blood splashed all over the inside of it. If he knew we were here, all he'd have to do is call the cops and say somebody had broken into his house, and I'm not sure I want to bet my life he can't figure that out. He doesn't know we're here, Carmine. I'm not sure I want to bet my life on that either. Where's the phone? What phone? His phone. There is no phone. No phone at all? No. We went through the place. If there'd been one, I'd have seen it. Carmine's heart began to pound, and then the pressure seemed to move upward to his head. You went through this whole fucking place. There was no fucking telephone, and you didn't tell me? Petrie said defensively, So what? I guarantee you this man had a telephone this morning. You can't live without a telephone. That means he took it out. Not necessarily. My grandmother didn't have a phone. This guy isn't your grandmother, you dumb shit. That's the first thing you do in a war. You cut the enemy off and isolate him. He severed our communications. He knows we're here and he's going to do something about it. So use the car phone. Huh? The car phone. Martillo had a phone in his car. That's how he called Mr. Vico when he saw the guy in the first place. Fusco's mind scurried back and forth, looking for something that would negate Petrie's suggestion, but he kept coming up with nothing. Finally, he muttered, I didn't want to have to do that. But now I haven't got any choice. He pulled out his pistol, stepped to the back door, and whispered, Keep your eyes open. This is where he'll make his move if he's out there. 
Wolf walked through the yard of the house beside his, staying in the shadows and moving slowly, then stopping to listen. He scanned the back of his house. There were no lights on inside, and he couldn't detect any broken windows. Suddenly he saw his back door open. He froze, then slowly brought little Norman's pistol up in line with the doorknob. He couldn't quite discern the shape of what was pushing it open. But when the door began to close again, the silhouette of a man materialized against the white clapboards. Wolf moved his eyes away from the man. Maybe they were trying to see if he was out here. He watched the windows and the door itself, but could discern no shape or motion. Then the man began to walk, and since the man wasn't coming toward him, Wolf watched. The man went to the garage door, opened it, then ducked inside. What he did then was mystifying. He closed the garage door behind him. That was no cop. At this stage, there was no such thing as one cop. There would have been about five of them around Polly the Bagman's car, trying to get prints, samples of blood and hair, and whatever else they collected these days. But if it wasn't a cop, it must be Vico's people. And if this man wasn't doing what cops did, what was he doing? Wolf stood still and watched the house. Vico's crews still seemed to consist of three soldiers and a driver. In the old days he had sent three men to try to hold Wolf up for money. This afternoon Wolf had seen three men get out of a car on Independence Avenue, and then he had seen three men on the parking ramp. Most likely there were two more men inside his house and one in a car somewhere nearby. He stood still for another moment. There was still a chance he could simply turn around and walk away. He had enough money on him even now. He could go back the way he had come, walk a mile or so to a liquor store away from the neighborhood, and call for a cab. The chances were pretty good that the driver who had come for him would have nothing to do with Vico, and even if he was wrong, the man wouldn't know who he was. There was no reason for him to go back into that house. He had rented it with the expectation that he was going to kill the woman who lived across the street, then disappear. So he hadn't touched anything with his bare hands or left anything that could be traced to him. He had even cut the labels out of his clothes. But he was angry. What Vico was doing was pure opportunism. Wolf had done nothing to him, and before that Michael Schaefer had done nothing to anybody for ten years except sit in his house in Bath and go to an occasional concert with his girlfriend. These guys were waiting inside the house to collect on the butcher's boy. He wondered if they were really prepared to see him face to face. If there were two men inside, one of them would be watching the street. That left the other, and he would be at the kitchen door to cover his companion's path to the garage. Wolf moved to the side of his house, staying within six inches of the clapboards, as he sidestepped to the back door. He crawled across the steps, then sidestepped again to get to the garage door. He quietly slipped the bolt on the garage door to lock the man inside, then stepped to the back door, knocked quietly on it, and whispered, "'Let me in.' It's me. The door opened inward an inch, and he threw his weight against it so that it hit the man hard in the face. The man's hands went up to cover his bleeding nose and mouth, and he staggered backward. Before he could lower them, Wolf was inside and pushing little Norman's pistol against his head. Wolf whispered in his ear, Lie down on your face. If you make a noise, you're dead. The man sank to the floor. Wolf looked around for the man's gun and saw it on the floor at his feet. It was a browning nine-millimeter, with a silencer screwed onto the end of it. He knelt down on the floor and picked it up. But as he did, the kitchen doorway seemed to fill with darkness. It was the shape of a big man looking down at them. "'What are you doing on the floor?' Wolf raised his arm and pulled the trigger three times as quickly as he could. There were three hoarse spitting sounds, and the man took a step backward and toppled over into the dining room. The one on the floor pushed himself upward with his arms and kicked out at Wolf with his feet. Wolf danced to the side to avoid the swinging legs, then fired down into the man's back. He took his time aiming the second shot, and it went into the top of the man's head. He walked cautiously into the dining room and shot the other one in the temple. Wolf sighed. It hadn't gone well. He had wanted them alive. He turned on the lights, went to the bathroom, gathered all the towels and pushed them under the two men to catch the blood. Then he frisked the man on the kitchen floor to see if he had any more nine-millimeter ammunition. He found a second clip in the man's right pants pocket, dug it out, 
pulled the one he had used out of the pistol, and inserted the full one. He went to the kitchen door, stepped outside to the garage, and listened. The man inside was already tugging on the garage door to get out. Wolf waited until he heard the man step away, then slipped the bolt on the door and stepped back around the corner of the garage. The man was standing inside a small square enclosure with a car. There were no windows, and the only door was the one he had raised to get inside. Wolf had a certain morbid interest in what the man was going to do. Carmine was sweating. When he had called, Mr. Vico had yelled at him. Mr. Vico was a fat old man with a heart condition, and he probably hadn't yelled at anyone since the Eisenhower administration, but what he had said had been worse than the yelling. At least yelling got rid of some of the anger before he did anything about it. Carmine might survive the yelling, but the other thing was trouble. He'd said that the way car telephones worked was that they billed you for each call, put the number and time you had called on the bill just like long distance, and that the guy who owned the car had been dead for hours. The police had already scraped his body up off the parking lot for an autopsy. This had started Carmine sweating. Then, when he had tried to get out of the garage to tell Petrie, whose fault it all was, he had found he couldn't open the damn door. He had practically gotten a hernia tugging on the thing, and still it wouldn't go up. Now he was getting scared. The first thing he had thought of was to call Costelli and Petrie to tell them to come open the door, but the reason he was stuck in here was that there wasn't any phone in the house for them to answer. Then he had thought of calling Mr. Vico back and asking him to send somebody to tell Costelli and Petrie to get him out, but he knew that wasn't a good idea. Then he had tried to think of who else he could call, but remembered what Mr. Vico had said about the phone numbers being recorded. Anybody he called might know what Mr. Vico knew about phone bills. Anyway, at some point they were going to hear, and then they would know he had put their phone numbers on a short list that had been called after Martilla was dead. Also, he had ordered his brother-in-law Gilbert not to drive that big-assed caddy back to this street. Gilbert would be sitting in the car now, playing the radio and waiting for Carmine to get this over with and walk with the others to the liquor store parking lot on foot. Except that Carmine wasn't about to walk anywhere. Carmine was gradually getting around to admitting to himself that there was only one way out. He was going to have to hotwire Martillo's car, start the engine, and ram his way out the door. He had no idea how long it took to fill up a tiny garage like this with enough carbon monoxide to smother him if he failed. He also worried about what would happen later. Crashing through the door would make a hell of a lot of noise, so he would have no choice but to keep on going, because Petrie and Costelli would assume that any big-time disturbance had to be caused by somebody other than Carmine and would open fire. But if he did take off... It would leave Castelli and Petrie inside the butcher's boy's house with the cops on the way and no car in sight. It would be hard to explain, and he sure as hell wasn't going to get protection from Mr. Vico. He opened the car door and turned on the headlights, then looked around. There had to be a crowbar or something, but all he could see was a network of studs over bare tar paper. It was weird— what kind of man had a garage with nothing in it but his car? He turned off the lights and went to the door again. He had to get the damn thing open or he was going to regret it. He bent his knees and got down as far as he could. You had to get your legs into it. Wolf heard the garage door roll up into the roof with incredible violence. It sounded as though it were going to jump the track. Then he heard the hiss of the man's breathing. It sounded as though his chest were heaving. He let the man walk out of the garage and stagger to the kitchen door. Then the man stopped and wondered why the lights were on inside. Wolf raised the pistol with the silencer on it and put Carmine's mind at rest. 19. Wolf dragged the last one into the garage. He was the one lying in the dining room, and he had been at least six feet three and heavy. Wolf closed the garage door, lifted the body into the back seat, and propped it up with the other one, then looked at his little display. The three men sat in the car in three different postures of leisured comfort. He moved the last one's right arm to the back of the seat so it looked as though he were resting it behind the other one's head, and that helped to hide the hole in the blood. 
Wolf opened the garage door again, got into the car, started it, and pulled it out into the driveway before closing the door again. He backed out as quietly as he could, letting the big car coast down the driveway to the street, then slowly accelerated away. As he drove, he made an inventory. He had cleaned the floors thoroughly, put the towels onto the car seats to soak up some of the blood, and then prepared his companions for the ride. He still had two pistols with full loads and silencers, one under his coat and another at his feet under the driver's seat. He had stuck little Normans in the coat of the corpse in the passenger seat beside him. If he didn't make any sudden stops or reckless turns, his companions would remain sitting in fairly natural positions. It had been at least three hours since the last of them died, and by now the beginnings of rigor mortis would help. It always started in the jaws and neck, then spread to the torso and legs. It had taken a long time, but he had probably done as well as he needed to. If the police really went through the place, they would undoubtedly find blood, hair, and threads from these three, and from him, and from the family that owned the house, and their dogs and cats. But they wouldn't look. After all these years, Wolf wasn't squeamish about handling bodies, but he didn't want these three toppling over while he was on the highway. He had taken the precaution of searching their wallets to be sure they weren't some kind of police, but all he had found was money and credit cards. Their names were Castelli, Petri, and Fusco, but by now he didn't remember which was which. They had all lived in Washington, and none of them had any kind of card that entitled them to medical or dental care. Vico obviously didn't pay the employer's share. He had checked when he had come to town to see whether any of Vico's businesses still had the same names, and some of them did. They were all called Acme or Apex or AAA or ABC, so that his contacts didn't have to learn the whole alphabet to figure out where to drop things. Wolf had gone to a lot of trouble to be sure he didn't run into Vico's people by accident, but it hadn't done him much good. He had even driven by the big house Vico lived in, just so he would know where it was. Vico had just finished making a formal complaint to the telephone company's business representative. He had received a crank telephone call this evening and had demanded a new unlisted number. While he was talking, he could hear the woman clicking away on the keyboard, duly noting his request in the company's computers in case his lawyer needed it later. He hadn't decided what to do about Fusco yet. Carmine was the loyal dog type, and once in a while he needed a rap on the nose with a newspaper, but you couldn't expect a dog to climb trees for you. He was good enough at what he was expected to do, and right now he was making Vico a hero. Vico sat back in his favorite chair and stared at the fire. He had a vague sense that there were things he should be doing, but he wasn't going to move. He was waiting for a call. He had at least two hundred people out there right now actively looking for the butcher's boy, and that was part of his agitation. He had always believed that he had inherited a little bit of his mother's witch quality. In her youth, she had been one of those young girls who dreamed of train crashes and ships going down. And then, when she was older, she had been the one all the pregnant women in the neighborhood had gone to and asked if their children would be boys or girls. What he was feeling was probably the eagerness of all his people out there, a little bit scared, a little bit excited, as they turned the city into a tiger hunt. The telephone at his elbow beeped patiently, and he picked it up. Yeah. It was Toscanzio, of course. You know who this is? Of course he did. He had been waiting. Yeah. I was sorry to hear about it. Is your family well? I'll tell them you asked. We have a little problem, eh? I want you to know I've made arrangements for Paul's remains to be sent to his family out there. It's all in their name just as though they had picked the undertaker out of a phone book. But the bill? Where do you want it sent? There was a long silence on the other end. Well, I'll have it sent to you, and you can decide how you want to handle it. That ought to give him the hint. Martillo never should have been operating in Vico's town and not reporting to Vico. 
There's going to be fallout from this. What do you mean? Our friend in California. Paulie was talking to important people to see if he could work out something in the way of clemency. But the way he went, I don't see how we can send somebody else to walk into some senator's office and start all over again. They get skittish when the last guy got a bullet in the head. Have you talked to anybody else? Some people in Chicago. You know what I mean. Did you call anybody in New York? I didn't think that was a good idea. Look, he's going to get out sooner or later. When he does, I don't want to be the one who said we gave up on his problem. Do you? Vico's smile was audible. I didn't. I'm working on it right now. By morning I should have something to ship to his people in New York. Really? Really? Vico could tell that Toscanzio was already trying to figure out if he should call the Balacantano family in New York, or whether there was some way of talking directly to Carl Bala in prison. Let him. If Vico did get the body, he would make sure Bala knew where it came from. If he didn't, Toscanzio would be the one Bala hated for getting his hopes up. That's good news. I'll let you know when it's done. Thank you. My best to your family. Goodbye. Vico hung up the telephone and went back to staring at the fire. It was a good feeling. It was as though the whole world, not just the people, but the natural forces, the wind and the stars, were working for him. Wolf switched off the headlights before he turned the car into the driveway and stopped it before it could trigger the electric eye that would buzz the intercom inside. He turned off the engine, popped the hood, and went around to the front of the car. In the last few days he had found that he wasn't as good with cars as he used to be. They had changed a lot while he was gone, without changing at all. But he still knew how to yank out wires and hoses. When he was satisfied, he closed the hood quietly and turned his attention to the electric eye. There was a little light and a receptor on each side of the driveway. If he didn't disconnect both sides of it at once, a light was going to stop hitting a receptor and it would buzz. The way to handle this kind of system was to put a mirror at exactly the right angle in front of each box so that it detected its own light. But he wasn't prepared to screw around with that. He studied the system carefully. The wiring would be steel-jacketed and buried inside a pipe, and some of it must run under the driveway. But the vulnerability of a system that had lights was that there must be a way to change a bulb without setting it off. He stepped over the beam of light and knelt beside the gate. There was a lever that was designed to permit the electric motor that moved the gate to be disengaged in case it jammed, so he pressed the lever and pushed the gate open on its rails. It wasn't hard to find the circuit box. It was mounted on the brick wall just inside the yard, with a holly bush planted in front of it. He opened the box and watched the electric eyes go out as he flipped the circuit breaker. He went back to the car, released the brake, shifted into neutral, and then hurried to the back to push. In the old days a Lincoln had been a hell of a lot of metal, and he had been wondering if he would be able to move this one up the incline by himself. At first it was hard to get it to budge, but finally it rolled through the gate and ten feet inside before the front wheels turned a little, and it headed onto the lawn. He stopped pushing it near a bird bath with a naked nymph pirouetting in the center. Then he went around, reached inside the window, yanked out the keys, and put them in his coat pocket with the wires he had taken out of the engine. He took out one of the pistols with a silencer and waited. After a minute or two, the light changed on a street somewhere nearby, and the driver of a big truck began to goad his diesel engine up through its gears. It was the only sound as Wolf walked toward the driveway. He stopped at the gate. It was big and heavy and made of wrought iron, but it would be hard to keep somebody from moving it the way he had. He decided such a fine gate was worth a few more minutes. Following the dead line from the circuit box to the electric eye, he pulled a few feet of it out of the ground, cut it, 
and stripped the insulation away for two inches. He wrapped the two bare wires around the bottom rung of the gate, then returned to the box and switched the circuit breaker back on. As he climbed over the wall to get back onto the street, he wasn't sure how the sequence would work, but somebody was going to realize that it was important not to leave Martillo's car in Vico's yard, and that the only way to get it out was through the gate. When the button inside didn't open it, somebody was going to touch the gate. Wolf had walked half a mile before he found the right place to call for a taxi. On another night he might have stopped in one of the bars he had passed, but tonight Vico would have his army of collectors and parasites out looking for him, and it was always possible that he would run into someone who had seen his face in the old days. He had never had much to do with Vico's people, but he was through with letting himself be surprised. The safest sort of place was a telephone booth beside a closed gas station, and he waited until he found one. There were six or seven diseased cars parked beside the building, and he decided that his was one of them. It was the new Chevy on the end, and he had pulled it in there and left it in case the cab driver was curious. But when the driver arrived, he wasn't curious. He was young and a little bit frightened because this was the way cab drivers got robbed. Somebody called them from a public address where there weren't any other people, and there wasn't much light. Then there would be a gun against the driver's neck, a whole night's receipts went up some guy's arm, and the driver probably got killed. But this one was okay. He was old, at least thirty-five, and he wanted to go to Alexandria, and he only seemed tired, and looked as though he had some money. Jack Hamp's flight from Chicago was within inches of touching down at Washington National, just as a freak tailwind blew in from nowhere, and in order to keep the wing from dipping, the pilot had to give the engines another punch. There was no doubt in Hamp's mind what was happening, because when the wheels touched the ground, the tires gave a screech like a buzzsaw, and the plane rattled along the runway, taking the regularly spaced bumps at about twice the normal speed. He barely had time to brace himself for the drag of the brakes before he felt his head go forward in a bow, so that he was looking at his knees. He wasn't particularly concerned, because a Hot Wheels landing wasn't unusual, but he was impatient because now the plane would have to sit on the runway until the brakes cooled. To pass the time, he read over the preliminary report from the Washington office again, occasionally glancing out the window beside him at the men in coveralls down on the tarmac, playing flashlight beams over the tires and undercarriage. He'd seen the whole procedure a few times in his days as a bird watcher at LAX. The ground crew always stood fore or aft of the wheels, because, on the rare occasions when they did pop, the hot debris and metal would tear straight out along the wings. There wasn't a hell of a lot anyone could do until the night air cooled the wheels down to a temperature that would at least let the ground crew move a portable gangway up to get the passengers out. As he read, he thought about Elizabeth Waring. She might not know who these victims were any more than he did. That was what bothered him most about this case. You had to be an organized criminal yourself to know who these guys, Bartolomeo and Martillo, were, and a well-organized criminal at that. It didn't make any sense as an offensive move. The only thing that might help the butcher's boy right now was noise. The victim had to be big enough to cause a stir. If he was in Washington, it would have to be Jerry Vico, or at least somebody who had made his bones with Vico. The butcher's boy was in a special sort of fix right now. He had to do things which weren't predictable, but which made some kind of sense in retrospect. If they were predictable, there would be people waiting for him. But if they didn't make sense when you thought about them later, then they wouldn't help him get out. The organization would assume that he was completely round the bend, like a rabid animal. If this happened, he was dead because you couldn't see something like that and figure you would just wait until it wandered away. You wanted to know exactly where it was during every second until you killed it. If the report said he was popping unknowns who hadn't done anything to him, then something was missing. Elizabeth could probably help him out on this one. As he thought about her, he felt a shudder of regret and embarrassment. He never should have made that joke about her being ugly. What if she really was ugly? No, it was worse than that. 
Just about every woman he had met who was worth anything thought that she was ugly. It was some kind of mass delusion. What on earth had led him to trigger a reaction he would have known was likely if he had stopped to think? But there was something about the anonymous present that bothered him. At first it had surprised him and made him feel panicky because maybe he was supposed to have sent her a present and hadn't known it. So he had pushed it away with the first smart-ass remark that came to mind. He had even said something about its being a bomb, as though nobody would send her anything unless he wanted to. Hamp could feel his scalp begin to tighten, as though his hair were actually going to stand up. Martillo and Bartolomeo were such little fish that only a criminal would recognize them, and one had. The butcher's boy had seen those guys in Washington, and they had seen him, so he had shut them up. It all made perfect sense, but only afterward. Hamp unbuckled his seat belt and stood up and started to sidestep his way into the aisle. The stewardess saw him and hurried up the aisle toward him to let him know he was busted. Sir— but he took out his identification wallet and held it up in front of her face. My name is Jack Hamp, and I'm a special investigator for the Justice Department. I have a car waiting in that airport, and I need to get to it now. I'm sorry, sir, but it will be a few more minutes before we can deplane. It isn't something we can do anything about. It's an FAA regulation. Hamp took a step forward, and she sensed that she had to move with him or step aside. So she came with him. The wheels are hot, he said. If they were going to blow, they'd have done it by now. But we'll sit here an hour or more just to be safe. Explain to the pilot that I've got an emergency. But, sir, Mr. Hamp, do it. Because if you don't, I'm going to crank that hatch open myself. Hamp couldn't believe it. Elizabeth had actually told him about it the minute she had gotten the damned present, and he hadn't figured it out. He drove fast along Jefferson, changing lanes and keeping the pedal down as far as he dared. He was what might have been called a professional speeder, since that was what cops in L.A. had to be to get anywhere while the bodies were still warm. He instantly wished he hadn't thought it in those words, because now it all made sense. And he hoped this didn't mean that it was already over. The mistake was in thinking that the butcher's boy was just wandering around slaughtering the big bosses because they were big. He wasn't in any position to take on something like that. All he was doing was what Jack Hamp would have done in his place, trying to stay alive. Though to a man like the butcher's boy, it meant that you figured out who was giving you the most trouble, and then you killed him. So now he was in Washington, but he hadn't come here to find a pair of non-entities like Martillo and Bartolomeo. That had just been an accident. Somehow he had figured out who was giving him the worst trouble— the one who had kept him from leaving the country in the first place, and would keep closing in on him until he couldn't move at all. Elizabeth Waring Wolf had the cab driver go all the way up the block past his house before he told him to stop at the end of the street and got out. He waited for the driver to disappear before walking back down the block. He was still watching for the fourth man. Somebody had brought those three to his house this evening— and he still hadn't spotted the man or his car in the neighborhood. But he wasn't in a position to spend any time looking for him. He had started the sequence, and now he had to finish it and get out. As he went to Evie Waring's kitchen door, he tried to remember the exact layout of the house. There were no alarms or even serious locks to stop him. And she had cleaned the place before he had come to dinner, so there wouldn't be eight hundred toys on the floor to trip over in the dark. He reached into his pocket, found a credit card from one of the men he had left in Vico's yard, slipped it between the door and the jam, and moved it up and down until he found the plunger. He depressed the plunger, but the door wouldn't move. He could feel that another bolt somewhere near the knob was engaged. He got down on his knees on the concrete steps and pushed on the rubber flap of the cat door that was cut into the lower panel. He measured the length of his arm from the cat door to the doorknob and judged that it was long enough. Lying on his back on the steps, he stuck his arm inside all the way to the shoulder and felt for the bolt. The tips of his fingers barely touched it, but he managed to turn it and pull it out. Opening the door, he crawled inside, then closed it carefully. Wolf stood up and made his way slowly into the dining room, where they had eaten, then glided silently across the living room where the thick carpet muffled his steps. 
He could feel his left knee brush against the couch where they had sat, and this helped him orient himself. He stood absolutely still so that he could let his mind work without distraction. He was inside, but he still wasn't sure what he was going to do. At any other time of his life, he would have gone down the hallway to her bedroom and put a hole in her temple before even attempting to do anything else. He might make a noise in the next few minutes, and she would wake up. Or there might be some blood at his house that he had missed, and then she would be alive to give the FBI an accurate description of him. But while he constructed the argument for it, he already knew that he wasn't going to do it. He was not here to kill this woman. He might have to do it to survive, but he was determined to at least try it the other way first. If he could just get into the room, take what he wanted, and get out, there would never be any reason for her to tell anyone what he looked like. He began to move again, but at the entrance to the hallway he stopped. When she had walked onto this floor, she had taken off her shoes. So he did the same. Inside the door he could hear the sound of a child breathing slowly and deeply. He stepped to the side and felt his way along the wall until he identified the woodwork that framed the closet door. He groped for the knob and squeezed it tightly in his fist to swing it open without making any noise. He reached up to the top shelf and felt something made of leather. A baseball glove. Then there was the soft texture of cloth. Sure, a baseball cap. Now the smooth, sharp corner of the box. He reached both hands up to the shelf to be sure he could lift it without sliding it across the wood. Who are you? came a little voice. It was high and piping, and there was something shaky about it, like a bird. Oh, God, he thought. I don't want to kill this kid. Mr. Richardson, Wolf said softly. Oh, said the boy. He waited for the kid to say something else, but there was no sound. He lifted the box and turned. What are you doing here? I was asleep. I'm sorry, but I had to come. I'll be gone in a minute. Where's my mother? She's asleep. If we're quiet, she won't wake up. She needs her rest. The light came on, and the click sounded like a hammer hitting a piece of metal. He was a tiny little boy, skinny, with his hair standing up on his head. He still had his hand on the lamp beside his bed, and he was squinting. What are you doing with that? It's for work. We need one of these pictures of your trip to England at the office right away. Which one? Wolf opened the lid. London. The Parliament Building. We're going to enlarge it so we can see what's going on inside. How can you do that? Wolf regretted having said it. How old was this kid? Four? We blow up the part we want so we can see in the window, and we transfer it to a computer. Then we can make a three-dimensional image and turn it around every which way. He made a slow, rotating motion with both hands. What for? I shouldn't tell you, Wolf said. Jimmy looked at him skeptically. Well, we think somebody in Parliament isn't who he says he is. Who is he? We don't know yet. That's why we need the picture. Jimmy seemed to contemplate the plan and finally to enlist, but he was a little worried. You can't see much. We have to try. Can you show me which one? Wolf took the sheaf of papers out of the box as he set it down on the kid's bed. While the little boy shuffled through the pictures, he worked the rubber band off the papers with one hand. This one, said Jimmy, as he held out a picture of his mother standing in front of the Houses of Parliament. Wolf felt the passport now, and in a second he had it in his coat pocket with the pistol. He took the picture and scrutinized it. It's perfect, he said. Thanks, Jimmy. He stood up, returned the photographs and packet of papers to the box, and put it back in the closet. Then he turned to the little boy. I'm sorry I had to wake you up. You'd better turn the light out and go back to sleep now. Okay. Jimmy clicked the light off and lay back on his pillow. 
As Wolf made his way into the hall and closed the door, he could hear the boy stirring. He walked quickly out of the hallway to the living room, stepped into his shoes, and moved to the front door. As he opened it, he sensed that he wasn't alone. He was going to have to kill him. This time the voice was a tiny whisper. Good night. Good night, Jimmy. He stepped outside and closed the door, then hurried down the steps and across the lawn to get to the sidewalk and the place where the darkness began. In an hour he could be on a plane to London. Jack Hamp crouched in the bushes across the street from the Waring House and watched the lone man walk toward him. The man was cautious, first turning his head to look at Elizabeth's house, then at the one beside it, and finally at the one where Hamp was hiding. He walked slowly, but there was nothing casual or leisurely about it. He had sensed that something wasn't the way he wanted it, and he was scanning for some sign of another person. It was mesmerizing to watch him. He was going to assure himself that the whole block was clear before he made an attempt to break in on Elizabeth. Attempt? Hell, he still couldn't overcome his years of talking like a cop. If this guy decided to do it, Elizabeth was going to have a visitor. Hamp slowly pulled his big forty-five out of his coat, trying to keep the movement steady and silent. He had the hammer cocked and the safety engaged. The man was already moving toward the lawn in front of Hamp. In a second or two, he would be on top of him. Hamp spent part of the second remembering that the butcher's boy was probably more than a match for him in the dark. By temperament, training, and experience, Hamp desperately wanted not to have to squeeze a trigger on anybody, and this would make him hesitate. Hamp disengaged the safety with his thumb, straightened his legs enough to bring the pistol up above the top of the bush, and hoped that it was all that the butcher's boy could see clearly. Justice Department, keep your hands where I can see them. It was exactly as he had seen it a dozen times in his imagination. The man didn't stop to think and didn't hesitate. In the second that it took Hamp to see that his right hand was going to his coat, it was already there and coming back out. Hamp fired. The report of the heavy military pistol clapped the air and the man took the round square in the center of his chest. As the man flopped backward onto the sidewalk, Hamp could see that he had almost gotten the barrel clear of his coat. It slid off his chest onto the pavement, and Hamp walked over to pick it up. He stared down at the man. He was about the right age, and he was nondescript and ordinary enough to have survived for a long time while people were looking for him. Hamp could also see that the hollow point round had made a terrible mess of his chest. Hamp looked around him at the lights going on in upstairs windows all along the block. He noticed that his mouth had gone all dry and cottony. The last time this had happened, he had thought it was the shock from taking the bullet in his leg. But it must have been another reaction. He began the process of composing himself for the first of the conversations he would have to go through now. You know the fellow you've been trying to find? Yes, the one you've wanted for ten years. I'm afraid he can't tell you anything now. I just killed him. My name is Jack Hamp. Elizabeth looked at the two sets of fingerprints and then at the report from the FBI. She had been awake half the night waiting for this, and she wondered if the strain, surprise, and sheer fatigue had simply obliterated her ability to comprehend. But it hadn't. She moved past the standard pre-printed paragraph about the required thirteen points of comparison and read the conclusion again. It was positive. Suddenly she remembered that Jack had been waiting even before she had begun, and it was thoughtless to make him wait any longer. His name is Gilbert O'Malley. He has four arrests, grand theft, assault, aggravated assault, and a parole violation. That isn't what I'd figured, said Jack. I didn't think they'd even have him on file. It was going to take him some time to give this the proper amount of reflection. Elizabeth Waring didn't look the way he thought she would at all, but she was exactly the way he had hoped she would be. The suspect looked pretty much as he had expected, but nothing else about him was right. I expected no arrests, no convictions. You were right, said Elizabeth. Ten years ago was when this man was serving his time for aggravated assault. He's a local criminal. 
She waited for this to sink in, but Jack didn't say anything. What was he feeling? Disappointment? Relief? It isn't him. This isn't the butcher's boy. He's still out there. Twenty. It's happening again, said Elizabeth. Richardson shook his head. We don't think so. He looked at Hillman, the deputy assistant, for a sign of agreement. But the deputy assistant was staring at something that had besmirched his shirt cuff without actually becoming visible. Elizabeth wondered if this was a rebuff for Richardson's being presumptuous enough to postulate a we that included a deputy assistant attorney general of the United States of America. It was possible. Short men were protective of their right to speak for themselves, as though if they were not heard, they would disappear. But Richardson was pressing on. Martillo worked for Detroit. He was here at the sufferance of Vico, and that sufferance simply wore itself out. Is that hard to believe? Yes. Richardson's lips didn't quite smile. The phone company says a call was made on Martillo's car phone after he was dead. You know who the call went to? Vico. Does Vico have a car phone? Yes. Then he'd know that they list all the outgoing calls. He was caught literally red-handed. The car was found full of blood in his backyard, for Christ's sake. With three of his own men inside. It was a reprisal. Tosconzio's people were telling him that he shouldn't have killed their boy. Okay, said Elizabeth. Let me get this straight. You honestly think that Vico had Martello killed, and then his soldiers called him on Martello's car phone to tell him that the deed was done. Then Tosconzio's people arrived from Detroit and killed the three killers. Then what? Did they put the bodies in the car and deliver them to Vico's backyard, or did Vico do that himself? Choice number one. They also booby-trapped the fence so that whoever touched it would be electrocuted. Was anybody? Two people, actually, said Richardson. Both of them soldiers of Vico's and both heavily armed, incidentally, as though they were expecting trouble. And you're going to try to bring Vico to trial on the basis of this evidence? Without warning... The deputy assistant suddenly satisfied himself that he had found the fault on his cuff. He straightened his short arms so that the cuffs would retract into the sleeves of his jacket, then raised his eyes. He never let them move to Richardson, but instead let them gaze into space for a moment, then settled them on Elizabeth. What do you think happened, Elizabeth? Ten years ago the butcher's boy got into trouble with the mob. Specifically, Carlo Balacantano hired him, then tried to have him killed instead of paying him. What he did in response was to lash out violently and senselessly, killing several people who had little or nothing to do with the dispute. Since the various families were all suspicious of each other anyway, this created confusion and allowed him some breathing space. What he did with the time he had won was to kill a man named Arthur Fieldston and bury his head and hands on the estate of the man who had betrayed him in the first place. "'who was convicted in a court by a jury,' snapped Richardson. "'And the conviction held up under appeal.' "'The deputy assistant restored silence by staring straight ahead "'without acknowledging that he had heard Richardson. "'Then he looked once more at Elizabeth. "'And that's what you think is happening again?' "'Yes. "'I know he killed Talarese, "'and I think he killed Mantino and Fratelli. Two of them were creatures of Carlo Balacantano.' I think he made an attempt at somebody in Gary, Indiana, maybe Cambria or Puccio, and the policeman Lempert got killed in the shuffle. I don't know what Martillo had to do with anything, except that I'm told he worked for Tosconzio in Detroit, which would add to the mess. I think that Vico didn't do any of this, and that he's been framed just like Carl Bala was ten years ago. Here's the crux, said the deputy assistant. It's Occam's razor. It is. You have two possibilities. First, that we're witnessing the periodic internal strife that occurs inside the mob for the usual reasons of fear and greed, and that they're using their many foot soldiers to pursue a power struggle. 
The other possibility is that one man, for no known reason, comes back after ten years and kills lots of heavily armed and protected people in different places in different ways, and then frames still another for some of the killings. One theory is simple and based on familiar behavior. The other is complicated and based on unknown quantities. One is likely, and the other is unlikely. No, not this time. Why not? Because a man like Vico isn't stupid. You're accusing him of killing Martillo, which would start a gang war, and then forgetting about it long enough to let the man's car be delivered to his backyard with his own casualties inside. He doesn't make mistakes like that. The deputy assistant's face seemed to soften with a kind of paternal sympathy. You have to look at this logically, Elizabeth. We're in the business of taking men like Vico off the street. In order to do this, we have to wait until he makes a mistake. When he finally makes one, can we say we won't prosecute because we don't believe he'd make that mistake? This time, yes. Because this, all of it, has happened before. Ten years ago. And Vico had nothing to do with it. So if what you say is accurate, what the butcher's boy will now do is to use the confusion he's caused to disappear. Possibly forever. I don't know that. But I do think Vico's innocent. I don't think so, said the deputy assistant. Logically, I can't think so and still do my job. I'd like to have everyone in this room working on preparing this case. It was happening again. Ten years ago, the people who had sat in this room had made the decision to believe that the one who had disposed of Arthur Fieldston must be the big, powerful gangster rather than the solitary killer. Their logic had brought them promotions and public notice, and eventually had elevated them right out of the Justice Department. Now the ones who had replaced them were making the same decision. The butcher's boy was going to disappear again. She tried not to think about Jack Hamp, waiting downstairs to hear where he was going next. Home was where he would be going. Elizabeth cleared her throat. I... I'd like to be excused if I could. I've been on loan from my own office, and I've got cases of my own coming to trial. The deputy assistant looked at Richardson, whose face was expressionless. I hope it's not hurt feelings. Me? said Elizabeth. No. I think you're wrong, but I always do my job. It's just that my regular job is the one I ought to be doing, and I've probably been away too long. She added, Besides, my son has heard Richardson's name so many times that he's been having bad dreams about him. 21. The immigration officer at Heathrow Airport studied James Hart's face, then compared it to the photograph on the passport. The gentleman in front of him looked notably older than the one in the two-year-old photograph. Perhaps it was the fact that he had changed his spectacles, or that he had allowed his hair to grow a little. His flight bag had been vetted by the X-ray machine, his pockets had been emptied, and clearly he was bringing nothing into the country but two thousand American dollars, all declared as required. This Mr. Hart didn't fit any of the profiles of undesirables. The money was sufficient for him to have a short holiday, but not enough to do anything that was not on. The immigration officer applied his stamps to the passport. Given leave to enter the United Kingdom for six months, which was five and three-quarters months longer than Mr. Hart had said he intended to stay. And the other, 13 September, Heathrow, 3. The officer handed the passport back and watched Mr. Hart take two steps away from the counter. He had considered suggesting that Mr. Hart have another photograph taken, but it would have been absurd. The next three people on the same flight from Kennedy would undoubtedly have restyled and dyed their hair and be wearing contact lenses that changed their eye color. James Hart stopped at the door and looked out at the cool, damp, gray morning, and then ceased to exist. Michael Schaefer walked out along the asphalt pavement to the red double-decker airbus and gave his fare to the Pakistani conductor on the steps. 
Schaefer settled into his seat and let the vaguely familiar sights of the ancient western suburbs go by. He liked Hammersmith, particularly. It had something to do with the profusion of wet brick that always reminded him of cities in the northeastern United States. It began to rain as they moved into London, and the architectural trophies that the Empire had awarded itself began to appear, all of them old and built on top of foundations that were even older. When the bus pulled to a stop on the street outside the huge barn of Victoria Station, Schaefer got off with the others, moved quickly through the doors and down to the tube, looking at nothing and at no one, maneuvering himself into the right stream of people. He took the circle line to Paddington Station. When the train came to a stop, he went upstairs, walked over to the Brit Rail window, and bought a ticket to Bath. Schubert, Octet in F Major for Strings and Winds, D-803 The concert in the Deanery Gardens was exactly what Schaefer had expected, merging in his mind with a hundred others he had sat through in the ten years in various green spots around Bath. Since they had moved to the north, he had let Meg drag him into York only for an occasional shopping trip. After all, you couldn't hire somebody to try on clothes for you. But now that life had settled down a little, he didn't mind concerts. All he required was that they park the car west of the River Ouse, beyond the medieval city walls, so that they wouldn't have to cross any of the little bridges to get out to the A-59. Schaefer knew that Eddie Mastruski would have told him he was crazy. Are you telling me you're going to sit here on your ass in the sunshine like a superannuated tortoise, listening to a bunch of Germans playing violins? Look at you, for Christ's sake. You're practically dead already. Because, let me tell you, they don't forget. You're not trying to save your life. You're just waiting to sell it at the top market price. There was an explosion of applause, and Schaefer added his few pats to the general uproar. He missed Eddie. He still liked to argue with him, and Eddie's arguments had improved in the years since he had died. Between concerts he forgot about music, but whenever he went to another concert it felt as though it were continuous, one long book that he was picking up where he had stopped last time. He was learning more about music, but he had trouble associating the dry, meaningless numbers that served as titles with the little tunes that entered his head. He would sit and listen, and by now he could form the themes and changes into complex spatial structures in his mind. But then, amid the obfuscating blare and blast, he would hear a little melody begin to form, tentatively at first, and then gradually taking over, until it obscured the rest. Then he would realize that he had heard it before, recognize it like an old acquaintance, and feel frustrated. It was as though he had opened the book and read two or three pages before discovering that he had read them already. Once, when Meg had asked him to take her to a concert, he had asked what they were going to play. She had recited a bewildering string of B-flat majors and Opus 106s, and when he had said, What's that? she had hummed them to him, one after the other, as though they were popular songs. The Honorable Margaret Holroyd glanced at Schaefer beside her. He looked as though he were in suspended animation, sitting comfortably in his folding chair with the gentle sun warming him. He really was a remarkable man. He had apparently had less formal education than the average saddle horse, but lots of Americans gave this impression, and ever since he had settled whatever business he'd had in America, he had seemed different. For one thing, he had become studious. He had been so willing to read books that nobody else actually read that she had been tempted to give him something like the Dictionary of National Biography to see how far his dedication went. At one time she would have done this. But she had changed, too, since the business with the Bulgarians. She always called it this when she thought about it, because that was the only lie he had given her. They had never spoken about it since. He had simply shown up at her door one day, about ten pounds thinner and looking exhausted, and said, "'You're not married or anything, are you?' She had thrown herself at him and hugged him so hard that she had probably squeezed the breath right out of him. But, of course, he would never have let her know. That was how it had happened. 
She had made a huge, irreversible decision without actually deciding anything. While Michael was away, Margaret had bought American newspapers and tried to figure out what he was really doing. There had even been a few nasty days when she had wondered if she had already read about his death. After all, there was no reason to imagine that she knew his real name. He might have had one of those names that were in the papers, Fratelli, Talarese, Vico, and so on. There had been a surprising number of them in the month that he was gone. But that gangster business had just been Meg's penchant for making up ridiculous stories, and she had turned it on herself because she hadn't had anyone to tell the stories to. Gwendolen's detestable aunt would have said it was her punishment on earth for being a liar, to be followed in due course by more severe and exquisite punishments in the afterlife. In any event, Margaret could see that it was over. It wasn't unheard of, after all. There were all those men who went off to wars and saw and did unspeakable things, and then after a year or two they were perfectly fine, or at least they appeared to be. She looked at Schaefer and felt good about the decision she had not made. It was possible he was going to be one of those tough men who surprised you by being doting fathers. To look at him now, you could imagine that he was a professor, or even an artist. He never fidgeted or moved, and there was nothing in his face to register any change in the music. Only his eyes were in motion, gliding from one person in the audience to another, then upward to the top of the city walls where the walkway was, then over to the gardens and the minster, then back to the attentive group of tourists and local gentry seated in the folding chairs on the lawn. Jack Hamp walked along the thick carpet of grass and looked out over the fence across the track. It was an odd little place. With the short season here, all the horses had returned to their paddocks for the winter. Today you could as easily imagine that this was the site of the Santa Maria County Fair as a place where people laid down serious money on horses. The desk sergeant had said that B. Baldwin's betting booth had stood sixty meters to the left of the stands, ten meters back from the rail. That would be about here. Hamp turned and looked at the grandstand, then beyond it toward the road. From this spot you couldn't even see the top of the walnut tree where the Bentley with the bodies in it had been parked. So it wasn't a question of an enterprising bookmaker noticing a couple of rich young men and deciding that it would be safe to get together a crew to kill them for their walking around money. The victims hadn't even gotten close enough to the track for Baldwin to see them. There had been no bedding slips in their pockets, no turf on their shoes. So if anybody had picked them out, it had to be Lukey or young Talarese. It was odd that the nephew of a New York underboss would be reduced to starting his career as a street thief or even as a bookie who happened to see a couple of easy marks. What good could the family imagine that his experience as a British bookie would do him in New York? There was no possibility of useful contacts in the barns or on the street. There wasn't even the same monetary system. Hamp decided to ask the Brighton police about the stolen car market in England. He couldn't imagine that anybody might have hoped to sell a hot Bentley in a country that wasn't more than four hundred miles from end to end, but it was something you had to ask about before eliminating it. For all he knew, Talarese might have been serving an apprenticeship in pinching Rolls Royces and using the Mafia's channels to sell them in Asia or someplace. But he had an instinct about this. He was fairly confident that when he had done all the footwork and checked out every angle— what he was going to end up with was essentially the same story. The two Limeys had only been unexpected witnesses. Talarese had been out there one fine day at the Brighton racetrack, doing whatever he was supposed to be doing, when he had happened to see a man who, among all the people milling around at this track, he, and only he, could possibly have recognized. Then, with the sun making the bright silks on the horses and jockeys glow, and the birds singing— they were sure as hell singing today, so they probably had been then, too. He had started feeling lucky.